I live in a small country where things still go bump in the night, and that doesn't go for just creepy local legends. Dark strangers, cartels, I think you get the idea. Where I live, nowhere is truly removed from the day-to-day -day dangers of the unknown. It was a dark night. I found myself home alone. Here, it isn't uncommon for the entire family to live together. Grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren will all share a growing piece of property for wealth and security. It's the simplest way to live. But as you can imagine, being home alone is a rarity. With so many people under one roof, it's almost impossible to time anything just right to ever be actually alone. So I did what I always do. I hooked up the surround sound throughout the living room and turned out all the lights. I bundled up on the couch with my favorite snack and watched whatever I desired on the big family television. Despite the ever-present danger I mentioned earlier, I remember the evening being quite relaxing. Rain and a breeze moved in along the coast and created a pitter-patter against the roof. As the night went on, I thought I heard someone at the front door. As I moved to investigate, the sound and movement stopped. But being a stormy night, and that I had the sound up so loud, I truly in my heart believed I'd simply heard something that wasn't there. I turned back to the movie and did my best to relax. That's when the back door began to rattle. I adjust myself on the sofa to get a better look. When someone starts to knock, a frantic, heavy banging against the hardwood. I froze in place. Whatever I dismissed as storm sounds or... Maybe just the junk blowing around in the backyard is now undeniable. There's someone trying to come inside the house. Everyone who lives there naturally has a key. Whoever is outside the door clearly does not. At the time, I'm an 18-year-old man. I'm running through the logical scenarios in my head. Whoever this is, they tried to open up the front door, then slip around the side of the house and is now trying to force the back door open. This isn't cartel or a monster. Anything with real bloodlust would have forced the front door open. I reason that it's a common thief, probably someone very nervous and trying to remain unseen. Being 18, I decide to take them head on and show the world this asshole picked the wrong house. I move from the couch to the kitchen, grab the biggest cleaver I can find. 10 inches of dingy, ugly steel. Still, the door handle is twisting back and forth. Go time. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm down for whatever. There's nothing like the mentality of a teenager. You don't know who you're messing with, I shouted through the door. The stranger on the other side stopped shaking the handle for a moment. I know you're out there. You have three seconds to get the f out of here or I'll cut you up. They didn't care. The knocking started again, even harder than before. My confidence quickly faded. I took a deep breath and readied myself. In my head, this was do or die. Hoisting the cleaver over my head, I unfastened the bolt and threw open the door before me. It wasn't a burglar or a gangster of any kind. It was my sweet little grandma. She stood there soaking wet with an expression of agitation, but also unmistakable terror. What are you doing? She shouted at me. Me? What are you doing at the back door? I asked. I thought you were an intruder. No, oh, no, no. She laughed as she stepped inside the house. I went and paused the television while she shut her coats by the door. She explained that she'd gotten home during the storm, tried knocking for a while. That was the noise I heard at the front door. I guess she knocked for quite a while because she finally gave up and decided to try the back door. The front entrance has a little cover, so she figured that even if it were locked, at least she would be out of the rain. That's when I started to hear the commotion and decided to go to war with whatever was outside. Glad I didn't though, because I seriously almost killed my grandma. I played softball throughout high school. This meant I got home an hour or two later than school actually let out. Regardless, I was still the first one home more often than not. My parents worked well into the afternoon, and my sister participated in various clubs and after-school events like theater club. I got home one day to the usual scene. Fully locked house. Lights are off. Note from my mom in the kitchen. 
I let my dog out in the backyard, changed out of my uniform, and opened up a bag of Cheetos. Very average, very typical day. My dog scratched to let me know he was bored and to let him inside. Dog and I cuddle on the couch and start watching our favorite shows. Out of nowhere, I hear a door slam open. It's beneath me, downstairs in the basement. I could feel it vibrate through the floorboards. I know this sounds weird, but this wasn't out of the ordinary. The basement was like a downstairs apartment, and my older sister lived down there. The basement had its own entry door to the outside, and she could be pretty careless with her coming and going. Our parents had spoken to her multiple times about letting the door slam open and closed. So honestly, I didn't think twice about it. I kept watching TV and eating my Cheetos. My dog, however, got up and moseyed down the stairs. Again, this wasn't odd, but what was odd was the silence that followed. No smooching or petting, no excited cheers. The dog went downstairs and that was that. Still, I continued watching TV. Maybe she was just in a bad mood down there. After a few minutes, I see movement in the front yard. I turn to find my dog, the one that was just with me on the couch, running up and down the block. He's a big, dumb, and overly friendly Labrador who is not allowed out front. My sister definitely knows this, so I'm thinking, what the hell is she doing? I get off the couch and go down to the basement stairwell. The lights are off. It's eerily quiet. I'm starting to feel all the things that are out of place, the peculiar things that I should have noticed earlier. I reach the basement landing and see the door wide open to the outside world. There's mud tracked in a few steps, and a boot print placed squarely in the center of the door. As I near, I could tell somebody kicked that ground level door in for whatever reason. Robbery, rape, murder, the list really only gets worse. Once they heard the television upstairs, and the dog coming down to check the bottom floor, they must have gone back out the way they came and left the door wide open. I told everyone what happened when they got home. They searched the house and the property, but nothing turned up. So my parents got a security system a few weeks later. That was the only reason I ever felt safe inside that house ever again. I live in a pretty rural area outside of your average middle America town. It was my night off and I decided to just hang around the house myself. We got some things done around the yard, did a little self care, and then settled in with dinner and a movie for the evening. I like to be low energy every now and again, but still I have the tendencies of a night owl. The movie turned into a TV show and soon it was well past midnight. I hunkered down with my phone and a blanket and let the night really begin. Just as I'm zoning out, Someone starts pounding on my front door. Not a knock, but a full force blow against the wood. I freeze for a moment, but then I make the easy assumption it's my boyfriend coming over for a spontaneous booty call. This was common behavior for him and one of the reasons I did like staying up late. I barely had to stand up from the couch to be able to see through the small glass window in the front door. Now, I really do freeze. My heart is the only thing I can feel in motion steadily slamming up my throat. Staring back at me through the pain was not my boyfriend, but an older, bearded stranger. It was the most unfamiliar face I'd ever seen. This little window in the door was weird because if you were up close and trying to look through it, the prismatic glass skewed the optics, made it impossible to know what you were looking at. You had to have some distance between yourself and the window, like I had right now to make out what was actually on the other side. This guy was looking at me, but I knew he couldn't actually see me. I snuck back down the hallway and hid in the doorway of my bedroom. I was scared, but I would have been way more scared if I didn't have an eye on him. I couldn't imagine how I'd feel if I turned my back for one second and lost track of him. Remember when I said I live rural? Well, I also live in a cellular dead zone. I didn't even bother to find the damn thing. Instead, I stepped to my bedside and fished the landline from my end table. I hit the dial button and brung the receiver to my ear. It's completely dead in my hand. The guy hammers on the door, this time screaming at the top of his lungs. Let me in! He slurs. My blood runs cold. This is now worse than a horror movie. 
I start running through what few options are available to me. No phone. No way to get to the car. No one coming to get me. I have to stay inside where it's safe. That's the only thing that makes sense. First, I sneak into the kitchen. Slide the chef knife out of the block. It's the only weapon in the whole house. Next, I slink into the bathroom across from my bedroom and lock the door. It's just a weak little handle lock, but it's enough to buy me some time if he actually breaks through the front door. For some reason, the idea of keeping the high ground was pulsing through my mind. It was literally all I could think about, for I barricaded myself in the bathroom. So, I climbed up onto the countertop and crouched above the door. If he broke in, I'd be able to jump on his back and stab him in the neck and shoulders. I was terrified of the whole thing, but I do have to admit, I was very pleased with my whole little assault strategy. In my head, it made the most sense. With a knife in hand, all I had to do was sink at home. Time went by. That guy just keeps yelling. Hey, let me in. Now he was moving around the house. I could hear his hand dragging along the siding as he walked from end to end. He checked each and every window, yanking on the frame, pushing on the glass. Thankfully, I kept them all locked, as well as both doors. I could hear his frustration, and he took to wailing on the walls again, demanding I let him inside. Something occurred to me. That handset I fished out from my bedside table was dead. This psycho didn't cut the line. I just didn't charge the phone. There was a second one down the hall in the kitchen. Nervously, I climbed down from my perch on the countertop and waited until I heard the guy on the opposite side of the house. I unlocked the door and bolted for the phone, which was exactly where I thought it'd be, sitting in the cradle by the back door. I snagged it and retreated back to the bathroom. I called 911 and they dispatched a few officers but were totally transparent when they told me it'd take at least 15 minutes for them to get there. I was on my own and needed to stay frosty until they arrived. I stayed on the line until the cops arrived. They could hear the guy pulling and kicking at the doors, screaming for me to open it. The longest 15 minutes of my life. When they arrived, they apprehended the man immediately. Dispatch confirmed that I could exit the house, where I stepped out to find a whole team of cops standing around one dirty, scruffy, drunk-off-his-ass hippie-looking kid. He was cuffed, sitting on the ground, totally confused about the situation. He clearly wasn't a murderer. There was a party down the road. This kid stumbled off to take a piss or something, got lost in the dark, and thought my house was the spot. He convinced himself that everyone had locked the doors and was hiding somewhere. It turned out to be a big misunderstanding, but still, it was absolutely terrifying. To this day, nothing compares to what I felt that night. Remember to keep your phones charged and at the ready. When I was 19 years old, I still lived at home with my parents and little brother. They were going out of town for some weekend getaway trip, but I was at the angsty stage where I only wanted to do my own thing, even if that meant foregoing a legitimate good time. The truth was that I was incredibly hungover. I was early on in my drinking career and had a long night of boozing the night before. I felt so sick that all I wanted to do was lay down and just be alone. I definitely didn't have the stomach to be with my family for 72 hours straight. I coughed up some excuse and they left me behind. You might ask yourself what I had planned for this epic little weekend. No house parties, no spin the bottle, no drugs or music. The first thing I did was cut all my hair. This was around the time Britney Spears shaved her head. It was on every news station in America. I low key thought it was kind of badass to just go against what everyone thought about you. I was getting ready to ship off to college at the time, so the notion of a self-reinvention was very exciting. Chopping off my hair seemed to be the quickest, most convenient route of rebellion. After the impromptu haircut, I went to the bathroom for a mini spa afternoon. Face masks, moisturizers, and I even cranked up the shower to make it all steamy. After an hour of lounging in the bathroom and getting all the hair cleaned up, I stepped out into the hallway naked as the day I was born. Moving naked through the house is a prized pastime for many homebodies and I was no exception. I went into the kitchen to find a snack and just kind of zoned out as I looked out the window. 
I glance down to the bag I'm eating out of, and I see a note on the counter. That's weird, I think. I don't remember my parents leaving me a note. At first glance, I recognize right away that it's not any handwriting I know. It reads, I was going to leave you a letter, but I see that you're still here. My blood runs cold. Still here. Who the hell wrote this? I can feel the water dripping down my back, reminding me of just how vulnerable I am. It's the middle of the day, and still, I'm worse off than a sitting duck. There's a creak down the hallway. I make the split decision and barrel towards my bedroom. Can't do anything without clothes. I'd rather get murdered than run onto the street naked. There's someone standing there, though. I enter the room and find a man. Tall, dark clothing, with greasy hair hanging in his face. The moment I step into the room, he cracks this broad smile, and it's the creepiest thing I've ever seen. The only thing I can do is scream bloody murder right at the top of my lungs. His smile fades and he takes a step towards me, almost apologetically. That's when I recognize him. This weird guy that I dated my freshman year. You were an item for about three weeks before he ran away from home, and I mean ran away. No one saw or heard from him for months. The actual local myth was that he'd been found one city over and was homeschooled now. Regardless, here he stood, grinning in my bedroom. He reached behind himself, grabbed my clothes off the bed, and then hands them to me. I proceeded to dress myself in the most awkward situation I can possibly imagine. He didn't even act like he was doing anything wrong, which was creepy, but also a comfort, kind of like a little kid or something. He makes me sit down on the bed after I get dressed. Honestly, he didn't do anything weird or violent. He didn't threaten or hurt me, other than breaking into my house. He heard I was moving away and wanted to see me before I left. He said he'd been thinking about the past a lot, and that freshman year was his favorite. We didn't date long, but it held a special memory for him. We talked for a couple of hours, and then he left. I never saw him again, but I did hear a couple of years later that he was fully institutionalized for schizophrenia. That definitely added up when everything was said and done, but made me feel a little uneasy after the fact. How long was he in my house without me knowing that day? And worse than that, could he have possibly hurt me? Lock your doors when you decide to stay home alone. I'm a bit of a shut-in, even as a kid. I decided one New Year's Eve that I would have my own little party. I was decorating the house in streamers and even blew up a few balloons, doing all the stuff a good party host does. Honestly, I was going overboard, probably to impress my parents. I was 13 and just beginning to get left home alone. It was exciting and the most grown-up thing I'd ever felt. I decided I needed streamers and more stuff hanging from the walls and the ceiling. I pulled out a step stool and a roll of tape to set it up. The house we lived in at the time is really old, so the walls are exposed wooden boards. I have to use extra tape to get anything to stick to that grimy, dusty old wood, so attaching the end of each streamer is a bit of a chore. Whatever, I just double up on how much I use and reach extra high to get more surface area. I reached up to tape one of the last decorations when I slipped. The stool fell out from underneath me. My hands crashed into the wall, or one of the boards had an old nail poking out of it. The head of the nail punctured my skin, went under the bone, and completely hung itself inside my wrist. There's no other way to explain it other than wedged inside my joint. My feet couldn't touch the ground. I looked down and realized I was suspended in the air. Obviously, I went into physical shock, but still, the pain in my wrist was blinding. I couldn't ignore it, but I also couldn't react to it. There was no one home and no one was coming home for at least a few more hours. Blood slowly started to run down my arm and drip off my elbow and pool at the hardwood below. I remember distinctly thinking, this is what it's like to be crucified. Soon after, I started to shake. I only learned that later when I was going into convulsions. They were so bad my teeth rattled together. This forced my body to move a bit, which gave me the momentum I needed. Just one shift and the nail slid out of my wrist and I fell onto the floor. Didn't bother to continue decorating, obviously. I pulled myself into a ball, right there in the own puddle of my own blood. 
and cried like I never have. The adrenaline wore off and shock really got a hold of me. But on top of that, all I can remember is the pain. Nothing has or probably ever will come close to what a nail felt like between my bones. My parents got home just a little after midnight and found me in the same place. This was well before cell phones, so they rushed me to the hospital to get stitched up. The doctor and both the nurses were shocked that I hadn't done more damage to myself. Thankfully, I healed up just fine. I still have nightmares of that awful feeling. I have two stories about being home alone. The first was just unfortunate. The second, truly terrifying. I'll start off by saying I live in a neighborhood where the majority of the houses on my street are actually used as doctor practices. Dentist, physiotherapy, and mental health specialist, the usual. This area is a supreme target for burglaries and late night robberies because of these professionals. Once, when my mother was away on a business trip and my brother was out of town, I was cooking in the kitchen upstairs. I hear all sorts of commotion coming from the alleyway behind my house. So I walk to the end of the house and peer out a window to figure out what's going on. There's a man tearing my garbage bins apart, smashing bottles on my back wall. He spots me through the window, looks directly at me and screams. Yeah, you bitch. I'm going to fucking get you. Uh, no. I call the police station three blocks away wait with a knife in my living room. Honestly, I wasn't too worried because all my windows are barred. Still, I'm rattled and want to remain alert. Two hours later, the guy is gone and I call the police back to inform them in my most annoyed tone. Never mind, he's gone now. They hang up on me. Not uncommon for the police in my country. The worst was when I was about nine. My mother was away again on a long business trip and had hired a nanny to look after myself my younger brother who would have been five. One morning, I woke up sick as a dog, and Nanny insists I stay in bed. She drives my brother to school, and I just went back to sleep. I wake up to the Nanny crying hysterically, asking if I'm okay. Perplexed, I ask what was wrong. Apparently, she had come home and someone had kicked in the door. I was still in the house when she walked in. Startled, he had jumped off the first floor balcony to run away. She insists that when she left, my door was closed, and when she went back to check on me, the door was now wide open. I'm pretty sure the guy wasn't like a rapist or murderer, but definitely could have been worse. When I was 11 years old, I convinced my parents I was okay to stay by myself after dark. Like most of us, this was a monumental milestone for me. They went off to a party and sent my siblings to my grandmother's house for the night. It's a pretty sweet deal. I was daydreaming all about the cool secret stuff I'd do when no one else was around. We lived on the outskirts of a small town. My nearest neighbor was about a quarter mile away. To many, this might sound scary, but it's more of an extra layer of security. Less people, less crime. It's just that simple. I was in our basement rec room watching TV. This was 1992, so no cell phones and our only landline phone was upstairs. I heard footsteps on the sun porch and the back door gently close. I just assumed and figured it was my parents home early, so I called out to them. No response. Okay, really not what I was expecting. I'm starting to get sweaty at the thought of someone sneaking in. I'm racking my brain for who it could be. The neighbors? No way. Grandma and Grandpa? No, they would have brought my siblings. Could it be a friend? No, they would have called first. I heard gentle steps come down the hall toward the basement entrance. There's a silhouette shadow in the frame. Someone standing just outside of view. When I call out again, the shadow stops moving. I wasn't waiting around for some kind of murderer to come down those stairs, so I bolted over to the back of the couch and pulled myself six feet up to climb out the window. I was a runt back then, so I'll give all the credit to the adrenaline in the moment. I scampered through one of those little basement windows that's flat to the ground. Above me was the porch, a couple of windows. If the intruder looked down, they'd probably see me. I 
kept expecting something to come crashing down on me or to pull me back into the basement. I looked up and there was no one. I hunkered down and waited. I lay on the grass beside the window, watching for whatever it was to come down the stairs, but nothing did. After 10 minutes, I felt like an idiot and went to the sun porch and grabbed a bat, then walked back into the house. Waiting for nothing turned my fear into pure agitation. I heard a noise from the kitchen, and when I peeked around the corner, there were two raccoons eating bread and fruit roll-ups. Still to this day, no one in my family knows that this happened. When I was about 11 or 12, I was home alone in our new house. It was probably my second week there. The phone rings. Caller ID said it's just some random number. Nevertheless, I pick up because I was a pretty lonely child and didn't have enough people to talk to. I mean, even in this story, I'm home alone. See what I mean? It's a guy, and he says, Hello, uh, who is this? His voice sounds strained, like he's kind of breathless. I tell him, it's me, are you okay? Of course, I give the guy my name. Like I said, I really didn't have any kind of crash course on stranger danger or how to even talk to people you don't know. To me, conversation meant someone needed something or had a message to share. He starts rambling, going on about how he didn't take his medication today. His mom is going to be mad. His mom is going to be so mad because he didn't take his meds. This was a crisis, and now I needed to help this guy. Where are his meds? Where were they? What were they? How could we get them to him? And can he take them then? Will his mom understand if he takes them later? No logical stone is going unturned in my mind. We continue to talk. At this point, he's grunting and huffing. Sounds like he was hurt in my 12-year-old brain. I asked him again if he's okay and that he probably should listen to his mom. Maybe the medication will make him okay. Then boom, he's calm as can be, slick even. He starts laying it on me, asking me how my day is going and if I'd like to see his privates. My stomach went sour as I realized what was actually going on, or at least kind of. This guy was a weirdo. I slammed the phone back into the receiver and developed a chronic fear for the rest of my life. I wondered for a long time how he got the house number, or was it just a random dial? I watched this serial documentary years later. That said many serial house callers back then were often people that personally knew the people at the house they were calling probably some sick neighbor who knew i was home alone or something obviously i learned some years later that those grunting sounds were him pleasuring himself talk about yuck No lie, this happened two weeks ago. My boyfriend is out of town for work, so I set up the alarm system for the first time. I'm sleeping. At like 3 a.m., that thing starts going off. I wake up, and I'm scared to move. But I continue to stay in bed for about two minutes with that alarm still going on and on. I finally get up and go check the back door first. Nothing. It's still shut, locked, secure. I run to the coat closet and grab the bat. Next, I went to the bathroom and swing the bat at the shower curtain. Nothing. So I finally go and cut the alarm off. I check the front door, and it's still shut and locked too. Then I open the door and see a bunch of drunk people out in the breezeway. I guess someone fell into the door hard enough to make the alarm go off. I was obviously pissed, and now I sleep with the bat next to my bed. It was summertime. I was 14 and both of my parents worked. This allowed me five days a week to take over the house. I would sneak my Nintendo into the living room and play on that big TV in there. Back then, we didn't have a 40-inch flat screen in every room. Kids these days are definitely lucky. Anyway, my buddy comes over and we start cranking out some game time. It's a brutal back and forth, but I slowly take the lead. I'm razor focused to the point of not blinking. I see a reflection behind me in the window. Someone is trying to look in the blinds. I pause the game and turn to really look at them. Sure enough, 
I can see there's an outline right through the window. I jump up and grab a baseball bat and storm out the door. My friend is right behind me with a kitchen knife. This is like every kid's dream scenario, defending the house from some intruder psycho. I turn the corner and it's the fucking meter guy for the gas company. He's on the wrong side of the house under the carport. I just thought he was peeking in through the windows. It's kind of late in the afternoon though. I've seen our meter guy. This guy isn't him. I ask him if he's new and why he's not by the meter. He turns red and continues to dodge questions. Now, I'm sure this guy is lying. This was well before cell phones, so it's just kind of like a standoff for a minute. Then he says, well, I'm, I'm going to go and just takes off for the road. My buddy and I start following him. When he notices this, the guy takes off at a full sprint. I chase this guy as his truck was parked a couple of blocks away. He isn't checking meters. He's running and now trying to hide. I stay on him while my buddy is running to get his dad. We call the cops and give him the guy's truck's license plate. At least what I was able to remember. We were told by the detectives that later showed up. People hire meter readers to scope out houses for them. They pay them for some sort of inventory. And at times the houses are empty, even in the middle of the day because people are at work or on vacation. Still, I had that baseball bat near me for the rest of that summer. We found out that guy ended up being arrested along with another team of thieves. Not exactly terrifying for me, but my parents freaked out. When I was younger, maybe 12, I was home alone for a couple of hours. It was fine. They knew I was just going to play video games and watch movies all day. Nothing was out of the ordinary until later in that same day. I was sitting in the living room watching a movie when someone just walked into the house. It caught me off guard, as it does most of us, I would think. When you're expecting to be alone, anything but is a total surprise. I got myself together and did my best to address them. It turned out to be my older sister's ex-husband. I thought it was weird that he just barged in, didn't knock or anything, but when he saw me, he was all smiles. Looking back, he had that kind of swagger and confidence, like someone who's drunk or blasted on drugs. The way he stepped into a place he didn't live was just eye-catching. He'd been doing yard work for my dad for money though, so it wasn't completely out of the question for him to be around sometimes. My dad did pretty well and I think considered giving him work something akin to charity. Maybe he still had hope of him getting his act together, rekindling something with my sister. Either way, they had a weird relationship none of us really understood. The guy brought his new girlfriend in, and she took me to my room to play video games. She was pretty, and even brought me a new game and system to play. What I didn't know was that he was robbing us while his girlfriend kept me in my room. He knew exactly where my parents kept their safe, so to keep me distracted, he detached it from the wall and then wheeled it out to his truck. They said goodbye and disappeared after he had everything that he wanted loaded up. My parents got home an hour later, immediately noticing all the missing stuff. I told them who had stopped by and they called the cops. We later found out he had bought the new game and system with the money my dad paid him. The whole thing was a setup from the very beginning. When I was about seven or eight, I was home alone during some pretty bad storms. My parents were at work and my siblings were at my friend's house. At this point in my life, I was still absolutely terrified of storms, so I'm cowering on the couch with a flashlight, my dog who's also scared, or whimpering at every bolt and crack of thunder, huddling under a blanket. Eventually the power goes out. The couch is situated where you can see into the kitchen and out a big bay window. I see how dark it is with random things flying everywhere. I turn on our weather radio at this point and hear about a tornado warning. So I flee to the basement immediately. I wasn't down there to begin with because I was also terrified of the basement. Thanks R.L. Stein. I ended up hiding with my dog in a closet down there. Upstairs I can hear things shifting and moving from wall to wall. 
Things begin to crack and tremor into the basement. My dog is going absolutely ballistic next to me at this point, which is scaring me worse than anything. I was worried he'd hurt himself or me during this panic attack. Things ended up calming down though. Eventually, we stopped shaking, let ourselves out of the closet, and shambled back upstairs. I couldn't believe it. Our roof had ended up being torn off mostly. Windows were smashed and some things thrown around our yard. I could see straight up into the churning afternoon sky, right from my living room. The kitchen tile was covered in rainwater. At the time, I had no idea of the gravity of the situation, but my dog and I were lucky to be alive. My parents were out late one night, leaving my 13-year-old brother to babysit me. He babysit me often, but never during late hours. It was heavily pouring that night, so we could hear the rustling and random noises coming from outside. Thought nothing of it. We did live kind of rural, so we were used to the forest and the elements, and didn't think twice about small animals. As we're making a snack in the kitchen, we start to hear someone loudly banging on our front door. It sounded manic and violent. Whoever was at the door wanted us to know, and he wasn't happy. Since it was the first time we were home alone, especially that late, we both freaked out, shut off all the lights, and hid quietly underneath the table. We didn't think to grab any weapons or the phone. It was sheer panic. An average evening suddenly turned into a potentially fatal encounter. The guy stops banging and then starts kicking the front door. We can hear the frame bursting from the pressure. He only has a few slugs in him before he goes right back to banging with both fists, yelling incoherently. A few minutes later, we start hearing heavy breathing coming from our intercom speaker. Instead of a normal doorbell, we had one of those intercom things. So there was one button for a normal doorbell ringing and one to press to speak through. The heavy breathing continued for a few more minutes and then was followed by a bit of mumbling. We stared at each other in abject horror. What is going on? Part of me was convinced it wasn't even a human at the door, but a monster or something with the way it was banging. Who would do that for this long and why? When the intercom finally shut off, we decided to peek through our side of the window to see if anyone was still in our yard. We see a bald man carrying a paper bag walking towards our backyard. We freaked and called the cops, but by the time they arrived, the man was gone. To my knowledge, they never found him. And still to this day, I wonder what was in that bag. I want to say it's the less creepy route and go with some drunk guy caught in the rain, thinking he was at the right house, was just getting back from the grocery store or something and got disoriented. The truth is though, I don't know and I probably never will, but I still get the vision of him stalking into our backyard. My sister was home one morning, waking up and eating breakfast and just lounging about. My parents and I had left for work and forgotten to close the garage. Some guy runs into the house through our garage yelling at the top of his lungs and collapses in a bloody mess on our sofa. My sister, who's obviously almost hysterical at this point, barricading herself away from him. He doesn't even seem concerned with her though, just keeps wailing and wailing as if he wants attention. At around this point, realizing she wasn't going to get attacked, she went to check up on this guy. He'd clearly been stabbed, maybe a couple of times, so she called the police. She doesn't communicate to the stranger though, as she's not 100% sure of his motive. Just because he's wounded doesn't mean he's going to be desperate or crazy. Finally, his screams gain a little traction. He starts begging for help. As he does, a team of police and paramedics barge right through the same door that he came through. They begin administering treatment, while the cops secured a perimeter and start looking for outlying evidence. This guy was average, t-shirt and jeans, sneakers, forgettable haircut. Still, I'd never seen him before. They got him off the couch on a stretcher and wheeled him into the back of an ambulance. It was so crazy to see all the responding vehicles inside our driveway. I didn't even hear any of them arrive on scene. 
The cops summed it up with this. The guy tried to do a drug deal on the end of your dirt road. Went bad and got stabbed. Your house was the first one on the street with an open garage. He stormed right in for assistance. We found out the guy had a young baby, was trying to make ends meet. We put that together with him screaming for his life on the couch. We figured he was probably a decent dude and just got caught up in the rat race. Either way, mom and dad were very careful about leaving the garage door open from then on out. When I was 17 or 18, I lived at home with my parents. Now, my dad travels a lot as an engineer. When my siblings and I were younger, my mom would stay home to take care of us. But since my brother and sister had left the nest, I assured my parents that I wouldn't mind having the house all to myself. They wasted no time and started leaving me home immediately. It really wasn't a problem. I had no issues entertaining myself with a movie, played on my parents' ridiculously loud speakers, making my own pasta with meat sauce. Only when I went to bed did I think it was eerie and kind of weird. It doesn't matter where you are. Being alone will turn any setting into a creep show. Add silence and the intent to go to sleep. A real fear starts to set in on anyone. One night, I was sleeping in my room. I was suddenly awoken by a guy standing over me with what seemed like a cell phone flashlight pointed directly at me. I seemed to remember yelling out, Hey! But maybe I just would have thought it. Then the man asked me, does John live here? In a voice that belonged to an older man. It was such an awkward situation since I'm laying in bed half naked like an idiot. There's no John in my family, so I don't know what to say. I do a double take in disbelief, and as I do so, the guy disappears from the room. I think I can hear him shuffling down the hallway. to still see some of the flashlight reflection coming back to me. At this point, my heart was racing. I hurried up and checked my door, which was shut. I grabbed the softball bat I had in my closet and stood for what almost seemed like an eternity, contemplating on opening the door and just storming out. Mind you, since the door was closed, I started questioning whether it was real or maybe it was something I dreamed. I started to remember the idea of sleep paralysis. Something comes into your room and you're powerless before it. Sometimes, it can climb all over you. I wasn't powerless though. In fact, Moving my head is what allowed him to vanish in the first place. All of it was unsettling to my core. When I finally went out into the hall, it was cold, like frosty. All of the doors were open, including the front door, and the cat, who normally sleeps in the bathroom, was now gone. The whole ordeal was so surreal because I had spent 5-10 to 10 minutes convincing myself that it was something I dreamed. Yet all the doors were open. There was undeniable evidence of entry of some kind but I couldn't accept what had happened to me in bed. Does John live here? His weird old voice echoed in my head. I called the police, but of course, nothing came of it. They didn't find any sign of intruder nor trace of the one he called John. This was decades ago in the rural deep south. I was six or seven and had been badgering my parents, who both worked, to let me be a latchkey kid rather than go to the hated kinder care after school. They finally acquiesced and decided my first day home alone would be on the parent-teacher conference day, which is a half day, coming up in a few days. We went over the various mom-invented what-to-do-if scenarios. I demonstrated I knew their phone numbers and the police number and the fire department number. I agreed to call immediately upon getting home. I was just very, very excited. So the day finally came and I rode the bus home by myself. I recall my heart pounding as we turned down my road. It was such a magical thing to be getting home mid-morning on a spring day. So grown up too. My bike, the lake a couple of miles away, and the woods all beckoned. But first, of course, I had to call my mom. I unlocked the door and walked in and was struck by the fact that things were different somehow. I called her office to let her know that I was safe and sound, and almost as an aside asked, what'd you guys do with the stereo? What do you mean? The stereo, the speakers are here with wires next to them. Oh, I guess dad's reorganizing, I can hear him upstairs. 
Your dad's not home. Listen to me. Put the phone down and run to Andy's house. Do not stop for nothing. Call me when you get there. As that sunk in, I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. It dawned on me that I was alone with a stranger in the house. I took off. As I started to run out of the driveway, I saw two scuzzy guys running out of the house. As it turns out, I arrived home right in the middle of a burglary. They'd taken some prescription drugs, some of my mom's shoes and underwear, our stereo and a bunch of records, including my favorite, John Denver and the Muppets album. All's well that ends well, but sheesh, that was crazy. In 1979, I was a 14-year-old girl living in Las Vegas, Nevada. I lived with my parents and two older brothers. Often, I would come home alone for a couple of hours after school, as everyone in my family had a day job, so no one would be home until around 5 every weekday. One afternoon, I heard the doorbell ring. When I looked through the peephole in the door, I saw it was one of my brother's friends, so I opened up the door to greet him. Since I knew him, I told him my brother wasn't home and I told him I was there alone. He said he knew my brother wasn't there. He said my brother had told him he could come to my house to pick something up from his bedroom. I let him in and told him he could go to the bedroom and get what he came for. I was naive and stupid. I was very innocent and very trusting. As I turned around to let him go to my brother's room, he grabbed me from behind. He turned me around and pressed me up against the wall with his body. I was a tiny girl and he was fairly big. It was very easy for him to hold me there. He first tried to kiss me. I told him no and kept turning my face away. I repeatedly told him to get off me and let me go. I was in total panic mode. He just grinned at me, held me tight by my arms and kept his body pressing me to the wall. I was held so tight that I could barely move. He then started to pull hard on my blouse with one hand. He pulled so hard on my top that he ripped it wide open. Then he started to grab at my breast. Once he did this, he let up on the pressure he was holding me by, and I was finally able to move some. So I took the opportunity and managed to squirm out from underneath him. As soon as I was free, I went running down the hallway to the bedroom as fast as I could go. I think he must have hesitated a little, because he didn't catch me right away, but I could hear him coming up fast behind me. I ran all the way to my parents' room at the end of the hallway. When I entered the bedroom, I dove over to the bed to get to the far side where my dad slept. I knew my dad kept a loaded 357 Magnum revolver under the side of his bed. As I grabbed the gun and came up from behind the bed, my brother's friend had just entered the bedroom. I lifted the gun with both hands and pointed it straight at him. I was taught at age 10 how to shoot that gun, so I had a lot of confidence when holding it. The guy must have seen that confidence in my eyes because he immediately stopped coming towards me. His eyes grew wide and he turned ghostly white. He turned around and ran right out of the house. I know I saved myself from a terrible fate. I realized then, I had been far too trusting and stupid. I grew up a lot that day. I never told my parents what happened. My naive self thought I would get in trouble or something. And I've heard this is a very common thing with rape victims. I did end up asking my brother what his friend had come by the house to get. And I learned... My brother was selling weed to his friends. Thankfully, I never saw that guy again, and I never answered the door again when I was home alone. I learned a very valuable lesson the absolute hard way. My family used to go camping with a few groups of friends when I was a kid. A bunch of us would get together, plan a weekend, and then caravan out into the middle of nowhere together. This allowed kids whose parents weren't able to make it because there were so many adults in attendance. It was like a self-generated summer camp type of setting. We were always safe, well provided for, and having monumental fun out in the bush. I remember one Christmas when I was about five. We were camping out in the bush. I'd been on several trips by then and felt keen on all the festivities. I considered myself a veteran of the outback. Dad let me start my own small fire, roast my own food, even pick my own bedtime. 
These camping trips were very special memories for all of us. We grew into ourselves without the bustle of the cityscape back home. For those who don't know, the bush is some of the harshest, most isolated terrain in the world. It's unforgiving backcountry, arid, and undeveloped scrubland. It's hot, waterless, and everything is prepared to kill you, even the plants and the prey. We didn't worry about that though. Our parents brokered the camping, so we never dealt with anything dangerous. They weren't survival experts, but they knew the ins and the outs of being isolated. Very few trips ever resulted in mishaps or any injuries. There were nine kids in total in our campsite. We weren't allowed to wander through the bush. Parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp. We never wandered far, but this was definitely my favorite part of the entire trip. It felt like we were part of a special operations team or on some kind of mission through the Badlands. Others would gather the rest of our tools, hand shovels, compasses, a small tarp for cover. We weren't touring the camping spot. We were in another world in our heads. I imagine we looked pretty outfitted as we roamed around, despite being so tiny. Between the nine of us, the oldest was probably eight years old. It was imagination at its finest, and our parents would only fan the flames. They periodically come over the walkie-talkie, pretending to be base camp or the rescue chopper, whatever fit the game that we were playing. I don't remember what game was that day, but we hadn't made contact with the parents in quite a while. We'd actually gone a little further than normal, or feeling cheeky when the walkie-talkie started to crackle. We all gathered around and waited for the message. Slowly, someone begins speaking to us through the speaker, writhed in static. It was a man's voice. He said that he was Santa, and he was trying to find us to give us our presents. We asked him where he was and how we could find him. We're all bug-eyed, staring at the radio between us. It made sense to our little brains. Of course, Santa was on across the radio waves. He traveled the whole world. He needed comm links to make a journey like that. I'm out here and I, I know I'm close to you, he said. I can hear all of you, not far off. Why don't you just keep going north until you see me? We looked down at our equipment. Despite our lack of outdoor skills, we actually had the compass and we knew which way that was. Again, this was the furthest out we'd ever been, so we decided to make contact with the grown-ups first. Surely, they'd want to come along and meet Santa too. Thinking back, I wonder if we collectively kind of knew this was too good to be true. Either way, we were excited. We all ran back to our campsite, screaming that we just made contact with Santa. The parents laughed at us as he crowded back into the camp, but we didn't let up. We were adamant that Santa had just come over the walkie-talkie. He wanted us to come and find him. Some of the parents settled us down and questioned us directly and specifically. Who contacted who over the radio? What exactly did he say? Did you tell him where you're staying? Your name? Where you live? How long did he talk to you for? They went on and on, and we excitedly, almost annoyed, answered all the questions. Didn't they understand? Santa Claus was waiting somewhere, just through the scrub brush. They told us what was really going on. That wasn't Santa. It was some outback dwelling weirdo who was probably within a mile or two. We only partly understood what they were saying. It was nuanced because they had to keep the illusion of Santa being real in place while still explaining that the voice we heard was a dangerous stranger who wanted to lure us into the wilderness. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of that trip. We were all pretty devastated at the time, but I understand the seriousness of it and the creepiness of it now looking back as an adult. I remember overhearing them talk about it later that night. They honestly didn't know what to make of all of it, it could have been another camper just having some honest fun with some kids over the radio. The reality was, they didn't know, and couldn't risk finding that out. We changed camping locations after that trip for obvious reasons. What really shook them up was that they didn't even hear the guy. We were all tagged to do the same frequency. So, when his voice came out over our speaker, it should have come out over the adult speaker too, but it didn't. Somehow that guy spoke directly to us, and only us, and invited us to come find out why. I 
I've spent countless hours inside the deep woods. I've seen a lot of weird, semi-spooky stuff, but it usually has a pretty round and reasoned truth behind it. I've heard even stranger stuff, stuff I thought people just made up for clout. I don't entertain a lot of what I would consider nonsense. This is the only time, the only few seconds, that goes down as truly inexplicable for me. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. It's a strenuous hobby that not everybody understands, but those that do get the commitment. Get to see views and terrain not many do. Get to breathe air untouched by industry. Get to swim in waters people aren't constantly pissing in. It also stands as some of the best full body exercise a person can do. Did I mention it's therapeutic? But I digress. Sometimes though, Walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp, it's spooky. Hands free just in case something comes barreling out of the darkness trying to rip my face off. I don't believe in the paranormal, but bears and cougars are real life predators. On deep hikes, creatures like these are much nearer to us than we know. In the dark with the headlamp, every odd scratch or rustle in the underbrush feels like a certain death. It's the only part of distance hiking that makes me anxious, but still, it's part of the hobby. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles in trail, riverbank, lakeshore, ridge, bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand. I've heard, seen, and smelt all about this region that it has to offer in way of wilderness. That woodland was my house and I knew every room and railing. My scariest experience happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was a late spring in the same woodland, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five, barely breaking a sweat. I'm waiting to hit caffeine so I don't burn out too early in my journey. There's a chill blanketing the whole forest, that wet, almost misty kind of spring morning, definitely common for the area that I'm in. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed by a thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Exercise is the goal when it's dark, as there definitely isn't anything to look at. I just stay focused and make sure I don't blow out a knee or get bit by something. Then, I hear a loud crack. I froze solid. It was a crazy sound to hear five, six miles into the wilderness in the still ripening dawn. It was something I, for the first time in a long time, have never heard before. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 a.m. in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Even the nocturnal animals are getting ready to go to sleep. Making for a weird overlap out there where nothing stirs at all. It's a supreme silence, and usually when hunters tend to do their stalking, it's the best time to get into position while everything is resting before sunrise. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as soon as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around. I'm going all the way back I came in a hurry. That was the only logical option out there. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure that I heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant get out of here. That meant something territorial to me. Like a snake shaking its rattle, letting you know it's time to fuck off. I wasn't in a position to try and route myself around something that didn't want me out there. I had a headlamp strapped to my head. That gave my position to whoever was out there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo sized bat stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. And I've described it as explosive in the past because it was so sudden and so terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me loud and clear. 
Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from. I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come to a 180 degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move toward that noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it to get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between methane murderer and some kind of animal pulling my guts out of my ass. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you cast a big black moving shadow on the trail. It didn't help. In fact, it made me hesitate with each step because I keep thinking there was something lurking just before me. Again, I'm just trying to get through until the sun comes up and levels the playing field. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet still, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. It is a delicate thing to try to carry a substantial amount of hiking gear while trying to not make any sounds. For a lot of people, it's impossible, but it can be done. When you find yourself out there enough, some situations demand it. That's when I smell it. I stop in my tracks and take it in. A stench hits me that I cannot describe. I just imagine wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days of old decomposition, but it just smelled strange, unplaceable. And being so far removed from civilization, it really limited the options. There wasn't even trash or sewage out here. There wasn't a burn pit. I kept walking fast. By the time I made it to the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were now chirping. Once the sun was up, I no longer cared about being quiet. Whatever was out there could see me the whole time. It chose to leave me alone. I've heard it all in the woods, I've smelled it all, and I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many, many times. I don't know. I kept on. I finished my hike that day. Never encountered anything that forced me to turn around. It's just a weird time in a weird place when I heard that weird noise. And to this day, nothing like that has ever happened in that area again. I was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. I was alone, roughly eight miles from the nearest recreational area. I like to hike off trail and see the sights, discover little ponds and stuff like that. On this day, I discovered a campsite where something very, very bad had taken place. A person with zero hiking, camping, or any other experience had gotten themselves into trouble, big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The place is absolutely annihilated, like a tornado touched down, picked up the whole place and then slammed it back down. Trash everywhere, clothes shredded to ribbons, and the tent chewed to strips of polyester. It smelled like death and septic, like rotten human waste throughout the whole area. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness, until I noticed the desperate looking human figure, covered in blood, whimpering quietly under a tree by the tent. They were riddled with open wounds of varying severity. I could see flesh and meat hanging out of some of the deeper lacerations. They weren't festering, but they weren't pouring blood either. Whatever happened had taken place a while ago. The person had gone to the bathroom all over themselves. The smell in the air was starting to come together. This person had been lying there for a long time. I put my bag down grabbed my kit and went over to the person. They looked like they just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back, and his hands and forearms full of what looked like to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map and hightailed it to the closest road. 
This was well before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked inside those mountains. Thankfully, there was a road very close by, kinda, less than two miles, but when you're walking through the brush, it isn't exactly speedy. I busted through as quick as I could while trying to piece it all together. I wish I'd examined the campsite a little better. Was he out there alone? Did he have a disagreement with someone while he was camping and it turned fatal? Did some stranger do this? I didn't know what to think. Animals are always a possibility, but why didn't they finish the job? I got to the road and didn't know which way to go. There wasn't any community to walk to. I was simply looking for other people to get help. I started going north and fortunately, I was able to flag someone down. A couple of guys bumping around in an old jeep. I explained what I came upon as best I could. And I must have done a good job because their faces lost more and more color the longer I talked. They agreed to help and took off down the road. They said they'd get authorities and lead them back to this exact spot that I met them on the road. It was the quickest way to meet back up again. The whole rescue operation was like a baton race because everyone had the location of the next person. But no one single person actually knew the entire route. The guys in the jeep knew how to get to town and they would know how to get back to me and I would lead them to the bloodbath. There was only one thing to do. I waited for assistance to arrive. It took them about an hour until they came rumbling up the mountain and I led them to the still unidentified individual. He was not very conversant when I helped him out. I was actually pretty sure he'd be dead before we arrived. I mean, sitting there for an hour, it's not hard to arrive at some grim conclusions. That guy was clearly close to death. Even if we got there in time, infection could take him out at any point after retrieval. It took another hour to get the emergency responders back into the canyon. I assisted them in bringing him out. Once we got him on the stretcher, I could see his wounds were far worse than I'd realized. Every inch of him was crushed and sliced up in every direction. Fat and muscle hung out of him and off the stretcher during those steep declines. The guy was in and out of consciousness the whole time, and rightfully so. I couldn't imagine the pain this guy endured for days on end. We huffed him up the last ridge, loaded him into the response vehicle. The sheriff and forest rangers asked if I wanted to lift back, and so I took them up on their offer, I headed back into town, and got myself cleaned up. The whole day turned into be much more than just a distance hike, but a life or death mission for a stranger we all didn't know. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call me and let me know what was up with the person that we helped out. A buddy of mine came and picked me up, then gave me a lift out to the trailhead where I'd left my truck. I told him the details as we drove, shaking the entire drive. We made it. I collected my rig and made the trip back home. I got home from work three days later. There was a message on my machine. It was the sheriff's department. The story was, the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep his food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent. Not high enough. The night before I happened upon that site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body shifting to reach up. Dude survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods ever again. This happened to me and some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia. When we wanted to go underage drinking, we would buy a case of beer or a bottle of spirit and hike about four kilometers into the bush to the middle of nowhere to drink without worrying about getting in trouble. We would pass out in a sleeping bag under the stars in the summer and be just fine. This is the quintessential Outback shenanigans, dirt dwelling with a bottle of alcohol and your best asshole friends around you. At the end of the day though, it's harmless. We aren't trying to get up into any trouble, cause damage, or even bother anybody. It's a rite of passage, how we grow up into who we're supposed to be. I'm sure your country and culture has a similar pastime for the youth. What happened to us, though, is a bit more out of the ordinary. 
So one afternoon, my friends decide it's a camping night and head off with beer to the usual spot we'd use. We all just collectively agreed, packed, and then piled into the Utes for the journey. It was impromptu, really no planning, and that means none of us checked the weather. This was a big no-no, as we really knew better, and had gotten into hairy situations before because of storms and the like. And of course, the forecast was for dangerous storms up and down that entire area. The forecast was for later in the evening, so as we drove, there wasn't a cloud in sight. Getting rained out wasn't on our radar even the slightest, and the delayed thunderheads was a perfect lure for us. So we get out there, set up a meager camp, and let the party rage into the evening. Some of us are dancing, some of us are talking, but all of us are hammered. It's what we came here to do, and honestly, we're really good at it. Too good. None of us noticed the buildup above us, and a slight rumbling in the distance. We did a final round of shots and passed out before we even caught a warning. As I explained, the camping we did was extremely rough. We had a little fire pit, the sleeping bags, and maybe a couple of chairs and a portable speaker, and absolutely no coverage. No trees, no tarps, no canvas, no tent. There's nothing to use as a shelter. This is bush camping, and the only place we could cut loose and catch a buzz. In the middle of the night, all five of us drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. The rain woke us up first, torrential as it poured out of the sky and into our sleeping bags. The panic was overwhelming, and soon the lightning and thunder had us all worked up and frothing at the mouth. It's scary to be caught out in extreme unexpected weather. There's literally nowhere to go. I don't know why, but it reminded me of drowning or something, just being totally out of control of the situation breathless and trying to escape. The caves sit up high, overlooking a large fork in the Hawkesbury River. We had a rough idea of where they were, but the storm had us completely disoriented. A lightning flash would illuminate the ridgeline and have us all shuffling. Another flash, and we'd look up to see how somehow we ran in the wrong direction. It was like a f***ed up game of cat and mouse, except this game felt fatal. We made it though, Despite the whole planet working against us, the dirt turned to mud beneath us, sucking off our shoes and socks. The rocks gave way at every turn and let us fall on our asses. We didn't care. We scrambled up the face of the hill and found our way into the mouth of the system. We laid there in a pile for a while, catching our breath. We'd all flinch every time the lightning flashed or thunder barked. Soaked from the rain and cold, we eventually started to laugh, harder than we ever have. All of it was terrifying just a few seconds ago, and now it didn't matter. We were still pretty drunk, it turned out. A couple of us set to digging a fire pit. We had a couple of lighters amongst us, and there was random scrub brush along the cave floor. We took turns scraping the dry, cracked earth with stones and fingertips, careful not to fold them back on the rogue rocks in the soil. We got maybe five inches down when we discovered something, something more than bones. Human remains fresh enough to recognize as body parts, hair, skin, the whole thing. Now we are really stuck and we can't leave the cave because of the aggression of the storm outside and we're trapped with a dead body in a shallow grave. Half of us cracked up right there and started crying, speechless at the sight. Did someone really dump a body out here? Is there some kind of predator deeper within this cave, sleeping off its last meal? We huddled together and tried to be quiet, but it was a rapidly devolving situation. All we wanted was for dawn to break. Then we could evaluate what was going on a bit better, come up with some sort of plan. We sat by the mouth of the cave as to not be so close to the corpse that shared the cave with us. The storm broke long before the sun came up. We broke for home in a second, running at full sprint right past our camp into the bush and back into our neighborhood. It took us an hour to make the trip stumbling, bruising our shins, and cutting our feet open. We told our parents what happened, who promptly called the police. They conducted an investigation in the morning and discovered those remains. They belonged to an aboriginal burial site and were apparently still in use by various outlying villages. We didn't realize just how far outside of town we were out there, and we never went back there after, especially after we spent the night with the dead.
I was walking a section of the Appalachian Trail with a couple of buddies when we happened across a bundle of sticks. The sticks were made into a figure, kind of similar to the ones from the Blair Witch Project. It was obviously placed there by someone, as it was dead center in the middle of the trail, leaning up against a rock. I thought it was cool, so I grabbed it and put it inside my backpack. Lots of people leave weird stuff on hiking trails, particularly in the Appalachian. Everyone knows another hiker is just a week, a day, an hour, or even just 10 minutes behind you. Not everyone likes it, but some of us leave little trinkets and gifts for whoever is following in our footsteps. Sometimes it's food or beer, other times it's a blanket or a handcrafted item, like that stick bundle. The figure was cool, and I didn't think twice about grabbing it. The work that it took to intertwine everything was incredibly intricate. I wanted to try to replicate it later on, on a day when I had more time to kill. It was beautiful and eye-catching. The other guys thought it was weird. Like I said, it was reminiscent of the Blair Witch, but the movie was a couple of years old at this point, and the novelty of it being supposedly true had definitely worn off. Anyway, we finished the hike and set up for the night in our camping spot. We were all pretty wiped out from the long day, so after dinner, we retired to our respective tents and conked out for the night. These were distant days where we were trying to get the miles behind us. The next morning, I was the first one awake, so I got up to make the coffee. And what did I find? An identical bundle of sticks to the one that we'd found, sitting atop the pile of charred wood from the previous night's fire. And when I say identical, I mean uncanny. Tit or tat, it was the exact same handiwork, the twists, the knots, all the same. First thing I did was check my pack, and sure enough, the one that I'd picked up was still there. Each of my friends swore they didn't put it there, and I obviously said the same. It was weird, because we were all adamant about not putting it there, but I could never be sure that one of them wasn't messing with the other one of us. The thing that messes with me is the bundle that I found in the morning was almost an exact replica of the one that we found on the trail earlier. I find it hard to believe that not one of the other guys could have made such a close replica without being able to model it after the one in my pack. And it's not like either would have placed the one on the trail beforehand for us to stumble upon, as it was far in the middle of nowhere. It also would have been hard for anyone to just find us. We didn't camp along the trail, weary of passing hikers and strangers. All kinds of undesirables hike and loiter along the Appalachian Trail, the low-key hot spot for some of the weirdest people you could ever meet. It's not like it's every other person or something, but when you encounter an odd person out there, you just know it almost immediately. We camped isolated, almost hidden, for this exact reason. I want to believe one of them pulled a prank on the other, because the alternative scares the shit out of me. I was hiking across Newfoundland, following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. This wasn't really recreational at the time. I was in and out of drug use, homelessness, and general living on the fringes of society. Being in town or even near people was a point of stress for me. When I wanted to use drugs, I preferred to be alone with no chance of any kind of interaction. It dissolved any guilt or wrongdoing that I felt and allowed me to really lean into the highs and lows that I wanted to feel. So this particular hike was a drug using tour. I carried a small pack of items that would keep me on the road. Extra clothes, some water, pocket knife, lighter, real basic supplies. I kept a tarp and a rope to fix a shelter. At this point, town and any sign of people is a good two days behind me. I followed the rusted railway deep through the wilderness until I could no longer recognize any geography. I'd get high and just keep walking and exploring until I wanted to get high again. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned. Trailers falling apart, bus conversions burn out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy but interesting at the same time. The urban decay was like nothing I'd ever seen, especially being so rural. Who used to live here and why did they have to leave? I felt like I discovered a forgotten mystery. The sun was waning, so I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot that had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine that was near it. 
The ravine itself was full of all kinds of random debris. Appliances, bags of clothes, scrap metal. Everything was eerie and just out of place. You add my drug-addled brain to the mix and I really couldn't make sense of any of it. I pondered the place while I cooked up some food and then crawled into my sleeping bag. I wake up sometime in the night. I hear footsteps outside my camp. At first I just think it's an animal, but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The openness of my tarp setup really let me hear every footfall as it happened. The steps got closer and go around my position. I slowly and quietly pull out my knife. He tries to get me. My plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my camp in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. My heart is racing at this point, but I'm trying to stay quiet. There's no phone, nowhere to run, no other options of any kind. Either he's going to walk away or one of us is going to die out here. The footsteps stop somewhere outside of camp. I assume he came up quicker on me than expected, saw the outline of my belongings in the trees. For a split second, we can hear each other breathing. That's it, like every other backpacker's worst fear. For me, it's doubled. It's a crazed killer, some forest weirdo. Or is it the police, coming to investigate a squatter near an abandoned village? I had it in my head. They'd find all my drugs and paraphernalia, lock me up before sunrise. I honestly don't know which outcome was worse. Luckily, the steps start moving away from the tarp until I can no longer hear them. I wait a bit to see if they come back, but I don't hear anything. I slowly get out of my tarp. Still don't see anything. Without turning on my flashlight, I quickly take down everything, stuff it inside my bag. After that, I just started walking down the trails to get the hell out of there. I walked until daytime. I came across a road and flagged down a truck. That guy was nice, drove me to town where I got a hotel. The creepy thing, when I think back to it, was that whoever was likely watching me walked into town from one of those abandoned structures. I'm guessing a squatter. I'd like to think that he was just curious, but I'm glad I didn't stay and wait to see if he'd be back. This definitely falls into the strangest category. While solo pitching for a long weekend in the Pacific Northwest, the one day was in the rare part of the trail that is closer to civilization, so there was a higher chance of other hikers and campers being around. I saw one or two people, but that was mostly from afar. It was nightfall soon, getting cold, and I was getting deeper into the woods. I knew the odds of seeing someone else was highly unlikely. I was hiking around the small pond and was going to set up camp nearby when I heard this shuffling noise behind a small rock wall type of thing. It was like an outcrop of boulders that laid in a fault line. It was a repetitive noise that got louder and then quieter, but never stopped at all. Basically, if you're a regular hiker, you know a noise that does not fit in the woods when you hear it. I took out my two knives that I carry when hiking and slowly walked around the boulder, honestly not knowing what I'd see. This is part of the deal out there though. It's why I carry blades with me through the brush. There are animals, weirdos, and any number of unknown factors that might come at you. You gotta be prepared for anything, and being prepped sometimes mean taking it head on. What I did not expect, and was very shocked to see, was a very attractive couple in their 20s, having very aggressive but happy doggy style sex on a blanket. Obviously, they were as shocked as I was to see one another. They freaked and yelled, as did I, and as they covered their bodies and their clothes in a panic, I awkwardly apologized, picked up all my gear, and then just sort of jogged off into the woods, passing their tent that they pitched along the way. I completely missed their equipment. It was erected on the other side of the slope of the hill, the one I hadn't come up on. They were at ease being so far into the wilderness, but they didn't account for me to go bushwhacking in their same tracks. I backtracked for about a half a mile before I figured I was in the clear. It's not like they were going to chase me down. I bet I looked like a real psycho coming around that boulder, wide-eyed and wielding a pair of daggers. I reset my campsite and laughed myself to sleep that night. 
I wonder if that couple is still together, and if they tell that story when they get drunk at parties, like sometimes I do. I was camping in Northern California, like at the very tippy top of California, deep in the woods at a reservoir. This place could be big for recreation in the right time of year, but this was fall and during the middle of the week, so I found myself completely alone out there. I had my truck back there off the road a good four or five miles. I had to go poop really bad in the morning before the sun was up, and there's no bathrooms. So I walked down the trail and found this little spot, isolated away from the trail, next to this blackberry bush and an outcropping of water from the reservoir. As I stated, there was no other camps around, no cars. I can't even hear an engine revving in the area. I'm alone as alone can be. I heard some crashing in the tree line as it just started to become light outside. The hell just stumbled into my secret area. I realized I don't know if it's hunting season in this area. I'm hidden in the brush. I'd heard a lot of people accidentally shot deep in the wilderness areas during the hunting seasons. I peeked over the blackberry bush, and not 40 feet from me, a huge bear, easily 500 pounds. I tried to sneak away, but as I was stepping backwards, I kid you not, I stepped onto a twig that snapped. My pants are halfway down my legs, my rear end is a mess, and now I'm on the radar of an apex predator. Sneaking isn't an option, and running is a death sentence. This bear and I instantly both turn our heads towards one another, lock eyes. We both know what's going on. I'm scared and the bear isn't. The bear is curious, hungry, maybe agitated. The way it crashed into the clearing, it sounded like it. Me? I'm half naked, covered in sweat. I hear it huff on the other side of the bush. It's deciding how to go about securing breakfast. I attempted to make myself look big and make noise. Bear didn't budge. In fact, he started to walk towards me now. This wasn't good because it was the only option I was comfortable with. Everyone has heard that you just make yourself big and loud. They go away. Nope. They don't go away. They come and see what you're made of. Many things were racing through my mind. The number one being, there's no way I'm curling up into a ball and allowing this monstrously giant bear to mess with me. I crouched down as low as I could behind the blackberry bush so he couldn't see me. I start running as fast as I could while crouched and squatting down. This was it, the last avenue. Scaring it didn't work, so flight was the last choice. You have to remember that I was alone out there, the only camper around the reservoir. Even if I screamed, no one would be coming to bail me out. My thought process was that if he couldn't see me run, maybe he wouldn't chase me if I was already kind of far away before he actually saw me running over that blackberry bush. It worked. He pursued around the bush for maybe 20 feet, decided it wasn't worth it, and allowed my escape. The bear had gotten so close that I could actually smell him, could see the slobber dripping from its mouth. Honestly, I thought I was going to be breakfast for this bear, and that would be the end of me. I got back to camp, cleaned up, and waited for my visitor to come barreling out of the trees. He never did, and I stayed on high alert for the rest of that trip. Me and a group of 20 others were hiking in a two-person line, hip to hip with a partner. We were walking through very thick woods at around 1 a.m. Certain members were designated to carry a flashlight. Others on each end of the line carried radios for quick contact. This was a training exercise for a wilderness survival program. So we were in good spirits, with a high energy despite the late hour. Our young team was very prepared to complete the overnight training. We managed to find a muddy road which we continued to walk over for miles before going back into the woods. We practiced direction changes, quick marches, silent stalking, team stops, and terrain sprints. While walking on that muddy road again, I held a conversation with one of my friends that was right in front of me. We were no longer marching in ordered pairs, more of a free walk as we navigated the woods. After a while of talking, I noticed that my group was further ahead of me than they were before so I picked up the pace. I must have gotten distracted and slowly fallen behind with my buddy. As I got closer, I noticed something odd. 
The friend that I was talking to was already with the rest of my group. I turned back and saw that I was alone. No sign of my friend or anyone along the road. Who the hell was I talking to? I looked back again to make sure the radio man wasn't slinking behind too, and perhaps I was overhearing a conversation, mistaking it for my own. No radio man, nothing. I went to my friend and asked him how to get back so quickly. He turned and looked at me and said, I was wondering where you were, you disappeared for a good five minutes. Let's just say I didn't feel alright after hearing those words. I know for a fact that I was speaking to him earlier, and if not him, then someone exactly the same with all the same gear. Luckily nothing happened after that, but I was pretty shook for the rest of that hiking night. This all happened in Poland when I was a teenager many many years ago. There's no phones or any kind of social media back then. I've wondered about that experience ever since it happened. I've never had it happen yet, but I always worry about stumbling across a pot grow. I found abandoned ones, never an active one, thankfully. I live in the southwest, where this isn't really a far-fetched notion. People find these things all the time, at least they did 10 years ago. Cartel affiliates, and even just regular outlaw citizens, go deep in the wilderness and set up a perimeter, then proceed to fill the acreage with row after row of pot growth. They aren't necessarily bad people, but this was a felony, and so required the security of such. It wasn't uncommon to be chased out of these grow operations by heavily armed gunmen. All these stories conjured a paranoia for me, as my hobby took me deep into the reaches of the wilderness. I'd often be alone, only lightly armed with zero contact to the outside world. One time, I found a completely empty gallon milk jug, sitting on a rock in the middle of a creek, an inch above the waterline, with some water splashed on the surrounding rocks like somebody had just walked into the middle of the creek. The rocks were in a shallow spot, but there were two deep pools on either side, so they would have been in the water, at least up to their hips, to get away from the creek. I just stood there and kind of took in the details for a while. The hell did I just walk upon? I was miles from any kind of trailhead or camping area, rough and tumble hiking into a pretty isolated canyon. It wasn't the strangest thing for somebody to come upon, but for them to take off, the second they hear me, I just didn't get it. They'd have to be up to something to run, right? It was really creepy because there was no sign of anyone around. The creek had flooded the night before. That little empty jug would have been beat to hell and placed either much higher along the creek or absolutely buried in the floating refuse. The jug was clean, intact, unscuffed, and essentially brand new. It even had an expiration date that hadn't yet come to pass. Someone had just set this jug down when I came around the bend. There's no tracks on the bank, and it would have been close to impossible for anyone else to have been in that narrow canyon without me being aware of them. I'd have seen their tracks or even seen them. No explanation for it other than somebody had heard me coming and scampered down the middle of the creek to avoid leaving tracks before climbing out somewhere where the bank was rocky and then hiding from me after that. As for why, who knows? Mental illness or criminal activity? I did leave that area in a hurry though. In that same area years later on, on another trip, somebody lit my campsite up from directly above with a high powered spotlight in the middle of the night. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Complete illumination, silent, totally disarming. You don't know vulnerability until some unseen force above you lights up your entire world just to take a look at you. There is nobody around, no aircraft overhead, no trees big enough to hide a person, nothing. Absolute dead silence. I would have heard branches crackling if there was anybody in the trees above me or anywhere around me. The light didn't come from the branches though, it came from well above them. Only later did someone suggest to me that it might have been grow op related. Maybe the growers upgraded their security to include drones, which would be a genius move on their part. It would also make sense for the government agencies to employ drones while searching for these grow ops. It was a military buddy of mine who suggested the theory to me. He explained that he'd seen drones due to terrorists exactly what had happened to me. Just light up their camps, make them freeze while fire teams moved into position. 
I've mistaken elk for bears in the middle of the night a few times. Never had a bear in my camp, but I've had more elk than a few times. It's always good for some heart racing panic until you get a positive ID on the large critter bumping around camp. It definitely still doesn't even compare to what it felt like when that light hit me. I didn't know where to post this, but I guess this is a good place as any. I've been a long lurker of the horror community and finally decided to share one of my stories that I've tried to block out of my mind. I have posted pictures that I took during that day, and before you ask, no, I do not have the camera or the drive that the pictures were on. I tried looking through the metadata of the pictures and videos that I captured, but the time frame that we hiked and the timestamp on the images are way off. With that being said, I'm almost certain that I have a picture that was taken right at the time of the event, but again, I don't know which one it is. Now on to my story. The following took place on July 19th, 2011. I'll give you a little background. Every summer since I was seven, I would go out to California to visit my dad. He would take me up and down the state, visiting all the cool places a kid wanted to go to. As I got older, he started to take me to national parks like Yellowstone, Redwoods, and Yosemite. During this year in particular, he wanted to go back to Yosemite and rent one of those tents you see in a village campsite. I was really excited since the last time we were there. We stayed in a hotel that was nearly two hours outside of the park. He also mentioned we should hit the park's infamous mist trail that goes up Vernal Falls again since. Well, last time, I had difficulty hiking up it since my feet were killing me. He even hinted that he wanted to go down the John Muir Trail that was on top of the falls. Now John Muir, for those of you that don't know, He's a bit of a California legend. He sought out to preserve some of the wilderness lands in the United States. His most notable accomplishment was establishing Yosemite as a national park in 1890. But even after his death, the man had a hospital and a middle school named after him. The last bit of information that I want to point out here was during that year, Yosemite set a record of its waterfalls being three times more powerful than ever before due to the amount of snow and rain it had received during the winter and springtime. I think it was even featured on the nightly news when Brian Williams was on there at the time. On the morning of the hike, both my dad and I woke up with excitement. The two of us had trained for this day, and me being on the cross-country team for my school, and him working out at the gym, we were more than ready to take on this amazing trail. We packed up our backpacks, put on our boots, and drove my dad's SUV to the trailhead parking spot. When we got there, it was around 8.30, and the parking lot was already full. I guess there were a lot of people eager to see this once-in-a-lifetime moment. We had to park all the way over where the Curry Village was. This will be important for later. After a mile and a half, we reached the trailhead. The first part of the mist trail is paved, and it has some steep hill inclines, nothing too extreme. After you reach the end of the paved trail, you go across a footbridge over the stream that's at the bottom of the falls. However, that little stream is full-blown Rapid River. Now keep in mind, the park at the time had a very limited amount of signs and guardrails around the water areas, so it wasn't uncommon to see people wander off the trail just to be by the stream, the sunbathe, or dip their feet in. Kids would also want to go in and splash each other like they were at a water park. My dad and I were also guilty of going off the trails to take pictures and such. Some of my pictures that I provided for you guys shows just how easy it was to be by the water. As for the park rangers, some of them really didn't mind it at the time. In fact, it was kind of nice having people explore the park, just as long as they were cautious and used good judgment. I haven't been back to Yosemite since this event. I don't know how strict they are with this trail. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but the trail isn't for everybody. Once you pass the footbridge, it's all uphill, and you have to climb up these stone steps. Some of the steps have eroded or washed away over the years, which made it extra difficult to climb in certain areas, especially when it got to be really narrow. You also have to combat the mist from the falls and not lose your footing. Otherwise, you might fall over the edge and into the water. After a short break, my dad and I started to head up Vernal Falls. And like I mentioned earlier, 
The mist from the falls was very intense, but it was rewarding in a way. When we got to the top, it was almost noon. And we were ready to tear open our lunches, but before we did that, we went over to the John Muir trailhead while taking some along the way. The trail wasn't too long, but if we wanted to get back to the parking lot, we would have to take another trail which took way longer than the mist trail. We came to a conclusion that we would think about it during lunch since our hunger was just now overwhelming. That's when my dad asked me if we should eat by the falls or find a quieter place. To this day, I still don't know what made me blurt out that we should find a quieter spot, away from the falls, and other noisy tourists. My dad agreed. We made our way up to the river to the point that it becomes a small creek, and then sat down at a picnic area. There was no one in sight. All that we could hear was the water flowing in the streams and the birds chirping. As we were finishing up, we saw a bunch of people coming from every direction and they weren't walking or running. It was as if they were in a rush to get somewhere, but didn't know where to go. We didn't think anything of it, decided to head over to the stream before we went back to the falls. Now to get to the stream, you had to walk over a bunch of rocks that were fun to climb and jump over. We approached one, jumped over the gap. My dad went first making it look easy, while I on the other hand had to get a running head start. As I made my way over the gap, I heard something hiss and sort of jump up in my leg. Upon landing, I quickly turned around to see a coiled up rattlesnake in the gap with his eyes fixed on me. Luckily for me, he didn't bite me. I was a safe distance away. I called out for my dad, who was like Indiana Jones when it comes to snakes. I pointed it out, and when he saw it, his face turned pale white. I laughed as he backed away in fear, and as he did that, another hiker was making their way right for the gap. I immediately told him to go around, and he had a confused expression on his face. Then once he came around to our side, he saw that rattlesnake. He took out his phone to take pictures and videos. At this point, my dad had definitely had enough of that snake and made his way to the stream, which I followed him, hoping that guy wouldn't get bit. The creek was pretty shallow and was hard to believe that it turned into this roaring waterfall. I stayed at the edge of the creek to soak my bandana in the cold while my dad went a little further and bent down to do the same. Then all of a sudden, this guy came out of nowhere and started talking to my dad in a frantic voice. He said something along the lines of, Sir, you're not allowed to be in there. Please get out of the water. Like I mentioned earlier, it wasn't uncommon to see people by the water, especially near a small stream like this one. It was very odd though, because this guy wasn't a park ranger, nor was he dressed for hiking. My dad slowly got up and said to the guy, uh, We're just soaking our sweatbands before we head back down. Everything is fine. The man grew more concerned. Sir, please, you need to get out of the water now. It's very dangerous. I just saw three people die from where you're standing. Then the man turned to me and said, Son, if you value your father's life, you have to get him out of there. I'm completely speechless at this point. My dad is ignoring this man's pleas. But before either one of us could say or do anything, the man runs off trying to warn other tourists that were getting close to the water. After he was out of sight, my dad got out and we grabbed our backpacks and headed towards the falls. As we were walking, I asked my dad what that guy meant when he said that he saw three people die just where we were standing in that small stream. He looked at me confused as well, but reassured me that maybe they fell and hurt themselves or something. That confused me even more. The stream wasn't as powerful as the falls, so how could someone lose their footing and die? The thought didn't last long, because I was then distracted by the crowd of people that were gathering around the area where I'd spotted that rattlesnake. We were trying to find a park ranger so that no one would get hurt, but for some reason, there wasn't one in sight. We kept walking till we finally made it to the falls, and at that point, we were completely exhausted from that hike up. So we decided to go back down the mist trail. When we got to the trailhead, there was a large crowd of people blocking the trail. Impatiently, we made our way through the group of people and confused hikers. And that's when we saw the caution tape all along the trail itself. There must have been 15 park rangers scouting the area, telling hikers coming up off the trail to turn back immediately. Someone asked one of the rangers why they were closing it off, and almost in a calm and professional tone, the ranger said this, Oh, everything is alright, there's just a dead animal that was found on the trail, 
and the smell is really unbearable. We're trying to remove it, but for now, the mist trail is closed. Everyone here will have to take the John Muir trail to get back down. I immediately knew something was off. There was way too much caution tape for just one dead animal, and why were they taping off the edges that are near the falls? Also, the two park rangers that were on the trail weren't looking on the trail itself. They were looking down into the water. Then I heard on the static of one of the radios. All I could make out was something about missing hikers. The John Muir Trail turned out to be a pretty nice detour. That is, until we hit the Paranorma Trail. It was caked with horse droppings and the smell was as bad as you can imagine. It went on for 10 miles. We caught up with some of the other hikers along the way. We're all speculating on what actually happened. One said that it was a bear that died. The rangers had to get a dump truck to haul it away. Another said it was a moose or a deer. It's funny what people come up with in these types of situations, but all of them would end up being wrong. Two hours later, we all finally get to the bottom of the trail. And my legs feel like jelly at this point. We still needed to get back to the parking lot. On the way back there, we spotted another park ranger standing guard at the mist trailhead. Curiosity got the better of my dad. He went over to the ranger and asked what actually happened. The ranger, knowing that my dad wasn't buying the whole dead animal story, let out a sigh, and with a hesitant expression on his face, he said, There's these three hikers. They were part of this church group. They all decided to go over the railings that were near the top of the falls to take some pictures. The first victim went in the water, and eventually lost their footing and fell. It was only a matter of time for the current to take him down the waterfall, and two more hikers from that group went in and tried to save him. They also lost their footing was overtaken by the current. It was at this point, people who were all witnessing this discouraged others from jumping in unless they wanted to have the same thing happen to them. The drop didn't kill them instantly and the rocks below would have torn them apart. The trail was closed shortly after in fear of one of their bodies being on it. I sat there mortified. If we had decided to eat our lunch over there, we would have been one of the many dozens of people that witnessed this horrible event. Do nothing but stand there and watch as three people fell to their fate. What that ranger told us still haunts me to this day. Due to the falls and rapids being this powerful, we cannot recover the bodies until it dies down in October or even November. My heart sunk into my chest, thinking about the friends and family members of the victims. It's going to be a while for them to be there until recovery got back into our car with our legs aching from that 12 mile hike and for the rest of the way back it was completely silent i never brought it up to my dad again and i still think about that man telling my dad to get out i don't know what i would have done if my dad was one of those victims it just goes to show you that no picture is worth risking your own life i'll link some articles of this event you can also do some research of your own and one of the articles i've listed it's a follow-up on the bodies being recovered. I'll summarize it here in case you don't want to read it. David Hormiz, 22 years old, was the first to be discovered a month after the incident. He was pinned against a boulder 250 feet downstream. Ninos Yacoub, age 27, was found on November 29th, trapped under towering boulders that weren't visible until the river level was at its lowest. Then the following Saturday, Ramina Badel, 21 years old was found. The three were from the close-knit community of Central Valley Christians from the Middle East. My heart goes out to the friends and families of those victims. May they rest in peace. Thank you for reading my post. I used to deliver on a paper route when I was 13. It was that sort of old school route where I'd hustle every morning around 6 a.m. with a satchel, dropping off the daily paper to houses. It was a pretty cool gig, simple and pretty much exactly what you'd expect. The one lame part about the job was that it was rain or shine. No matter the weather, even if it was pitch black with a blizzard, the paper was getting delivered. That's probably why they used to hire kids back in the day. It was easier to pressure them to go and they had to walk that route either way. One day, I was dropping off papers as usual in the morning. It was winter and still dark. 
These were my favorite shifts because it felt like the whole world hadn't quite turned on yet. It was cool seeing all the homes nice and cozy. Maybe a wisp or two of smoke still escaping the chimneys. It's just nostalgic for no reason. Maybe because of the holidays. I slogged on through the dark. The few street lights that guided my route cast dim yellow glares into the snow drifts beneath them. I remember it being extra still and ominous. I would periodically stop between houses to catch my breath, but it was really to survey the neighborhood. I still can't put my finger on it, even to this day, but I remember just feeling weird that morning. Something was off, but not anything I was aware of. All I could do was push on through the cold and get the job done. Shortly after passing a house at the end of a cul-de-sac, I heard two loud pops, followed by a third a minute later. I grew up around guns and knew that sound, but I just carried on with my route. I figured it was someone getting their car started and the exhaust backfired or something. I'd seen that happen to my dad's truck before and other cars around town, so I knew it was a possibility. In my 13-year-old brain, it was way more likely than three consecutive gunshots. I waited to say anything to anyone until later on that morning. It's just one of those things you don't want to mention because you don't know the gravity of the situation. When I mentioned what I'd heard, my parents immediately told me that it was all in my head. It probably was just a car backfiring. It did put me at ease, and I just went on with my day. That confirmed what I was so desperate to believe. Later that morning, my neighborhood was full of police and news vans, centered around the house. They were clamoring for neighbors or anyone who'd been around the cul-de-sac that morning. My parents told me to stay inside. But the truth is that I would have never gone to speak to them. Just like when I hesitated to tell my parents, I felt like I was doing something awful when I told them about what I heard. It felt disrespectful, strange, and very ominous. It felt wrong. I didn't know every single neighbor that we had at the time. But if any of them were dead, I wouldn't have the stomach to hear the news. That was a heavy realization, too, that the paper boy knew first. Maybe that is why I hesitated. I would be speaking about people I didn't know at all, and it felt very sad to me. You may be able to tell the story gave me a lifetime of very quiet, suffocating PTSD. We got the full story as it was pieced together throughout the week. The man who lived in the house was older, at least older than my dad, and had been a local for a very long time. He had a son who was in the army, and had been away for some time. He went through a deployment of some kind. I don't know the exact military details, but he eventually came home to visit his father. When he arrived back at home, he wasn't alone. He brought another guy with him and then proceeded to come out to his father as gay. The other guy was his boyfriend. No one really knew any of the details beyond that, other than how the visit concluded. The dad shot and killed them both that morning and immediately turned the gun on himself. This is all speculation, but I imagine it was a cold visit for them. Even colder with a half foot of snow, burying the house and clogging up the streets. It was probably the morning they were planning on heading back to the base or wherever they lived. The father just couldn't take it. Couldn't leave them like that. It's a tragedy and impacted the entire community, but no one more than me. I didn't deliver another paper for a while. Everyone was pretty understanding as to why even the newspaper editor. The talk of the town, but for me, it was a memory. It's like I was the fourth man in the room when it happened or something. Be good to yourselves out there. I was driving home with my family after visiting my sister who lives the town over. I was learning how to drive and had a pretty good handle on it. My stepdad let me drive there to get used to winter highway driving, so naturally, I drove back as well. The storm wasn't supposed to start until later that evening, so we thought we would be fine. The trip turned out okay, but I really don't know what anyone was thinking when they let me drive. I had literally no experience behind the wheel, and here we are barreling down a highway with a pending snowburst. At the time, we were joking about how this would be the last trip we'd ever take. It started snowing when we left, which wasn't terrible because I was capable of driving in the snow, but it picked up fast. We had just left town. We were maybe 10 minutes into the drive before it came a complete whiteout. I'm driving in the left lane. It's 8 p.m. in the middle of January, 
so it's pitch black and peak winter where I live. The falling snow was blinding. It wasn't like going light speed, watching all the snow drift by on the windshield. There were so many flakes filling the glass, and with the headlights bouncing off them, I couldn't see anything at all. It was caking up along the edges of the visor by the inch. Not to mention these are Canadian highways. The only lights you're getting for a long stretch are going to be your headlights. I was doing my absolute best not to panic and was shocked at the level of calm I was able to muster. My stepdad was doing his best to guide me and try to find a safe place to pull over, but the winds were blowing snow everywhere so we couldn't see the ditches or the lines. I had two worries. One, I'm in the left lane, so if I pull over, I might not know how far exactly to go and might throw us into a ditch that's completely filled with snow. Two, I can't see the lines at all, and if I keep driving, I might not stay in the correct lane because of that. The only thing I could do was keep driving until I was absolutely certain it was safe to pull over. I was using the rumble strips as my only guide, since the tires were able to get to a slight feel for them. I was doing something like maybe 45 and a 75. My stepdad is guiding me to the road his parents live on so we can have a better place to stop. We passed maybe eight cars in the ditch between my sister's town and my grandparents' road. My speed only descended from there as the storm didn't let up. The sky only seemed to get darker, and as the snow started to freeze along the highways, the tires started to spin a little. The faster I went, the less control I had of the car. At some point, the road was completely covered, and the rumble strips weren't noticeable anymore either, so I was just going off instinct. I ended up hitting a sheet of ice at an awkward angle and spun out into the oncoming lane. I managed to regain control of the car, saw faint headlights and said, yep, we're in the wrong lane, shouldn't be here at all. Thankfully and quickly, I safely moved us back over into the proper lane. My mom's in the back seat freaking the fuck out because we just spun out, and now I'm making the decisions behind the wheel. It's not like she could crawl up into the driver's seat and just take over. Somehow, my stepdad is surprisingly less chill than me, but trying to keep his cool, doing everything he can not to grab the wheel in a panic. I can barely see an inch from the front of the car. Finally, we managed to get to his parents' road and pull over. We got out and switched places, and when I stepped out of the vehicle, the snow was up to my shins. Ended up staying the night at my grandparents' house because there was no way in hell we were making it back home alive even if we tried. Found out about 15 minutes after getting in that they closed off the highway due to poor conditions. We had to dig our way out of the house the next morning to go home. I got to stay home from school that day since I was stuck out of town. Meanwhile, everyone else had to go in. It was my first winter with my learners and my first blizzard drive. If we had a smaller car, we would have never made it to my grandparents to begin with. I was terrified, but I was not going to let my parents know that, especially with my mom in the back seat very scared. I never should have driven that night, but it helped me to learn how to handle those kind of drives later on, and I became a better driver because of it. It was a fucking trip though, that's for sure, and I'll never forget it. I live on an island in Maine that's an hour ferry ride out from civilization. The boat comes three days a week typically, but there's a lot of times they cancel due to the weather. It's a very mild trip. Not much to talk about, aside from the very nice views that you get on both shores. It's the type of stereotype from a Stephen King novel. Isolated, watery depths, little quaint townships. It's cute, but for certain lifestyles, it can be pretty inconvenient. One winter, my best friend was having a bachelor party weekend that I couldn't miss. It wasn't an option. We were getting together for unspeakable debauchery, the kind of shit you only see in movies. Now it's Maine in the middle of January. There's mountains of snow and violent wind swells, but my car time is limited. It's the boat and the plane that I'm worried about. When I check both statuses, they're green. Everyone is operating as normal. I load my bags and navigate the icy roadways and pay the parking fee. Just took one look at the white caps, has me scratching my head. Did I read the status wrong? There's no way a ferry is working in these conditions, but lo and behold, 
the status held up. It was still green on the website. The person that I call confirmed it as green. I could actually see the ferry returning from its previous trip. It rocked a bit on the roaring froth, but actually served to calm my nerves. It didn't seem to be as affected as I thought it would be. I'm not a sea captain, sue me. The people arriving offload and seemed to be in good spirits from what I could see. I made sure to scan them for the reactions. Ghost white faces, big buggy eyes, clenched fists, or over emotional. No one seemed disturbed by their voyage. I doubled down and boarded the moment I was able to. Again, missing this bachelor weekend event was not an option. I drowned in the depths of the ocean before that happened. Needless to say, that damn captain should have canceled that day. We parted from the port and cruised uneventfully. There wasn't very many of us on board. I played on my phone while others made casual small talk. People going to the mainland for events like me. Others for grocery trips and supplies. As we all collectively settled in, the ferry tipping back and forth. It tips one direction a little too far. Everyone gets quiet as they notice it. And it goes back in the other direction and has the same effect. We're starting to rock. Beyond the viewing windows, I can see a towering white cap colliding out in front of us. The water is beginning to lap over the sides of the boat. It's a complete whiteout in all directions, and land is nowhere to be seen. The captain makes an announcement over the comm system that things are rougher than normal, but assured us everything was fine. He insisted we all stay calm, stay alert, and put our faith in him. He also said we needed to stay seated. That last part deflated a bit of the morale from us as we were watching the swells jump over the sides of the boat, some of them easily over six feet. Strike what I said earlier. Thank God I'm not a sea captain. We did the back and forth rocking for the rest of the trip, dipping a little more each time. The waves tossed us in any direction they pleased. During one teeter, the pressure from the water sent a huge crack through one of the viewing windows. All of those passengers had to evacuate to other seats, but they had to time their movements with the rocking of the ship. The first people that got up in a panic were thrown to the floor so hard it knocked the wind out of them. They waited for the boat to tip the other way and then bolted for a different seat. The crack continued to get worse, but the windows never gave in. The staff promised that it was a tempered glass with double pane. They went so far to say that it could stop a low caliber bullet. I looked at the ferocious ocean beyond the glass and laughed at them. Who cares if it can stop at a 22? Can it dam up the Atlantic? No, that glass was nothing in comparison. I guess looking back, maybe the crew was just as shocked and needed to tell themselves something for comfort. It didn't end though. The captain said we were lagging a bit but still making good time, which no one reacted. You're too busy trying not to vomit on each other from the nauseating voyage. I started to doubt the legendary bachelor party and regretted tempting mother nature. She didn't care. If she did anything, she laughed at me. The boat rocked again, but this time it tipped so far that I had to put my foot on the wall next to me to stop myself from falling into it. The wall became the floor and then the floor became a wall. Fortunately, I sat solo at the start of the trip and no one had gotten close to me during the foyer. No one came crashing down on me from further up the road. I imagined if there had been, well, anything to toss about. Carts, luggage, whatever. It would have been like getting stoned to death every time the ferry shifted. It started to clear up after that, and thankfully so, because we couldn't have handled much more back there. We were inches from being tossed right through those windows and into the frigid waters beyond them. It would have been worse than anything I could imagine. The glass would absolutely annihilate our bodies as we passed through it, and the sucking vacuum of the ocean would have ripped us through the froth and debris into raging currents. After that, who knows? Drowning in water so cold it feels like ice cubes in your lungs, having every bone broken by the force of waves, and outright freezing to death. The possibilities were bleak but never came to fruition. We made it to shore, docked, and I even made my flight on time. That journey was almost as bad. That's a story for another time. This happened when I was 15. 
near Algonquin Park. My father and I were driving up to our cottage in the middle of winter. I was always so amazed by the beauty of that park and had grown up enjoying the beauty of it every single summer. The cottage was on a large lake, about 30 minute drive from the nearest town. There were probably thousands of cottages on the lake. During the summer, the lake and the town's population tripled. It was cottage country, so people would spend all summer enjoying the lake and warm nights around the campfires with their family and friends. I spent every summer out there growing up. It still brings fond memories of sunshine, laughter, and the sounds of motorboats on the lake. But the winters are different. The people that didn't live there year-round would venture back home to the city life, leaving the area mostly deserted, with cottages boarded up for the winter. There were a few people that still frequently would come up every couple of months for a few days or so. But, for the most part, the lake was silent during the winters, and the town was just filled with the locals. The beautiful pine trees are always covered with snow, making the forest quiet. Our cottage was on a dead-end road. There was about 20 other cottages on the road, with ours being somewhat in the middle. The cottages were quite spaced out. However, with our closest neighbors being too far away to see through the trees, my dad needed to head up to the cottage to do some painting that my mom had been bugging him to do. This was at the end of February, so it was a long weekend. I tagged along so he wouldn't be alone and we could spend some quality time together. It was about a five hour drive from home, but turned out to be an eight hour drive due to the heavy snow. It had gotten dark out quite early. It was around midnight as we drove through the park. It was deadly quiet and pitch black except for the headlights of the car. We finally passed through the park with only 30 minutes left to get to the cottage. It stopped snowing and we were both eager to get there. As we turned onto the familiar road, I remember my dad cursing. It hadn't been plowed yet. This wasn't surprising, however. It probably wouldn't be later until that day when we would even see a snowplow. As we drove down the road, I noticed there was a fresh set of tire tracks. The Smiths must be up for the weekend, my dad had said. All of a sudden, as we drove around the bend, following the tire tracks, the headlights of a car shone on a white van that was parked on the side of the road. It was almost hidden by the vast trees that were covered with snow. What the? My dad mumbled. As we drove past that white van, I remember looking back through the back window and very clearly seeing two figures in the front seat illuminated by our retreating taillights. I told my dad this and he shrugged. Ah, maybe they're lost. I nodded but couldn't help to think about how it was a dead end road. Why would they feel the need to park right there? As we pulled into our driveway and started bringing our stuff in, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I couldn't stop thinking about the van and why it was there, with two people just sitting in the dark in the middle of the night. It spooked me so much that I begged my dad to let me sleep upstairs with him, instead of downstairs in the room my sister and I usually shared. It had big windows with no blinds that looked out into the blackness of that forest, and my 15-year-old self was already scared of the dark, even without seeing that white van. It wasn't that big of a deal when my sister was there, but not tonight. As my dad got ready for bed, I sat in the living room reading a book. My dad had turned off all the lights. I was just using a small lamp next to the couch to try to get through one last chapter before I went to bed. It was so quiet that I could almost hear my ears ringing. I also started to get the feeling that I was being watched. The living room had two large windows, again with no curtains, that overlooked the lake. It was black except for a light or two from the cottages across the lake. I shut off the lamp and got up. Now that that cottage was dark, the moon was shining brightly, illuminating the snow. It was beautiful. I walked toward the window to get a better look. Movement caught my eye, and I remember my heart dropping as I saw two figures down by the back porch below the window, barely hidden by the surrounding trees. I immediately dropped to the floor and crawled towards the bedroom where my dad was. He was sleeping. My heart was in my throat. I wasn't sure if they'd see me or not yet. I woke my dad up, and by the time he got to the window, the two figures were gone. Where I had seen those figures, two sets of footprints were in the snow that led back to the front of the cottage and then back down the driveway. I begged my dad not to go outside. He double-checked the locks and turned on the porch lights, hopefully to scare any of them off. 
My dad wasn't as freaked out as I was, but still set the alarm before he headed back to bed. I remember being very freaked out, and I lay there all night next to my dad, terrified I'd look out the window and see someone staring right back at me. The next morning, my dad went outside and confirmed there were two sets of footprints leading from the road behind our cottage, and then back around the front of the cottage and then back up to the road. There were tire marks that showed the vehicle had turned around, then got back up to the main road. My dad guessed they were probably looking to break in and steal stuff, as it was the middle of winter. Not too many people were up at the lake. But they knew we were there. They would have seen our tire tracks leading to our cottage, and my dad's car parked out front. They also had to have seen the lamp I'd turned on to read, and or seeing it go off. My dad didn't have an answer to any of this, and after much back and forth, he called the non-emergency line and reported it. Apparently, there had been some break-ins in the area, and some stuff had been stolen from other cottages that were boarded up for the winter. But again, I still wonder to this day, why would they be interested in stealing from a house that clearly had people still inside? I was driving up to a ski hill after a snowstorm. Not having a great amount of money at the time, I hadn't invested in winter tires. Anyone who lives in a snowy region knows the value of these things. They can get an average vehicle out of a less than desirable situation. They aren't going to get you anywhere, but they'll keep you out of the ditches if you're careful. There's a tractor trailer in front of me, a car to my left and another car behind. This is almost the worst place a driver can be during snowy driving. My car was at the nexus of any trouble that was going to happen, so I did my best to stay sharp and focused. After a while though, I started to zone out. It's natural for us once we get relaxed and comfortable. Nothing chaotic had happened for a good 20 minutes or so. I just chilled out like anyone does as they're driving. Something shifted in the passenger seat, so I took my eyes off the road for a moment. I'm talking about a split second correction. I didn't even have to reach over or move anything. It didn't matter. Snow is merciless. Without the snow tires, my bald little city slickers were out of control instantly. I'd only made it as far as I did because I was following the trailer tracks in front of me. Just the faintest amount of slush sent me sailing over a crash course for a certain death. The right wheels crossed over into the shoulder and lost traction. The car drifted to the right onto the shoulder. I was hoping this would be the end of the situation, crash into the guardrail, sustain some body damage and get my dumb ass back on the road. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than spinning out. I took my foot off the gas and just tried to coast. No brakes, just open steering. Applying either pedal would have contributed to the chaos and lack of control, sending me into a collision at a faster speed. I would have gone into that guardrail, but the snow had piled up against it forming a natural curb that my car bounced off of. I stared in pure shock and terror as the visuals before me started to turn the other direction. I passed through those tracks that I was following, but I didn't have the reaction time to pull out of the slide. Between my lack of reacting and the impact of the snow drift, my car still, without proper traction, started naturally drifting left. The truck ahead of me began to slow, but I didn't want to brake for fear of losing what traction I had. Now, there's the option of potentially slamming into the back of his trailer, going through the windshield and maybe even getting decapitated. So my car makes its way sideways across the lane, and I prepare for whatever is going to happen when I sideswipe the vehicle one lane over. We didn't make contact, but I cut sharply into his lane before sliding back into mine. We came within inches of touching fenders, but he had a more equipped rig and was able to maneuver away from me. The humiliation of almost killing a stranger, and maybe even his family, brought me back into the moment. Just as I hit the center of the lane, my tires managed to grip the road again, and I resumed moving straight forward, tapping my brakes at this point to prevent myself from rear-ending the truck which was now right in my face. The car seems to be under my control again, and even resumes accelerating through the snow. It feels like an eternity typing it all out like this, but the whole event couldn't have taken more than a few seconds car collisions. I have an uncanny way of dilating time and stretching events out into the longest possible form. 
It has something to do with the real-time reaction to those events as they happen, and watching them either improve or worsen in rapid fashion. In the end, the only thing that my car made contact with other than the road was that snowbank, and that didn't even leave a mark. I escaped very, very luckily, and was grateful as I could be. It really could have gone south, not just for me, but for those other drivers. Had I killed someone else, it would have affected me forever. And yes, when I got home from the ski hill, I bought myself some snow tires, and haven't gone without them since that trip. I didn't live there, but I spent two months helping my grandfather shut up his second farm. He was selling the buildings and most of the land to live full time on his bigger farm up in Maine. They knew I needed work, and I went immediately from Baltimore up to them in my shitty Ford Focus. The work itself was lax, but tedious to start, mostly moving animals and their food, loading up trailer after trailer of chickens, pigs, cows, and one load of even horses. This was my first job in a while with livestock, and I was glad to be back tending to them. There's just something cool about working with animals. You get to know their personalities and quirks, and they can never talk shit to you. It's a rewarding exchange, and it's always rewarding at the end of a day, knowing they're all cared for. So flash forward about a month. We've moved most of the animals, thankfully, when a huge blizzard hit. It wasn't just a blizzard, though. His property rests at the bottom of a soft two-mile slope, and by soft... I mean a gentle slope that's very, very gradually declines until it reaches his property. In snow country, these types of terrain features are the worst. The snow cascades down the hillside in sheets until there isn't enough to slide anymore. The drifts were 20 feet high in some spots to give you a picture. The snow was as tall as two outlying barns and far taller than any of the stables or coops. We were using barrels burning wood and tires to keep the area between the house and barn clear. There would be a blazing barrel every eight feet or so, and we had to keep them going because they were impossible to restart. If the snow got in and doused it, the whole barrel had to be replaced. Rolling around an 800 degree steel barrel isn't as fun as it sounds. The wind was harder than I've ever seen, and the family was saying they've never seen it like this in at least 50 years. If you were going through a door that opened up to the outside, it required both arms to push it open. You had to protect your eyes and face because the wind shock could freeze the water in your eyes faster than you could close them. It happened to all of us and it was one of the worst, most indescribable pains of my life. Me and my uncle were taking turns filling a can of gas in the barn to keep the generators running. It was the only thing keeping us alive, frankly. The wood stoves and burning barrels were a nice addition, but the electricity was the real godsend. I felt like I was living in a different century, running around keeping everything going in shifts, wondering when it all would end. There was nothing to be done but the work at hand. Not long into the blizzard, my uncle fell and broke his leg. He was out there alone when it happened, and I didn't think to go check on him until he didn't return with the gas. I bundled up and pushed through the frost and wind until I reached that barn. I got inside and slammed the door behind me and turned to see him lying there in the mud and ice. He told me he'd yelled for a while, but realized there was no way anyone could hear him over the wind, so he just waited. I got up and found him a walking stick, helped him get back inside. Fortunately, his sister, my aunt, was there helping with the move, and just so happened to be a doctor, like a real one. She set his leg and got him splinted as well as she could. This was a pretty crazy development. Now, almost all of the hour-to-hour -hour labor fell on me. I set about grabbing wood and filling all the barrels, and stocking up the house too. I marched back and forth, arm load after arm load until I couldn't go anymore. The ice was starting to gloss over my eyes and my mouth. I thawed by the fire for five minutes and then went back to it. We needed more than wood. We needed that sweet, sweet gasoline. I stomped out three more trips for a total of six gallons of gas before I'd given up. We were stocked for half an evening, but my fingers and toes were threatening to develop frostbite. I wasn't willing to lose any part of my body for what that hourly they were paying me. Then Grandpa came over to ask me a favor. One more trip, out to the barn to make sure everything was sealed properly. I was still dressed, defrosting by the fire, so I said okay 
and then made one more trip into the storm. It was snowing again, piling up on those 20-foot drifts. They towered in the distance, overlooking the property like great white ogres. I get to the barn and everything is copacetic. The fuel line is closed. The lights are off. Nothing is out of place. The only thing I notice that's weird is the silence. For some reason, I can't hear any of the wind on the roof or against the back wall. It had been howling for a day and a half, two days at that point. And on top of that, I could still see that the wind was blowing. Why couldn't I hear it? I thought something was wrong with me. Maybe a weird symptom of hyperthermia. Maybe something even worse. And my nervous system was shutting down one sense at a time. I didn't know what else to think. Then I thought my eyes were messing with me. And I was getting vertigo. First the joints appeared as if they were twisting in place. Starting to lean. I looked at them in awe. Like I was having an acid flashback. Now I was certain something was wrong with my brain. Heat stroke existed, so I started to wonder, maybe there was such a thing as a cold stroke. That's when I heard a noise. Finally, something normal. It wasn't a normal sound, though. It was a pop or a chirp or maybe a snap. Something quick and loud. I looked back up to the walls and found that the joists were still now, but the boards of the walls were rippling. A window exploded above me, and I realized what was going on. I couldn't hear the wind because the snow had completely covered the barn. Those drifts piled up so high and so thick that they blocked any lighter wind from touching it. Now, all that weight was starting to move, and the barn was going with it. The structure was seconds from collapsing. I left everywhere where it was and sprinted for the exit. I dove through, landing hard on the ice and skated on my chest over to one of those burning barrels turned around just in time to watch a 40-foot snowdrift erase the barn from existence. I was expecting an explosive sound for some reason, but the insulation of the snow kept it relatively quiet. Grandpa couldn't believe it when I went inside and told him. We were all in disbelief 30 minutes later when the sun came out and started to burn off the clouds. That was the last winter gig that I ever took. I was pretty new at driving and coming home from work late one night and decided it was the perfect time for my first drive across the lake. I live in Minnesota and this is a huge rite of passage here. It sounds exactly what it is. Kids taking their cars across the frozen surface of really big lakes. It's a lot less risky than it sounds as the surface of the sheet of ice can be up to four or five feet thick. It's a huge solid piece of ice that is almost indestructible like someone took a rolling pin to an iceberg. Sometimes you'll see a dozen trucks parked in the same vicinity of the ice, tens of thousands of pounds, sitting right on top like it's nothing. And in between them, the fishermen have drilled holes through the surface to get to the water. Even with the additional weight and compromised ice, it still holds strong. I kept this all in mind as I left the earth and rolled out onto the water. It's an uneasy, almost sickening feeling the first few times. It's no different than driving on land when you're behind the wheel, but in your mind, you know there's hundreds of feet of water ready to crush you into nothing just a few feet below the engine. Things were okay for the first few minutes, but as I got closer to the center of the ice, I started getting nervous. It was really hard to see anything except the plowed path in front of me, and I realized I had no idea where I was going to come off the lake at, or if the path even went across the lake at all. That was the only time you heard about things going bad with these lake runs. People could get confused with the directions and cross the lake, but simply proceed into wilderness. It isn't paved or driven through all the way out there, so some people would get lost and eventually stuck. The other reality is, you might be driving in some tracks that just abruptly stop, and now you're facing an eight foot snow wall and there's no way to turn around. You have to back up the entire duration until you hit shore again. So I decided I would just turn around and go home. There was this little area I came up on that I looked like I could flip around in. It wasn't much of a clearing, but the snow wasn't piled up either. I came to a stop, which actually made me more nervous, like the weight was extra heavy now or something. I don't think it matters to the ice if vehicles are moving or not. They're either plummet through or they don't. As soon as I backed up off the plowed area to turn around, 
I was stuck in over a foot of snow. Tried putting my floor mat under the tire, which ended up flinging the mat 20 feet behind me. Tried digging out with my snow scraper. The only thing I succeeded in was doing and breaking off a fingernail and causing my finger to start bleeding. This was way before cell phones, so I finally decided I needed to start walking toward home. I was probably at least three or so miles away. That was a weird realization too, just how far out you could be on a lake. It was probably a mile just getting back to shore. I got all the supplies out I could, mostly jackets and things to insulate them with, and I had one crappy red flashlight. And unfortunately for me, the wind chill was about negative 20, and I don't know if you've ever tried to walk across a lake on a windy night, but the lake is pretty flat. There's nothing to shield you from the wind. By the time I got off that lake, I was seriously thinking that I was going to die of hypothermia. Not long after I reached an area with houses, and my extremely introverted, shy, socially awkward self bravely decided that I needed to knock on a door and get some help. Someone finally answered. I explained my predicament and asked if I could use their phone. I called home feeling relieved that help was within reach and enjoying the warmth of this stranger's house now. My younger brother answered. I told him to get dad and he said nope. I told him it wasn't funny, that I needed help and he hung up on me. I called back, but he must have left the phone off the hook because I only got a busy signal. After trying a few more times and feeling increasingly awkward, I decided the only thing I could do was walk the rest of the way home. So I did. My burning hatred of my brother and plans to beat the crap out of him kept me warm. I made it home with only one little spot of frostbite on my finger due to a hole in my glove. My brother got read the riot act by my dad just as I did for driving onto that lake. The next day, dad drove me back to get my car, which thankfully hadn't been towed. I haven't had any interest on driving on a lake since. A few years ago around Thanksgiving, it snowed a foot overnight. I was homeless at the time riding my bike, trailing a heavy bike cart that had a flat tire. The sun was going down and snow was starting to fall. I was sweating and exhausted because of that flat. I decided I needed to look at the tire. It was too much work trying to pull it through the snow and the slush. I pulled into an empty parking lot, found a little overhang to work under. It was very small, barely sticking a foot out from the walls, so it only gave my cover. The bike and the cart were fully exposed. I'm tinkering looking at the rip in the rubber and decide I really can't do anything with materials on hand. There's a break in the storm. The wind calmed down. The sun is long gone. I decide this place is as good as any to rest for just a minute before I start pulling the bike back to the place that I stay at night. What was supposed to be a few minutes of rest turned into four hours of me being completely passed out in this parking lot. The problem was, it started snowing not long after I fell asleep and I awoke buried under another six inches. The sweat on my skin and coat liner had turned to frost, and I was sure that I was hyperthermic, or close to it. It took me 30 minutes to fight my way out of the snow blanket. It was heavy, wet, dense, and my muscles were at the point of failure. Even after I uncovered myself, I could barely stand up. I used my handlebars to pull myself up to my feet. The parking lot was barren of any options. There was an office entrance, but even that was blown in with snow. And that's when I saw it. A dumpster. Certainly not one of my proudest moments, but I shambled back to the bike cart, pulled my blanket roll from the interior, and made my way over to the big green can. It was one of those green boxes with a double flip lid top. I threw my blankets in and dove in after them. Thankfully, it was just a few bags of garbage and loose cardboard. Nothing disgusting on top. Like I would have cared. It was the only option if I wanted to stay alive. I spent the night in there, with the putrid smells and rubbed all the parts of myself that kept falling asleep. The cardboard came in handy to further insulate the lid, fill the gaps that let the wind and snow in. I chalked my bike and belongings up to a loss, even in the storm. I assumed some asshole would cruise by, see my stuff, and roll it right down the road without me. When I cracked my fortress open in the morning, though, I found that I was wrong. The sun was out, my body recovered, and my bike was still right where I left it. 
That narrow escape was one of the events that ultimately helped me turn my life around. Sometimes rock bottom is actually a catapult. Once when I was in college, I lost the key to my car and I didn't have a spare. It was the middle of winter. I didn't have a choice but to walk to a car dealership six or seven miles from my apartment to get a replacement. In hindsight, this seems like such a weird, desperate avenue to take, literally. I think I used the winter time as an excuse not to ask for a ride, but damn, it was also the best excuse for a ride. Walking in the snow sucks, but I was young and seven miles didn't sound that far. Let me tell you how wrong I was. This was the most exhausting thing I've ever done. The first mile took my breath away, but after that, each step took noticeably more effort. My energy levels weren't that great to start with, having the stress of no car or key, so I was handicapped from the get-go. The other mistake that I made was not realizing there would be another seven miles waiting for me on the return trip. This really was desperation, not planning out any part of the journey before me. I got there just fine in the early afternoon, but it took a lot longer than I thought to get in a replacement key. The quote they gave me over the phone was way shorter than what they told me in the waiting room. An hour turned into two, and then I didn't hear back from anybody. The sun set. Snow started to fall. Finally, someone came out with an envelope with my name on it, two keys, ready for my car. I just needed to navigate the snowy roadways in the dark. I pulled up my flimsy hood up against the wind and snow, but it was completely useless. The gusts cut right through it, and my whole face was frozen numb within the first 10 minutes. My phone said it dropped from 19 degrees to negative 25 degrees. This accounted for the wind chill, which had frozen my scarf stiff. I pulled it inside my jacket to warm up and use it around my face, but it didn't help. I could feel my lips blistering from the temperatures. Another factor presented itself. I forgot my inhaler. It was in my school bag. I start being careful all the way back not to breathe too deeply. My breathing was just about the only thing I had control over, so I actually had to slow down my pace even more just to accommodate my lungs. It was like a death trap for a person like me, having to move slower and slower in plummeting temperatures. I started hearing this strange, tiny clicking noise and realized that the condensation from my breath had settled on my eyelashes and the wind had frozen them, making them clink every time I blinked. I laughed at first, but after hearing it enough, I started to panic. Would my eyelashes break off by the time I got home? Would the frost extend into liquid in my eyeballs and start to freeze them too? I'm getting colder and colder and exerting more and more just to keep going. Eventually, the inevitable asthma attack starts about three blocks from my apartment. It starts as this biting fire, and soon, my lungs are empty and shriveled. It's like someone just hit me in the back with a sledgehammer and knocked the wind completely out of me. Now I'm trying to recover through a straw. It's a panic feeling, and I can't afford to fall into this attack anymore. Somehow, I managed to stagger the rest of the way through. I kept losing track of whether my feet were moving or not. Sometimes I thought I was just standing in place, but when I looked down, I'd be in motion. It was a very weird hallucination. When I finally made it, I knew all I had to do was to get to my inhaler. I knew exactly where it was, I just had to get to it. I climbed the stairs. I opened the door. I collapsed on the couch where I left my bag. Numb fingers fumbled it out, but I only managed one of the required two puffs before the oxygen deprivation rendered me unconscious. I had never passed out before. The involuntary nature of the experience was sickening. My roommates thought I was napping and covered me with a blanket, boots and all. I regained consciousness in the wee hours, weak and wheezing. As I regained coherency, I remembered what had happened. I broke down and sobbed quietly as I could. I could feel the chill in the space between my organs. I was scared to pull my boots off and see what my feet looked like. The one puff had been enough to open my airway a little bit. I used my inhaler again, and though I probably should have gone to the hospital, I just put on a few layers and had a cup of mint tea and then went to bed. My body seemed to be fine, aside from the absolute destroyed muscles in my legs and my chest. 
There was a throb in my head too, but not enough to get me out of the house again. And then I remembered the keys in the envelope, the whole goal of my mission, my trek through the tundra. In a panic, I fly back to my coat and throw it open, check the interior pocket. There they were, safe and sound. All was right in winter wonderland. My roommates were flabbergasted when I told them what had happened the next day. They really thought that I was just deeply asleep. I was very lucky to not have died. So obviously, next time, I'm asking for a ride. I was driving to work during the tail end of a massive snowstorm, or sort of essential food service, but for a college campus. Many of the students who live on campus don't have kitchen in their dorms, or many don't even drive, so lots of them wouldn't eat if we didn't open up. This made us travel up through some pretty insane conditions, but those kids wouldn't eat if we didn't show up. Even restaurants near campus closed during a level three snow emergency inside the city. Anyway, the informal policy for work for these situations is just to make an honest effort if you can, but don't risk your life. I'm one of the few there that has a four-wheel drive, and I have the biggest vehicle, a crew cab truck. So I drive down to campus and then pick up workers who live nearby that wanted to come in. I'm rolling down the highway at a decent clip, only one lane that had been sort of plowed. I'd scoot over to the far left and kicked it into four-wheel. Not many cars out. It's still snowing and things are going pretty smooth and I'm feeling good. Never fall for that overconfidence though. That's what brings on the trouble. Once you're confident, get relaxed and after that it's all over. You stop making decisions and start reacting. That's when you forfeit control. I'm doing about 40 miles per hour when I notice a pair of headlights coming up behind me. Faster than they should. It has to be an emergency vehicle, right? I, I couldn't really tell. I signal to move over to the middle lane just in case they're starting to ease over. The headlights are getting closer, way faster than I'm comfortable with. It's close enough now that I can tell it's a big, lifted SUV. Now my farm truck is pretty big, but I'm not keen on wrecking it, and I certainly don't want to tangle with something that's that big in this weather. I assume it has four-wheel drive as well, but what a jackass. There's no reason to be driving this fast on ice and snow. I let off the pedal and start inching to the far right lane, just about the time he's going to overtake me, just as we're heading onto a bridge. Something went wrong for the guy. That ice got him, and he started fishtailing. I'm ever so gingerly towing the brake, trying to slow the best I can without risking the same fate for myself. I know without a doubt in my mind, this driver is a lost cause, maybe even a fatality. I'm trying to create as much distance as possible when he collides with something crashes in the snow have a nasty habit of pulling the cars around them into the mix as well. There's just too many extra factors with all the sliding and the embankments. The SUV loses all traction, spins, and goes sliding over across my lane, missing me by inches. Windshield facing windshield. It was close enough that we locked eyes for a split second, and I could see the terror in them. Then he spun away from me, into the darkness and off the road. He was exactly what I expected. Young, either arrogant or ignorant to how to drive in the snow. Maybe there was an emergency somewhere, but who knows. We'd both just crossed the bridge as this happened. He went flying off the highway right where the guardrail ended, sailing into some trees. I saw the branches shake and the snow fall with a whoosh, then nothing but the faint glow of the taillights. Now I had to call this idiot in, and I can't tell you how common it is for some dummy driver to send their car sailing off a roadway, snow or shine, only to never be found. Calling it in is the move, because the person that just crashed might be unconscious and there's no way to get to them. They could wake up later with no memory of where they were, and even if they do remember, sometimes the crash can rearrange the contents of a car. Their phone might not be where they left it. Either way, that dumbass not only wrecked driving like an idiot, but almost came inches from taking me with him. I saw a couple of cars behind me slowing down and pulling off, so I called 911 and kept right on to work. My butt cheeks were clenched so tight, I thought I was going to have to get someone to pry me off the truck seat with a crowbar. It's not always the ice and snow that'll get you into trouble. It's the damn idiots you share the roads with, 
who don't know how to drive safe in it at all. So this story takes place 11 years ago. I was a senior in high school at the time, but it's the single most mind-boggling thing I've ever experienced. It's also important to note that it happened in mid-December. I live in Iowa, and the winter's here, yet extremely cold at night. Like if you get stuck outside, you will die kind of cold. Plus, the snowfall makes everything dead silent. You can hear anything and everything inside the house and even immediately outside of it. Me and my best friend were hanging out in my family's walkout basement, just having a boring winter night playing some video games. We were also the only ones at home. The reason it was just us is because my mother went straight from work to the bar to grab a few drinks with coworkers. so me and my friend thought it would be a good idea to break into the family wine and just live a little. As we were sitting there opening up the first bottle, I hear the door to the garage door open and then slam shut. I immediately go, oh shit, and start looking for places to hide the bottle. My friend then says, I thought you said your mom was supposed to be out all night. She was, I replied. Then I heard a few heavy stomps and hear my mother yell out, Anyone home? I yell back upstairs, Yeah, we're just, we're just hanging out in the basement, Mom. I hear a few more steps move from the garage door toward the stairs and then she yells out again, Hey, can you come help me with something? I need you up here. I reply back while frantically trying to find a good place to hide the wine bottle. Yeah, just just give me a minute, Mom. Then there was silence for another 20 seconds. Anyone down there with you? She yelled back in a more concerned and serious tone, in a voice that was slightly off of my mother's. This was the first thing that told me something just wasn't quite right. Our family never cared if anyone was over, as our house was a very open house to all my family and friends. Plus the voice, it was just wrong. It sounded like my mother's, but it was missing something that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Weirded out, I replied back. It's just Colton. After I yelled that back to her, I finally found a good place to hide the bottle and began walking up the steps to the next level. Now, as I was walking up those steps, I couldn't help but feel the overbearing silence of the house and the slight electric twinge that something was not right. When I got to the top of the steps, I look over to where the garage door was, and then also to the kitchen right next to it. It's black. Pitch black. All the lights were off. There's no moon shining even through any of the windows. I walked over to the kitchen yelling out, Mom, where are you? There was no reply. Silence and darkness. I feel the electric twinge turn into full-on needles and my adrenaline kicks in full force. I have to get out of here as fast as possible. My mother was not home. I run back down the stairs grabbing my coat along the way. Well, what's wrong, dude? Golden says. My mom's not home. I reply as fast as I can looking for my truck keys. What do you mean you were just talking with her? I could see the confusion on his face. Dude, there's no one home. We need to leave now. I took a few steps towards the back door that opened up into the yard. Then I see my dog shaking on the couch and my cat growling behind it. I couldn't just leave them. I knew that if we left, something might happen. Are we leaving? Bolton said, still confused as hell. No, I, I can't leave them here alone. Something is really off though. I'm going to call my mom and figure this out. I pull out my phone and call my mother. She picks up immediately. Hey, sweetie, what's going on? She answers. Mom, were you just home? I heard you yelling for me from the second level. When I went up there, you weren't here. I said, hoping that she was playing some kind of joke. No, I'm just leaving the bar. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you okay? What do you mean you heard me? I fill her in on the whole story and she rushes home. Colton and I stayed in the basement with the animals until she got back. But before she did, you could hear something upstairs, not walking or sitting on things, but like a pressure in the air, like a black hole was slowly moving from one room to the next, and the word that I would instinctively describe it as is hungry. 
When she got home, you could feel the thing leave just as quick as it came, like an overbearing predator presence that had just flown away. We've still never figured out what the hell was going on, and this is just one of the many unexplainable things that's happened to us, but this is the easiest to write down, and the one I was happy to have a witness to. Unfortunately, my mother has passed away now, and I've moved away to Arizona, but whenever I go back to Iowa and I see Colton, he still gets creeped out by what happened. I will truly never know what exactly happened, but I know that whatever that was had my mother's voice, and it was evil and hungry. I live in Alaska. That probably puts a pretty clear image in your head of what I deal with inside the wilderness. It's a long list, but many of the dangers are things unlikely to be encountered. But some of them are just a given. Wolves, sometimes. But it's the bears we all really look out for. A lot of the predators out there are smarter than we give them credit for. But bears don't give a shit. They want to push the boundaries, test the limits, and sometimes, even just piss you off. It's like dealing with a dog that can take your head clean off. I was stalked by a bear for a couple of miles while hunting deer. It was mid-September. It was probably 40 degrees. This is important too because bears can operate better at different temperatures. Too hot and they become lazy. Too cold and things become too much work for them. They don't want to be put in the chase. That Goldilocks zone between 30 and 60 degrees. And that bear might tail you for two or three miles just to see if you make a mistake. It's a truly haunting experience. The weather wasn't extreme, but that's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me that I can at least recall out there. I'd recently watched Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. I was with my son, so I was a little on edge already. And then this bear comes out of nowhere. The Revenant aside, we've all heard of the infamous Grizzly Man. Tim Treadwell was a bear enthusiast, known for his seasonal treks into the Alaskan bush, wherein he would live alongside groups of grizzlies. He was mercilessly eaten alive over the course of an hour or two in the fall of 2003, something many of the outdoorsmen's whisper about around a campfire up here. It's a worse fear for a lot of us, truly a fate worse than death. We were walking down a game trail, and the brush was so thick, and the bear was barely 20 feet in front of us, and you couldn't even see it, but you could hear it and smell it. This is a signature for the area up here. You can almost always tell there's a bear near you before even seeing it. The smell is a huge indicator, but also the stillness. A forest will just go dead silent, as will a stream, a glen, or really anything. It's an energy nothing trifles with. I'm walking up the trail. Everything in front of us was shaking. Then all of a sudden, everything stopped. The only thing that I could hear was the bear breathing and the sound of my own heartbeat. I handed my son the 44 mag and loaded around into my rifle. I told him to run if we were attacked. We started to back up slowly and it took a step. Because of deep-rooted fear of bear encounters, many outdoorsmen up here carry a heavy sidearm. The rifle itself is good, but it's only one big bullet before you have to rechamber a shell with the bolt. Having a semi-automatic pistol enables you to squeeze the trigger six, seven, maybe even ten times, depending on the caliber. It's also quicker barrel correction for moving targets. It's also a quicker draw. It just makes sense for danger encounters where the hunter no longer has the upper hand. Leo DiCaprio in The Revenant would have been just fine had he carried a 10mm over that muzzle-loading musket. Such is life. I started to yell at it, and it stopped dead in its tracks which surprised and relieved us both. We both heard stories. You're supposed to yell and try to scare them off. But there's lots of stories where that stuff doesn't flat out work. When I saw it hesitate, I wasted no time. We stepped off the game trail and started bushwhacking down the hill. It began to follow us, and when I started to hear it getting closer, I would turn around and yell. It was better than dumping a couple of rounds in this thing for it to scuffle off then have to deal with the wounds somewhere else. Call me stupid, but I respect wildlife. I'm not trying to kill or maim anything. I can't get home and eat myself. It followed us for like maybe two miles. 
It was never more than 50 or 60 feet behind us, just trudging along, investigating. Only once did I swing around and put a bead on it with my rifle. That breathing got aggressive for a second, and it sounded like it was thrashing toward us. We made eye contact for a brief second through the gap of my sights, and it took careful steps back into the foliage. It was a scary experience, but having my son with me opened up a whole new world of fear. All I could think about was one of us having to watch the other get eaten, completely incapacitated from the fight. But fortunately, for both of us, it got bored and thankfully left us alone. This story ended up being a lot longer than I originally anticipated, and I apologize for the long read. I will say that in all the years I've told this story, people usually respond like this. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So I hope you take the time to enjoy it. This story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon, was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hunting particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hunting were secondary to the thrills of walking to the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week of living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure, and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail right after graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. I was stalking quail and grouse, two of my favorite birds to hunt. Also, two of the easiest to get a permit for in a state that you don't live in. Bird hunting satisfied me in the sense that you get to get all the good stuff. Hiking, tracking, spotting, stalking. But you don't have to deal with the dead weight at the end. Everything you clip weighs under a pound, so it's easy to bring 10 or 15 home to clean. It also limits what you need to carry in terms of a firearm. For birds, all you really need is a single shot 20 gauge, which is exactly what I was using. It's a small caliber, but it's still a shotgun. Enough to leave someone feeling at least a little protected. Somewhere in the National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail, only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock, dressed nearly in all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple that kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and just simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not really knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, like I always did, following bear precautions. I hung the leftover food that I'd cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed that the food wasn't there. I immediately thought that a bear had to have entered my campsite, so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up the rope which the food was hanging. I thought back to the couple that I passed earlier, and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured that couple was just simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than food. Several more days passed, and my mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks. To wake me in the event of any intruders, animals or otherwise. I woke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife and that 20 gauge. 
Situational awareness is beyond important in encounters like this. There isn't any cell phone service. There isn't any help coming. If you hunt or hike alone, you have to be careful. You have to take every precaution and be prepared to adapt to some potentially f***ed up situations. Animals and people in the woods are unpredictable, so you need to know what your options are and what you're capable of inside these moments. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely to be an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from, but in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, it plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out to claim that I had a gun, but instead decided to remain silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard the footsteps circling my tent. I was ready to slash and shoot whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lay frozen awake in my tent until sunrise. I opened up my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence that something actually happened were boot prints. Same as before. It's super ominous to find fresh boot prints that don't belong to you. I didn't need any more encouragement to completely abandon that area and move on to another. This was a serious cross-country trip for me though. I was planning on hiking and bird hunting for the better part of 100 miles through various types of California terrain. Several more days passed. I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front and behind me. I stopped for water in the rear shade and noticed there were two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, This, this trip is over. The reason being that I could literally see these people in those weird white clothes. Who the hell wears white on a rugged cross-country hike? I'll tell you who. A complete psychopath. They were like machines, steadily gaining on my position, no matter the terrain. They never looked up once, eyes glued to the dirt as they followed the trail I left behind. They were outdoorsmen, trackers at the very least. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Costella, located off I-5. The only problem was, it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and then decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got inside my tent, tried to get sleep, but every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours inside my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of any other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is so messed up. Ah, damn. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent. It lights up the entire thing and then goes dark. I unzip my tent and climbed out carrying my knife yelling nonsense into the darkness. It was sort of like that cliche scene in movies where people in the wilderness hear sticks breaking around them and then the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound is coming from. Then I heard footsteps running toward the tent and barely made out a figure moving inside my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into multiple trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under that tree trunk and lie still. I saw that flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain that they were gone now, but I still didn't move. Eventually birds started chirping, and I knew sunrise would soon follow. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail. I abandoned my campsite and I walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke to the police and forest reserve. They put me up in a motel for the night 
and my parents drove down from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and Forest Service months later, who told me that there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there had been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experienced. As far as I know, nothing else ever came of the couple. I grew up in a hunting and archery family. We own the largest indoor archery range in the United States, and my father is a three-time world champion, and my uncle is Butch Johnson, Olympic gold medalist. Anyone in this hobby makes it a lifestyle. They live it, breathe it, and would die for it. A family friend of a high reputation in the archery world told us the story that he experienced while hunting, and since then, has never entered the woods again. Again. I come from a long line of legendary archers, not just daytime sportsters, but people who have built their entire livelihood on skill and reputation. These are people with something to lose. What I'm saying is they aren't going to gossip about some bullshit when they know better. So back to this family friend. The story happened back when he was still hunting. He sticks mostly to indoor tournaments now, but he was known to bag them and tag them back in the day. Deer, elk, you name it. He killed it with a bow and a single arrow. He's in his tree stand alone, staring out into the woods in a small field, about 50 to 60 yards away. A doe has now walked out of the woods to graze on the grass. He raises his compound bow. He takes aim. But then from the other end of the field comes, and this is what he described it as, a large ape-like creature, close to 8 feet tall, just booking it on two legs toward this doe. For the story... We'll say it's Bigfoot, but I'm going to tell you now that none of us actually believe that to be true. So this Bigfoot runs up to the deer, and before it even knows what's happening, it gets picked up from under one arm, under the deer's belly, and continues a full sprint into the woods at the other end of the field. The deer is screaming bloody murder as it's carried away by this unknown creature. Our friend is there, bow still drawn, shaking in shock questioning everything he knows about the land. The animal life there, he's used to hunting, everything. He'd been hunting this area for 25 or 30 years at that point in his career. He's a true stalker in the sense that he's in the place hours before the sun comes up, long before any prey is in motion. He's silent. He doesn't wear anything that carries a smell. He was a phantom up in that tree, and nothing knew he was there. The man was certain death up until this point. He refused to get down for the longest time until it started getting dark and he didn't want to be alone at night after seeing that. He gets out of the stand, left over $5,000 worth of equipment up there and sprinted back to his truck. We actually went back out with him to help collect it all. And that's when we knew something truly strange had happened. Who would leave all that out there overnight? Only a person who's truly afraid. He stands by his claim and has never, not once, returned to hunting, or the woods, after being now in his mid-fifties and spent his whole life around it. This is what sealed the deal for us. Someone we'd hunted with for nearly decades literally will never hunt again. The guy won't even hike or fish anymore. He doesn't think it was an actual Bigfoot, but the reality of not knowing what it was keeps him out of that woodland. Seeing it move at that speed, at that size, without making a single noise, as hunters, we can tell you it's impossible. When you're eight feet tall, or other things can usually hear you breathing. That's how you stalk a moose in the bush. Sometimes there's a curtain of birch, and you have to lead the animal blindly, using only when it's huffing and walking as a guide, until it turns the cover. Because when you're that big, every step is loud as hell. This creature didn't make any of those sounds. Not even when it was at a full sprint. No breathing, no crunching leaves. Just a simple thud through the earth that he actually felt more than he heard. After seeing it move like that, he shared a little bit with us that it'd be easy for a person of any size to disappear with a creature that can move like that. Every hiker and hunter that comes up missing probably reminds him of that day.
this is always the one that disturbs others the most for whatever reason. A quick background. I grew up in the forest, inside this tiny house in the Appalachian Mountains. Our house was more like a shack, and behind it was a large looming mountain. The nearest neighbors weren't far, but with the woods in between it, it sure did seem like it. My parents were in a band and left once or twice a week from about 5pm to 2am to practice or go to a show. I was around 12, my sister was 6 or 7. We would pass the time by watching some old VHS tapes or just talking. One night my parents left and a torrential downpour started. If you know Tennessee, you know that a flood can happen at any time. I've had several pets drown from just being outside. We had a small closed in porch in which my mom's favorite dog Whiskers was tied via a 20 foot chain wrapped around this toolbox. It wasn't the most effective or even considerate method of retention, but it served its purpose. We were poor. Whiskers was doofy and about as useless as a guard toad, but he had a loud bark and my parents hope was that he would frighten intruders on sight. He was sleeping quietly on the closed in porch until the wind came which at the time was a complete roar. It caused the front door to come out from its hinges. Whiskers bolted off into the night. I yelled at my sister, I'm gonna go get him, put on my dad's rubber mining boots and ran out. I didn't get a flashlight because, I don't know, I was a dumb kid. I was terrified for his safety, especially in the rain, and the fact that if my parents found out that their dog was missing, I would have had the shit beaten out of me. Lightning lit up the side yard, just enough for me to see him bolting down the bank and across the stream in the backyard toward the mountain. I ran after him. The creek had a quote unquote bridge, which was just a very thin wooden plank. I didn't even touch it, but left over it. My adrenaline was sky high. Now the lightning was gone, and I could only hear whiskers based on the dragging sound that his chain was making. Maybe 30, 40 seconds, and I was already soaked with rain. Not a dry spot on my entire body. So I ran up into the forest. I lost the sound of whiskers. I was in a panic at this point, with the rain and a lost dog, and so I numbly just scaled the slippery leaves as I ran. I called out. I made kissy noises as you do for a dog when you're 12. Then out of nowhere, it seemed like a shadow fell. I don't really know how else how to describe it. I couldn't see anything. But the black suddenly got blacker. And then I quickly realized something else. I could smell extra well, thanks to the rain. It really made things pungent. I smelled dead leaves. I smelled wet dog. And I smelled dog urine, which was not surprising. I actually got hopeful at that point, because I knew he would be out trotting around, marking his territory, and maybe, just maybe, I could find him. But the extra black just seemed ominous. I stopped calling or whistling. I felt anxious, like something else was in this forest with me. That's the exact feeling I got, and I stopped to listen. Living so close to Appalachia, you hear a lot of legends about what goes bump in the night, especially around here. We got it all from goat men to feral people, inbred ghouls and wendigos, backpacking serial killers, you name it, we got it all. I don't know what I was listening for, but it was just something more than my dog. A whistle? A voice? Someone calling my name? My mind was racing with all the different myths that I'd heard over the years. I couldn't hear anything, but from above me, the crest of the mountain, I smelled something. It smelled putrid, rotten, like a carcass that had been sitting in the southern Tennessee heat all day long. I remember almost gagging, and my anxiety turned into true actual fear. I knew how bears smelled, and how most animals smelled actually. This was not something organic in an alive sense. It was a rot that smelled older than time, ageless, the decaying body of something that hadn't walked the earth in a very long time. I still couldn't hear any footsteps, but I got the sense that something was moving toward me. It was kind of like a vertigo, if that makes any sense. My body was not wanting to stay still at that point. I was frozen in terror staring out into nothing, smelling rot, and feeling like I was being stalked. I've been stalked by a mountain lion before. It felt almost exactly the same, except with an extra dose of piss-your-pants fear. 
then add the torrential rain, and I can hardly breathe out there. Too awestruck to even move. The lightning flashed again. I saw something impossible. The trees were lit up around me, but several feet in front of me there was a huge black void. It was a pure, pitch black. In my peripheral, I could see really far around me, but in front, it was just like someone had sharpied the entire forest out. Right then, I heard a dog barking, and whiskers sort of appeared out of nowhere from my right, insanely barking and heading towards that dark spot. The lightning went as fast as it came, and my only thought was, now it sees us. Somehow I had the sense to dive down and pick up Whiskers, and grab the long chain before he got too far. I had to yank him away. Keep in mind it's still raining loud as holy fuck, so loud that I'm sure nobody else heard him barking, but me, I was standing next to him, and I heard this guttural noise from the top of the mountain. It was more like a growl, and more like a rumble, almost an earthquake sound. It was deep and all my wet hair stood completely on end. I remember taking off, and I thought I'd have to drag the damn dog all the way down the hill, but he seemed to agree with my decision. I have no clue to this day, and one of the biggest mysteries is how we got through all of that forest without slamming into any trees. Black vision, downhill at a 70 degree angle, with slippery leaves, we were like superheroes there for a second. Superheroes who would probably have pissed our pants if we looked behind us. It was also incredible to me that in my dad's big clunky boots, I was able to keep pace with a running dog. But that's how frightened we really were. It was nothing but true animal instinct. We crossed that bridge, and I ran across it this time, hearing my footsteps thunk loudly and thinking to myself, Oh man, that was loud. As though we were being chased. We get back into the house. I chain the dog up. He's wet, shivering, and looking very remorseful for his bad decision. I scrambled into the house, getting a hammer and fixing up the door the best I could. It was a shack like I said, so our lock was a piece of wood and a nail in the middle. I changed into some warmer clothes and sat back down, too scared to even say much. My sister was tired and quiet. It was late. She wanted me to put on a movie, but I stopped her. I still felt uneasy. We put the lights off. Trust me, it was far less frightening this way, because if the lights were on and it's pitch black outside, anyone can be watching you. So we sat in the dark living room and looked out the picture window at our rainy yard. We still didn't see anything, but there were flickers of shadows. Something was off. When the lightning appeared, there would be a mass either far or near that didn't light up just right. I took a flashlight and shined it out the window, and the same thing, it just ended. The beam was cut off, swallowed up by black spots. Whiskers, usually, was the type of dog to bark his head off at the mere sight of a butterfly, but he was now dead quiet. Our roosters all over the property though, we had at least 200, were all crowing. I remember that I had this superstition book when I was a younger kid, and inside that book it said if a rooster crowed at night, death was near, as in physical manifestation, medieval death. Since my dad was a cockfighter and a rooster expert, I asked him, but this was years before this incident, I asked him what a rooster crowing at night meant. His reply was almost as chilling. It means something is walking through them. If they were crowing and he was awake, He'd go out with his gun and almost always bring back a mink or a weasel or a snake. So roosters seemed to have a pretty good alarm system. This night, when it was darker than dark and the rain was pouring down in sheets, you could hear them all crowing and crowing constantly. I said nothing to my sister and she didn't know what the crowing meant. My sister ended up falling asleep and I stayed awake, staring out that window until my parents finally arrived home complaining of the wet dog smell and shooing me away to go sleep somewhere else. They asked me what happened. I told them in about three words that whiskers got loose and I caught him quickly. They saw the door and luckily didn't blame me for that. They blamed the storm. I thought that was the end of it, but there was one more thing. The next day, my dad was very pissed off, yelling about hooligans wandering around in the rain. 
He also has a pretty bad case of paranoia. He thinks people are always out to get to him. I went out to see what had happened, feeling that whatever it was was probably due to the storm and not any kind of people. But he was angry because of that bridge. The long flat panel of wood was completely busted and splintered into pieces. Maybe a person could have smashed it. Maybe, if they weighed 450 pounds. But the amount of splintered wood and knot edges seemed like it was from a sledgehammer or a freakishly large beaver with anger issues. I never had the stomach to tell him what I saw that night, because there was no way I could ever prove it. He was already a basket case, with some serious paranoia. I figured laying out the idea of a skulking dark evil entity coming out of the mountain probably wasn't a good move. Weird things continued to happen on that property for as long as we lived there, but I never saw that void ever again, and that's probably for the best. My buddy and I went hunting over a long weekend just a few years ago. We hiked into our hunting terrain and stayed inside a tent. We were in the middle of nowhere, inside the Norwegian wilderness, and we had exclusive hunting rights to that area, so we really didn't expect any other people to be there. No cell service within something like a 6 kilometer radius, and then another 10 kilometers back to our cars. It was isolating and breathtaking just to be out there. Relaxing is an understatement. We were camped next to a small lake and didn't see any other people there for the first couple of days. It was liberating to be that deep to not hear so much as an engine throughout the day. The tasks that we had throughout the day were whatever we chose to do, fishing, bird hunting, as well as other small game, and stalking elusive red deer. It was a catch-all that satisfied any urge that we might have. This also meant that we had a good assortment of equipment, including some shotguns, a few long rifles, and a pair of small caliber pistols for execution, knives, and axes for wood cutting. We were almost like a small army out there. On our last night, we were eating dinner next to our campfire. It was pretty late, so everything outside our immediate surroundings was completely pitch black. Suddenly we heard someone take a shot on the other side of the lake, with what sounded like a rifle. We thought it was a bit strange since there shouldn't have been any other hunters anywhere close by but we just figured someone was messing around further away than what it sounded like. We quickly forgot about it and settled back in to eat. After another five to 10 minutes, someone then took a second shot, which sounded like it came much closer to us. This time the bullet hit some rocks literally right next to us, five meters or so. We both froze for a few seconds while looking at one another and then just ran to our tent to pick up our shotguns. We then ran quite a ways into the woods and just hunkered down. After a few minutes, we heard another shot, and we were both pretty positive that that one hit our tent, which later turned out to be correct. We obviously had no idea of what to do. We couldn't call the cops since there was no cell service. It was completely dark. We couldn't really hike out of there without using our flashlights. It seemed like a terrible idea. So we ended up finding a downed tree with a little cave-like thing under the roots. We just sat there until morning. It was like being in a foxhole or something. I just sat there for hours, replaying that visual of the bullet striking those rocks just near our feet. If the shooter had pulled the barrel up an inch, that bullet would have buried itself inside my leg or my chest. I had phantom pains littering the places I thought would hurt the most. All the while, I'm waiting for more gunfire to start splintering the logs above me. It reminded me of the trench combat in the First Great War. We packed up as quickly as possible and basically ran back to our cars where we called the police. It seemed like the cops took it pretty seriously, but nothing ever came out of it from that investigation. Still have no idea what happened to this day or who could have possibly done it. There is absolutely no reason for anyone else to be out there with the gun. Unless they were poachers, which is almost unheard of in Norway. I've literally never been so scared in my life. And it definitely took a few years before we ever went back. P. 
pig hunting in the bush in the Janolan, New South Wales in Australia. I'm sure you're at least somewhat familiar with the term bush, so I won't go too far into the logistics. It's incredibly isolated, no quick back way to anywhere, and there isn't any shade or water for shit. Everything is angry, poisonous, covered in spikies, and just plain wanting to kill you. Saltwater alligators are some of the most notorious, but, but almost anything can kill an unsuspecting outdoorsman out here. Kangaroo, koala bears, snakes, and lizards, and the list is nearly endless. It's afternoon at this point. We'd already been creeping through the bush for a couple of hours. No shots taken yet. But we come across a lot of fresh tracks and droppings, so we knew there was something nearby. In a single file lane, we zigzagged near a waterway to help cover the sound of our footsteps. That's when I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn and my mate is pointing out the bobbing shapes of a pair of wild pigs. They look decent size, high energy, just trucking along near the brush. We fall in line and start to stalk them along the river. The pigs stop every few meters, start destroying the riverbank, rooting around, kicking up dirt and pissing everywhere. These pigs are pretty toxic to the environment out here and hunters don't think twice about dragging their mangy little carcasses back to their camp. It keeps the terrain intact for at least next season. So anyway, we're downwind and totally still. About 30 meters away in the brush, about to take our shots with our 308s, when the two pigs absolutely piss bolt away. We'd been tracking them for 20 minutes at this point, and none of this bolty behavior presented itself the entire time. Whatever had scared them really had made them jump because there's zero chance of us following them or even catching up. We stand up and shake our heads with no clue to what scared them away. I've never seen a pig go from zero to full flight without a gunshot at least first. We look and check the embankment, nothing. No snakes, no crocs in the shallows, no big birds of prey. We start to look around for hikers or maybe there's other hunters on the far side of the creek. Anything to explain that sudden getaway. Still nothing. We're pretty buggered at this point, decide to pack it in. It was a defeating day, but we'd seen sign of plenty of through traffic. There'd be no shortage of shots to take throughout that weekend. As you know, Australia is hot, but the bush is blistering. You can't carry on for more than a few hours without rest and water, especially hucking around your equipment. Our hunting sessions were about five hour stretches in the morning until about noon. On this first day, when we did most of our scouting, we started a little later so the sunset is starting to creep in. Just as we're walking back through some pretty thick pine forest, maybe a hundred meters away from the bank where we lost those pigs, we both hear a growl. I start to turn around, but I hesitate because part of me has no clue what I just heard. My mate plants his feet, shoulders his rifle, and just waits for movement, like some kind of war hero. I swear to God it sounded like a lion from an African movie. There's nothing in the Australian bush that makes that kind of sound. Nothing at all. There are larger than average kangaroos, and the occasional pack of dingoes, but they can't growl like this thing did. They don't have that kind of mass. I've never felt fear like I did in that moment in my entire life. Then I quickly realize, no bird song nearby, and we're pretty damn close to the evening chorus time. So we're standing for five minutes with our rifles out in the falling light. There's still no birds. Now we finally decide to head back to the fire trail, where I park my ute at. It's a 30 minute walk in the dust. Our rifles are out, and we're both jumping every time we hear anything. I still don't know what that sound was but I will never forget how primally afraid it made us, like evolution had programmed us to shit our underpants when hearing it. I have not hunted in that area since, and that was back in 2006. My mate went back a time or two, but never found anything. No weird tracks, no massacred animals, and no more growling sounds. Just another thing trying to kill us in the outback. I was a young hunter when this happened. It was just my second time out, sitting in a tree stand with my uncle, who'd been hunting his entire life. My dad worked a pretty demanding white collar job and lost touch with that side of his upbringing. So he just shipped me off with his brother to instill some core values. To paint you a picture, our stand was near the bottom left of this acre of land. 
We had two acres visible, one in front of us and the other to our right, which was mostly visible from the tree stand. There are channels of thick woodland that frame these acreages, and we've got a perfect vantage point of multiple tree lines. The flatness also gives us that advantage in the chase. Hunters can lose track of their prey after the animal panics and bolts in whatever direction seems best. This can include up or down hillsides, through extremely thick foliage, or even off a cliff. If the shot is too far and the terrain is too treacherous to navigate quickly, the animal will escape and can't always be located. It sucks, but it's just the reality of what can happen out here. I was two or three hours in, waiting for some deer to show up. We heard a lot of different animals, from turkeys and foxes and all kinds of birds, and plenty of squirrels. Some of them even wandered by our tree stand, or even along the branches beside us. I was a city kid, so it was all quite amazing to my sheltered psyche. Eventually, at the opposite end of the acre, a small deer came out of the tree line. I had my gun ready, just in case, but my uncle signaled me to let it go. He explained to me later that it would be even an extremely hard shot for him to make. Also, the deer was still fairly small, maybe only a year old. So I just watched this cute deer munch away on the ground and wag its little tail for a few minutes. He told me it's likely his family was nearby. They would all wander into the clearing sooner or later. They might even use the yearling to push into the field as some sort of safety test. Let the little one poke around and see if anything comes after it. Again, just another harsh reality. It's run or be eaten for a lot of these critters. My uncle and I shared a smile. I was so surprised that our tree stand really worked and then, bam, out of nowhere, a bear lunges from the brush, absolutely annihilates this young deer, dead instantly. Its jaw wrapped around the neck and shoulders, totally immobilizing the deer. Claws render flesh so deep in the scramble that we can see some of the gore even from the long shot distance that we have. It pulls it back into the brush. All that motion and power took less than three seconds. I was in absolute awe. Even replaying it now in my head, I still just think to myself, what the hell? I was shocked, terrified, and excited all in the same time. My uncle, though, had the classic look of fear, probably because I was so young and he was there with him, but it was jarring regardless. He knew a bit more than I did though. He knew bears could climb trees almost faster than they could run. They liked climbing too. And we were apparently in prime country for such an encounter. The bear pulled in the deer in the underbrush and we looked down below and realized we weren't that high up. Not only are bears extremely rare in my area, but the fact that this one was huge and was patrolling around and hiding unseen and unheard of to either of us was just completely mind-boggling. I think about 30 minutes later, my uncle decided it was time for us to leave. We get down, pack up our gear, and head for the truck. He starts it up, and I'm walking around the back, taking my sweet time. I stretched and let the sun hit my face and the cool air into my lungs. I don't remember exactly why, but my eyes were just fixated in on one area, as if my brain knew it was seeing something, but I wasn't fully processing it yet. Suddenly, the mood in the air changed, and the cool air felt now dull. I actually started to sweat. I could sense something was wrong. I started to turn around and walk to the passenger door, but I couldn't take my eyes off this part of the tree line. Just before I got in, that same bear poked its head out from behind the brush. It was far away, but I could tell its mouth was covered in blood. It just stared. I closed the door and continued to look at it from the back window of the truck. My uncle noticed and looked as well. This time we were both just flat out scared. I've never seen or heard anything like that since, but it was a good lesson in understanding that you need to be alert and on your toes when in that kind of situation, 100% of the time. That bear was like a ghost, but hundreds of pounds and bloodthirsty. My dad used to fish with this traditional method of using many rods made of bamboo, placed five yards next to each other. The bait are usually live tiny frogs and it's for catching a specific cat-like predator. Anyway, it's always done at night. 
and considering the method, he had to walk back and forth on the riverbank to keep checking the fishing rods. It's not so unlike how ice fishermen practice their craft. I learned this many years later in a documentary. Ice fishermen will bore their holes in a yard or five feet apart to evenly space their baits along the bottom of a lake or river. This ensures the fish to have ample room, to snatch the food and don't find it suspicious in any way. These little guys are more clever than we give them credit for. It was when I went along on one of these fishing trips where I got a memory worth remembering for as long as I can live. I was sitting on the riverbank next to our motorcycle, munching on snacks that I brought from home. My dad was around 70 or so yards away, doing another round of checking the rods. Suddenly, I heard my dad running toward me, and I swear I've never felt or seen such terror in someone's face, especially my father. I heard his footfalls and instantly knew something was wrong. I hesitated to look up from what I was eating because I knew it had to be him, barreling right at me. What was I going to see behind him? Was he going to be hurt? Covered in blood? I didn't know what the hell to expect. He told me to hurry up and hop on the bike, telling me that we're going home. I was like, uh, what about the fishing rods? But all he did was fire up the motorcycle and speed us away. Honestly, I didn't really think much of it. I was a kid who really didn't enjoy anything in which I had to wait, and the night fishing trip was just not something I really enjoyed. So as much as I want to care, I was just happy to go home early. My dad did collect the rods in the morning, though. It was also a huge relief not to have to deal with any of it. All those fears that cropped up in my brain turned out to be nothing, and I was just content to leave it that way. As the week went on, I thought of it less and less until I really didn't care at all. But I never forgot, though. I never forgot about that weird night where Dad got spooked, though. It wasn't until six or maybe seven years later in high school when my dad asked me to join him on another fishing trip. I asked my dad what actually happened that particular night. He got shaky and weird. A look of disbelief came across his face, almost like he couldn't believe that I remembered that. According to him, basically from where he was standing that night, up ahead the river, there was a curve to the right. The water cuts away and there's this little wall of trees and brush that kind of creates this curtain along the bank. He had heard a little splashing in the water, meaning he caught a fish. When he went closer, he saw a long-haired woman in a white robe squatting next to the fishing rod with her back to him. Thinking that someone is stealing his catch, he asked her what she's doing. He announced this in a stern way, as my father is a no-nonsense type of guy. She slowly stood up, rotating her body to the left to face him, only there was nothing for what was supposed to be a face. It's not like her face is shadowed, but with the distinguished structure of eyes and such, it's blank, blank as the night, like nothing to be seen. My dad froze up and that's when she said, go home. That was when he fled. He said it was certain it was some kind of water spirit of some kind, and he was encouraging it to get back in the water and also explaining that he would leave. He said it was a ward of some protection against whatever he thought he was seeing. The only time I saw terror on his face is when he was looking for my mom and I in the bedrooms during a massive earthquake in 06. My mom and I were already outside. We saw him and thought why didn't he come outside. He was in a panic looking for us in every room. My dad was a teacher. He always had jokes up his sleeves even voted as the funniest teacher in his school years ago. But I know for sure when he's bullshitting me, and when he's being serious. He's seen and heard some weird things in his life, some of which he's told me. He said that he reacted the way he did, because a part of him wanted to get the hell out, obviously. And a part of him was too afraid that it was a bad omen or something. Something might happen to our family. But thankfully, all he lost was nothing more than a few fish. He never saw that woman again, and still fishes that same river to this day. He's probably, in fact, right there right now. I was out elk hunting with my dad. While we were glassing over one canyon, we saw a bear down at the bottom. It never gave me a shot, but 
It was the biggest black bear I've ever seen. Still not as big as a respectable grizzly, but plenty big enough to slice up yours truly here. It ambled around the canyon floor for a while, always perfectly keeping up a tree or rock between me and the shot that I needed, until it went out of sight. Well, we were obviously tempted to go after it, but ended up not doing so, looking for elk. Several hours later, we see a decent elk on the other side of the canyon, and I shot it. We start down our side of the canyon and realize that it's way steeper than we thought. My dad damn near slid right off into a pair of rattlesnakes at one point. It takes us about 10 minutes to get down, a few minutes to cross the bottom, and then another 20 to get back up to where that elk was on the other side. As we're cleaning it out, we realize it's getting pretty late, and by the time we're done and starting back towards camp, the sun is now setting. We hit the bottom of the canyon and start walking across. Then we hear something, something big walking through the bushes a little ways away. It's at this point that we realize our predicament. We are completely in the dark, in the middle of a large bear's territory, carrying almost 100 pounds of raw meat, possibly with the bear getting pretty damn close to us. We start up the other side of the canyon as fast as we can, which is not easy because it's still so damn steep. Plus, we couldn't find where we first came down, so we had to push up through brush that was taller than us. It took us almost an hour to get up. The whole time, we kept hearing something in the bushes following us along with some very bear-like breathing at some points. We hit the top and start walking as fast as we could towards camp, absolutely exhausted, still hearing whatever it was behind us while we were unable to see shit. We get to camp. My dad turned on this super bright LED lantern that we had. We were able to see that the bear was less than 50 yards away, staring at us. It followed us all the way back up to camp. He wasn't threatening, just curious. I didn't have a bear tag, so I didn't shoot it, but it definitely scared the shit out of me. We tied the meat up in a tree, keeping an eye on that bear, and stayed up for another half hour until it finally left. And at that point, we couldn't take it anymore. We crawled into the tent and crashed from sheer terror and exhaustion. We got up the next morning, looked around, and couldn't find any sign of him, other than those tracks he left where he'd seen him. We were very happy to pack up and leave after that. The next season, we had a pretty crazy story as well. Some cross-country hiker had been attacked and eaten by a bear out of the exact area that we had our encounter. It's not hard to wonder if that was that same bear that tailed us, now with more experience with stalking humans, and really got the jump on that guy. Almost, like the bear practiced its technique on us or something. It's probably not the case, but who knows. Fish and Game never found that bear, at least last I heard. I just hung a tree stand from a new tree in a new location, and I decided to hunt it that evening. It was just after Christmas, and I was getting a little stir crazy. I get there around 3.30 p.m. and sit till about 6. That's when it gets pitch black out. I then decide to climb down and head back to the cabin. As I'm climbing down, I started to hear coyotes howling and getting ready to go hunting for themselves. This isn't really a big deal coyotes are cowards, nothing but little packs of dogs. They aren't going to get close to a grown man, right? And if they do, a single boot to the head is all the encouragement they'll need to get away. You'd have to be hurt or starving for them to get to you. I start walking back for a minute or two, and that's when I hear something behind me. The only light I had was a dim little clip-on bulb attached to my hat. It was completely useless, only serving to light up the path before me. It didn't really reach out more than four feet, more a bubble to illuminate a space in front of my face. So anyway, I turned my sad little light on the trees beside me. I saw five sets of eyes watching me in the trees, probably seven to eight feet away. Well, that's not good. I remember unslinging my rifle, but realized how outgunned I really was. I'd get one round off and start to pull the bolt, and the other six would be on me. It'd be better to use it as a club, so I just strong gripped it and started backing my way through the trees, keeping my eyes on them the entire time. 
It was a pack of coyotes. They were literally stalking me. How did I know this? Because when I started backing away, the eyes lowered and started creeping slowly towards me. I managed to load my rifle. I started yelling, making noise to scare them away, but none of them ran. They just sat there, watching me. As I watched them approach, a couple of coyotes slunk off to either direction to flank me. I began backing up faster, moving my head all around, screaming, trying to keep them away. I felt phantom nips at my ankles, thought about how hard it'd be to make it back if they started with my legs and then tore out all my muscles. There's also another issue. I have this massive scope on my rifle. I couldn't see through it in the dark, so unless they came right up to me, I couldn't shoot. So instead, I just made lots of noise and continued backing away slowly until I was a good distance from the pack. Then I began running in the pitch black to get back to the cabin. Again, if they became a real threat, I could hip or shoulder fire, maybe tag them inside seven yards. I just didn't feel confident inside that outcome. They seemed set on making a meal out of my sweaty ass. I huffed another half a mile through the trees until I broke into a clearing. My truck's there, the cabin, and a humming little porch light welcoming me back. I get maybe 15 feet into the clearing. I turn back around and shoulder my rifle ready just in case they make one last ditch effort. I didn't know what to expect. All I knew is that I made it this far. They didn't come out, but I could hear them barking and yipping just beyond my sight. In the frenzy, coyotes sound like they're giggling, laughing, it's some creepy shit. It's unnerving. I stumbled into the cabin and locked up for the night. I keep a sidearm at all times in the woods now, and I know better than to fuck with the coyote. I grew up in a place called Middlesbrough, which is a large town about 150,000 in the north of England. I love the borough, as we call it, I really do. I go back a lot and see my parents and catch up with old mates, but growing up, I hated it. I remember going on a school trip down in London when I was in my last year of primary school and being amazed at how different it was. We went to see the Science and Natural History Museum and I was floored before we even walked through the doors. To me, every building in London looked like Middlesbrough Cathedral before it was demolished. We had one nice, fancy looking antique building in the borough. And then the council decided to take a wrecking ball to it. I think it might have been then I decided that London was the place for me. And the first chance I got, I moved all the way down to the bright lights and sleepless nights of the big smoke. I did a media degree. I found a decent job. Then ended up living a few different places until I settled down on a flat in Brixton. For those who don't know, Brixton is probably one of the most exciting, vibrant places in the whole country. It's a real cultural melting pot, known for its great food, great music, and great people. Don't get me wrong, there's a few bad apples in there, but they generally remain sequestered from the good ones, who manage to stay clear of that particular kind of blight. Anyway, after falling in love with the place, I jumped at the chance to get a flat there, but not long after I moved in, I discovered that I had some very unusual neighbors. Having a few weird neighbors is a given in a place like Brixton. If you think you don't have any weird neighbors, then you are the weird neighbors everyone else talks about, I promise you. But things only get weird as, say, playing weird electronic dance music on a Sunday morning. The kind that sounds like R2-D2 is having an epileptic fit. Or someone knocking on your door to ask if you want to join a socialist cross-stitch collective. It's a harmless kind of weird. What I suppose is better termed eccentric. But every so often, you end up living next to the kind of bad weird, as I did between 2012 and 2013. The first time that I noticed something wasn't quite right was in late 2012. I remember returning home from the local boozer, where I'd been watching the football with a few of my mates, when I saw a young woman and older man walking out of the block next door. We crossed paths, and I gave them both a polite smile, which, in typical London fashion, they didn't return. That's one thing I noticed about the North compared to the South. 
people tend to be a lot more casually friendly than in London, where it always feels like people are a bit suspicious of one another. That means that I wasn't all surprised that they didn't return my greeting, but what really got my attention were the young woman's eyebrows. I'd walked past both of them on a section of narrow pavement, so I'd gotten a good look at each of them as they passed. The fella had this wispy white hair and looked to me to be an Arab or Indian bloke in his 50s or maybe 60s. The woman looked like she could have been his daughter or his niece, but there was also something odd about her. She didn't have any eyebrows. I don't know if this was a medical condition or maybe she shaved them off, but in a place of dark horizontal hairs, there were just two badly drawn lines above her eyes. After I noticed, I tried my best not to stare or anything, then just walked past them and into my building. I think that was the first time I'd seen anyone from that block up close before. The first time I ever noticed anything amiss with any of them. And I know something like shaven eyebrows is odd, but it didn't seem like that much of a red flag at the time. Some people are just a bit weird, aren't they? And if I freak out and start spying on neighbors anytime one of them starts acting a bit odd, I'd have a bit of a running miniature version of the CIA out of my living room. The girl with no eyebrows stayed on my mind, and I told the story to a few mates with this kind of horror comedy tone to it. But if I'd known what was actually going on in that block of flats, I don't think I would have been laughing. The next thing happened when I was on my way home from work. I was maybe only a minute or two away from my flat. There was a woman walking in front of me with two heavy bags from shopping. I'd never seen her before, and I was correct in assuming she was a local resident. But then as we were walking, something very strange happened. Both of the bags she was carrying were each stuffed with food. So much so that as she was walking, something dropped out of one of the bags without her noticing. I was just a few steps away from my block of flats at that point, so I rushed forward, grabbed what I distinctly remember was a three-pack of bell peppers, and then called out to inform her that she dropped something. She stopped, turned to look at me, then instead of turning back to collect her wayward peppers, she just kept on walking at a faster pace. At first, I honestly thought she'd misheard me or misunderstood me, so I called out to her again, making it clearer that I was only trying to return something that she dropped. She didn't look at me. She didn't talk to me. She just kept on walking, then turned into the neighboring block of flats that the girl with no eyebrows had emerged from. I stood there with this woman's peppers thinking, what the bloody hell is wrong with people in that block of flats? I didn't know what else to do, so I just left the peppers on their doorsteps in hopes she might realize what happened and then entered my own block and walked up to my own flat. Just like the girl with no eyebrows, I found the encounter strange but not frightening. I understand it might be a bit intimidating if a man starts calling out to a stranger in the street like that. Maybe she thought I'd snatched it out of her bag and was, I don't know, taunting her with it. I tried to rationalize it because I couldn't quite possibly conceive of what was going on in that neighboring block of flats, but as I think you'll soon understand, I could have taken a thousand guesses and still never even been close to what was actually going on. The next event took place when I was alone in my flat on a rainy Tuesday night and I heard what I thought were police radios coming from the hallway outside. I'm not sure if I just watched too many episodes of 24 hours in police custody, but I heard the distinct buzz of their radios, and I just knew it was the police, but then, when I heard them knocking on the door of the flat opposite me, I knew something juicy was going on. I don't mean to make the sound like I'm some massive gossip, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. If the police were there, something serious had happened, and I felt it was in my best interest to know what that thing was. And so, I crept up to my front door, peered out of the little peephole, and tried to get an idea of what was going on. My neighbor answered her door right away, and I could tell she wasn't in any distress. She welcomed the two policemen inside her flat and closed the door, meaning I was no longer knowing what the situation was. I went back into the kitchen and then kept quiet as I made a cup of tea. Then once I heard her door open again, I nipped back to the door to earwig again. That's when I heard her mention something about a disturbance in the building next to us, the same building all those people lived in. We have a culture of minding our own business in the UK, and that rule especially applies in London. But having pieced it all together that something wasn't quite right about the people living in the block next to us, I decided to do a little bit of snooping. 
Once the police had left, I went over to my neighbor's flat, the one in my building the police had just visited, not the one next to us where the weirdos were living. I knocked on the door and introduced myself, then asked if she didn't mind telling me why the police had just been round. She invited me in, then grew quite anxious as she explained what happened. Apparently, she'd been hearing the odd banging sound coming from the flats next door for quite some time, but hadn't wanted to make a fuss about it until she heard screaming. When she heard screaming, I thought she meant like a domestic argument or something out of that nature. You know, man shouts at a woman, woman shouts back at the man. Maybe man slams the door or woman throws a vase. But she didn't mean shouting, she meant screaming. My neighbor said she only thought to call the police because it sounded like there was an actual murder taking place in the room next over. And what's worse is that the police had already called at the block next door, only to find that no one would open their doors to them. She pointed that out, and by the time the police arrived, it had gone completely quiet next door. And we both agreed that that meant either whatever had caused the screaming had stopped, or the person screaming was no longer able to. It made for a grim thought. Some kind of domestic abuse was occurring right under our noses, and there was little to nothing we could do about it. But the reality was much, much worse. A few more months go by. Summer creeps into autumn. I didn't see hide or hair of any of those weirdos next door. I kept up with my neighbor too, the nice girl I mentioned, and she reassured me that she hadn't heard any screaming since that evening. She'd heard other things, sometimes quite frightening things, but no screaming. When I asked her about the other things, she said, singing, but then corrected herself. It didn't sound like singing, so much as it sounded like chanting. If it wasn't obvious that something was very, very wrong with the people in that block, the chanting thing would have sealed the deal for anyone. I asked my neighbor if she was sure it wasn't just someone with a terrible voice, singing in the shower or what have you, but she was quite sure. It was multiple people. It was monotone and it went on for an uncomfortably long periods before finally subsiding. I asked her how she was dealing with it, and she told me she was actually considering moving out. She was sick of the stress, sick of people phoning the police only to have them do nothing about it. So imagine how I felt when one day, I came home to find two police officers stood outside my block, almost like they were guarding it. As I tried to get into my block, one of the policemen stopped me and asked me if I was a resident. When I said yes, he asked if I had the time to answer a few questions. I told him sure, gave him my flat number, and then about 20 minutes later, I got a knock at my door. It was two detectives from the Met, and when I asked what the issue was, they told me they couldn't reveal details of their investigation. They didn't have to though, their questions told me almost everything that I needed to know. The first question was something like, have you ever noticed anything unusual regarding the behavior or lifestyle of the people next door? I think they were expecting an answer of just a few words, but I launched into a 10 minute spiel about the girl with no eyebrows, the woman who seemed too scared to talk to me, as well as the weird chants and screams that had my neighbor considering moving out. I told them everything that I knew. I voiced all my concerns. And as one of the detectives listened, the other scribbled down as much of what I said as possible. And once we were done, they thanked me for my time and showed themselves out. But before they left, I asked them once more if they were sure they couldn't tell me what had been happening in the block next door. I'll never, ever forget the look one of them gave me before he said something like, Between you and me, mate, you'll be reading all about this in the papers before long. He was right. Over the next few weeks, more and more details began to emerge regarding what had been happening in the block next door. And at the center of it all was a man named Comrade Bala, Aravindan Bala Christian. He'd grown up over in Singapore before moving to the UK. This was in spite of the fact that as a communist, Comrade Bala claimed to hate the UK and all it stood for. He studied at the London School of Economics, got married, and joined the local communist party, but was soon kicked out due to his views being too extreme. He then took a little core of his followers and moved them all to a house in South London. I heard there were about 30 of them to begin with, all crammed into this little house they referred to as a commune. But as Bala's rules got stricter and stricter, his views got more and more extreme, and the commune's number shrank to about 10, and somehow, the remaining 10 were 
all females. To my knowledge, that's when the abuse kicked off in earnest. And after some trouble with the police, Comrade Bala took his commune, which by that point was just him and I think five or six other women, and then moved them into flats next door to where I end up living. According to all the news stories, this was when things got really, really vile. Bala, terrified of losing his remaining followers, turned to drug-fueled brainwashing techniques in order to prevent women from leaving him. He forbid some of them from leaving the flat and would only let them do so if they were in his company. The women were also forbidden from talking to strangers, which I'd actually witnessed with my own eyes the time I tried to return that three-pack of peppers. Through the use of things like magic mushrooms, sedatives, and other mind-altering drugs, Bala managed to convince his tiny core of loyal followers that he controlled the sun, the moon, wind, and fire. And the craziest thing is, they all actually believed him. They didn't call him Comrade Bala either. They called him Jackie, which was an acronym that stood for Jehovah, Allah, Christ, and Immortal East Warren. The idea that he was all the gods combined, he had the power to monitor thoughts, control minds, and even stop people's hearts to kill them instantly. But even after reading all that, I hadn't actually landed on the sickest thing yet. Like I said, it took a while for all the details to emerge because social services had taken their time to questioning the women he'd held captive. But as the months went by, I learned something that I hadn't ever been able to get out of my head. Aravindan, Comrade Bala, Jackie, whatever you want to call him. He convinced the women he'd brainwashed that his bodily fluids, yes, you read that right, were tantamount to an elixir of life. He made them drink his urine, sometimes on a daily basis, all as part of his sick regime of humiliation and abuse. I read that five women were rescued from flats next door. The one I remember the clearest turned out to be Bala's biological daughter, only she was raised to never know who her parents actually were. I'm guessing that Bala wanted her to think that either everyone or no one was her mom and dad. And as much as that seems like some nice it takes a village style parenting, I can't imagine how damaging this was to his daughter's psyche. She never went to school, never took a trip to a dentist, and apart from the day that she was delivered by the NHS nurses, she never ever visited a doctor for any reason whatsoever. Apparently, she was taught to read and write by some of Bala's followers, but I also heard the lessons weren't exactly comprehensive. I think she was in her 30s when she was rescued, but this girl still had a great deal of difficulty in reading and signing all the documents presented to her during questioning. When I finally saw a picture of her, I recognized her instantly. She'd been the same girl with the drawn on eyebrows, and they were the exact same way in pictures that I saw. I remember that there was an Indonesian or Malaysian woman rescued too, but I can't remember her name off the top of my head. But I suppose that's partly because I remember some of the other women so much more. There was a woman named Josephine, whose dad had done something important for the British government during the war. She was the one who brought the whole thing crashing down, after Comrade Bala refused to let one of them see a doctor. I'm almost certain it was quite a serious condition, maybe even life or death but it was that which prompted Josephine to call some kind of helpline. This is what the police needed to do their actual job properly, an admission of abuse from the inside, not some neighbor, when eyewitnesses are so notoriously unreliable. Personally, I think she's the hero of the story, at least one of them, because there were others who never made it out of Comrade Bala's cult alive. There was another Southeastern Asian lady, you can Google her name, who died after Comrade Bala refused to take her to a hospital. The death was kept a total secret, and her and her family only found out she was dead after the police arrested Bala and freed the women. And then, there was also a woman named Syene Davies, who had given birth to Bala's child. After years of horrendous abuse at the hands of her child's father, she tried to escape by climbing out of a third floor bathroom window. She slipped, fell, and went into a coma, and died not long afterward. Bala never even acknowledged her death, not even once. They just went on like she never existed. This whole thing went on for 30 years. 30 years of all these women being abused and arguably murdered, and the police didn't do a single thing about it until things were way too late, and lives had already been ruined. 
but it didn't stop there. Since Comrade Bala insisted he was innocent on all charges, he obviously needed a trial. And I remember quite literally counting down the days as his trial day came up. I had this morbid curiosity to know what was going on, right under my bloody nose. I know I hadn't been there for very long in the grand scheme of things, and that the abuse had literally been going on since before I was born. But I still felt, I don't know, guilty for not having acted on those red flags that I noticed. When it came to his trial, Allah didn't disappoint. He told the jury in almost every paper reported this, so I'm willing to bet that it's true, that he made the Challenger space shuttle blow up in 1986. Their bloody jaws must have been on the floor listening to all that bollocks. I reckon they decided he was guilty right there and then. He ended up getting sent to prison for 20-something years, but in April of last year, I read that he died in prison. The papers didn't say what killed him, but I remember hoping it was very, very painful. Having seen some of these victims, not to mention the perpetrator with my own two eyes, I took a great deal of personal interest in the case. As I already mentioned, I followed the trial quite closely, and the news of Bala's death caught my eye on the day that the news was released. I still can't believe that something like that could happen, for so long, hidden in plain sight. It's not even that the police didn't try to do anything either. If I recall correctly, they raided Bala's commune on two different occasions, but what they really needed to bring the whole thing crashing down was someone on the inside to turn on the man they once considered a god. I still think about Comrade Bala and all his victims from time to time, and as horrifying as all these details are, they're not what give me the occasional sleepless nights. The truly terrifying thing to me personally is the idea that there are other Comrade Balas out there turning the lives of vulnerable people into living nightmares right under our bloody noses. I was traveling in Asia at the time. I got a tuk-tuk, which is like a rickshaw, to go to the center of the village with a young driver. As we were driving, he turned around while telling me he wasn't going to take me to the center of the village because he knew a better spot in the jungle a place he and his friends loved. Traveling anywhere, a proposition like this is always a no-no. In Asia, Russia, or the Middle East, it's a huge red flag and could end up being fatal. These daytime drivers, city guides, or whatever they claim to be, no one knows the city or the countryside better than they do. They spent their entire life in the region, and they definitely have an agenda. Letting them lead you away, off the grid, is one of the ways they get ahead. It's also how they get off. Tourists get raped in these countries, left and right, unfortunately. Not in the mainstream visitor areas, but, but if you find yourself backpacking in regions where no one speaks your language, you'll find yourself looking over your shoulder much more often. I told him no. I told him I want to go to the center of the village, and that's it. He gets angry and sped up. Well, I'm considering my chances of just jumping out. During all of this, he grabbed my arm in this tight grip, and I knew for sure no good would come from the situation. He actually did a good job of keeping me cornered, literally pinned to this piece of shit tuk-tuk. Luckily for me, I had an umbrella with me, and with my free hand, I started slamming him with it as hard as I could, until he finally stopped the vehicle. Now once he did, suddenly he offers to take me to the center of the village now, and he makes it sound like it's his idea. I can see blood running down his nose. His hair is all disheveled from the absolute blasting I gave him with that umbrella. I laughed in his face. No. I gathered up the meager belongings I had and climbed out of that little street tumbler. The driver cursed me, spat at my feet, and drove away hollering all kinds of nonsense. I didn't really think anything of it. I ended up walking three hours to the next village. I had planned on spending one more day there, but was constantly confronted by people saying that I was the girl that attacked the tuk-tuk driver, who offered me a ride. Pretty sure they were all his friends. I don't know how, but I know they were connected to that guy somehow. They were all young men. Same kind of demeanor and look and same bad attitude. They had to be fellow drivers or maybe regulars he gave rides to. Either way, they headed out for me, and after the aggression that that driver showed me, I assumed these guys might do anything. Throughout the rest of my time there, I stayed in busy areas until I was able to take a train out. It was a nightmare situation, hiding from all these people, all that time. I 
I went to university in a town that is surrounded by wine farms. I lived in an old farmhouse with my housemates, and during the summer holidays, we locked up a place for four weeks, and then would all go home. I didn't realize I'd left the light on in my room, so at night it must have looked like someone was actually home, but we weren't. This place was rural by nature, so we thought nothing of leaving small items behind or if a single bulb was left on. There was little to no outsider traffic, mostly just wealthy families and people who worked the land for the wine farms, maybe visitors every now and again. No one returned to our house for the entire four week period. When I got back after the summer, the grass all around the house had grown quite long. The afternoon of the day we arrived back, I was walking around the house to enter inside my room from the outside door, as my bedroom had a door to the inside of the house and a door to the yard as well. When I looked, I suddenly saw a man's body lying face down in the long grass outside of my house. I stood frozen for a moment. I thought maybe it was one of the guys I lived with, because who else would it be? I looked up and down, over and over again, but couldn't recognize a single detail about him. Not the clothes, not the hair, or even the skin tone. Each time I thought I placed who it was, I would start to move forward, but then pause again. This was not a person I knew. I started looking around for anything to indicate what the hell I was even looking at. There were bloody hand marks on my door, dark brown, deep red, and streaked up and down the glass and wood. It had clearly been there for some time, because there was a lot of it. You could have painted the whole door with the residue pooled at the bottom. I quickly phoned the police and the ambulance got there in a panic, but it was clear this guy had been dead for a few days. I followed the steady trail of blood to his body and looked him over again. He was a bit older, dressed plain. There were some tears in his shirt and pants. More pools of blood rested beneath his stiff corpse. Apparently, we got the full story or at least part of it. He was a farm worker who had gotten into a fight with a friend in the middle of the night, some kind of drunken altercation on the vineyard grounds. They went back and forth until the other guy pulled out a knife and stabbed him multiple times, all up and down his body. He stumbled away from the facility and then through the pasture for a mile or so until he saw the light had left on for four whole weeks. He shuffled around to a couple of the doors, knocked, tried all the handles, but no one was home. He stumbled into the yard and bled to death right outside my bedroom door. This kept me awake for many, many nights, thinking that I'd somehow contributed to the death of this man. It's still nauseating to think about all these years later. I think the lockdown affected me more than most. I'd always dreamed of being an actress. Stage, screen, TV, I didn't care. But as anyone who dreams of gracing the silver screen will tell you, breaking into the industry is not easy. I managed to land an odd job here and there, mainly extra work. But to put food on the table, I got a job waiting tables at a Greek restaurant downtown. It was an okay job. The place was family owned and they treated me like I was an adopted daughter. But then the pandemic hit, and everything changed. They tried to stay open to pick up for orders, but it wasn't enough to break even. So one day, I got a call saying they were closing indefinitely. They promised to call me when or if the place reopened. But the implications were clear. During one of the most difficult and trying times of my whole life, I'd be reliant on welfare, unless I found myself another job fast. I tried my best to find something, anything, that would keep the lights on. But for one reason or another, I fell short time and time again. As I grew increasingly isolated, I got more and more depressed, and by the time I had to consider putting my cat up for adoption, I was on the verge of a complete emotional breakdown. That's about the same time that I first heard about the Foundation. Now, the Foundation isn't this organization's real name, nor do I want to reveal my name or location. I could go into a long-winded explanation of why I want to remain anonymous, but I'd like to think that my reasoning behind that will become obvious as the story progresses. I first came across the Foundation's website after falling down a self-help rabbit hole. I'd seen a lot of pretty out there, spiritualist stuff on my digital travels, and I'd never been one for star signs or auras or any of that garbage. 
So when I came across this self-help organization that presented itself in a very logical and level-headed way, I was immediately interested. I won't bore you with all the intricate details, but the gist of it is that they offered a bunch of self-help programs in the area, such as personal, career, or family development. But what really had me interested were all the glowing reviews that they had. I'm not talking about stuff they put on their website. I'm talking about things I'd heard in various online self-help forums. The foundation seemed to always get a mention whenever the subject of a successful self-help program came up anywhere. So after checking a few of them out for myself, I decided to purchase one. I had to borrow money from my parents, and the worst part is I lied and told them I was spending it on something else. But the truth was, I sent it right to the foundation, and they quickly sent over some preliminary course outlines for me to read through. I'd like to be able to tell you that it was all a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but it wasn't. Those course outlines seemed concise, well thought out, and the video seminars were welcoming and productive. And although I'd initially fretted over my decision to send them literally hundreds of dollars, I suddenly found myself with no regrets whatsoever. The courses actually worked for me. They helped me better organize my time. They helped me motivate myself. And when I finally landed a job working from home for a small shipping company, I firmly believed I had the foundation to thank for all my success. One of my mentors then advised I get into voice acting. And after applying the same kind of discipline and work ethic, I managed to land myself in a side hustle, doing freelance voice work for, well, just about anyone who needed it. Once again, I thought I had the foundation to thank for my success. And by that time, I'd completely bought into their whole shtick, hook, line, and sinker. So much so that when I finally completed my first course, I signed up for the second in a heartbeat. It was much more expensive than the introductory course, much more expensive actually. But like I said, I'd completely bought into the message. So a few thousand dollars seemed like nothing to continue my journey. The way my mentor phrased it was, think of it as an investment. You saw return on your first and you'll see a proportional return on this one too. Upon beginning what they called a purpose program, which was supposed to affirm our vision, direction, and personal principles, I was paired up with a purpose partner. The idea was that unless absolutely necessary, we were to refrain from communicating with anyone but our purpose partner. This way we could keep each other on track without any undue outside influence that might sap our motivation and skew our direction. Looking back on it, this was the first time they fostered any kind of cult-like behavior, but the way they dressed it up, it looked like nothing more than a harmless buddy system. Everything was so subtle and innocently phrased, but the goal was to cut them off from our family and our friends so that we sank further and further into the clutches of the foundation. As far as the second investment is concerned, I didn't see the same kind of immediate return, but that's where my purpose partner came in. He was a guy we'll just call Todd, a mild-mannered father of two from the Midwest, who worked a job as a school inspector. He was a great guy, and he assured me that all we needed to do was stick with the program, continue manifesting our goals. It would pay off eventually. Only, it didn't. We came out of lockdown, Acting jobs started opening up again, but once again, I struggled to land anything and began to get very frustrated. I ended up getting in touch with my mentor, who also happened to be Todd's mentor too, and explained my situation to him. I didn't feel like the purpose program was working for me, and I asked him to recommend an alternative course. We then performed what's known as a gap assessment, which seemed fairly scientific at the time, but was probably a bunch of woo-woo, and once it was done, my mentor promised to get back with me with his recommendations. A week or so later, my mentor finally returned my calls, but when she did, she dropped the bombshell. I won't bore you with all the cult speak, but the long and short of it was, my gaps, meaning my flaws, were wider than first anticipated. If the purpose program wasn't working for me for whatever reason, that I obviously needed more extensive and comprehensive mentorship, known as the Personal Effective Levels Program. But that mentorship came at a price, and that price was $17,000.
I don't know why they picked such an odd number, but it didn't really matter. That was the first time I actually stopped and thought to myself, they don't want to help people, they just want to make money. If they really cared, why not price all the programs the same? They all took pretty much the same amount of time, so why the massive jump in price as you advance through the system? And that's not even touching all the talk of NDAs and mandatory service that would be required of those who reached out to the higher tiers. I told my mentor that I'd think it over, but I didn't really have that kind of money at present, and that I need time to get it together before I signed onto the Personal Effective Levels program. Right away, their reply became a little frostier, and I realized they weren't the kind of people who took no for an answer. It was months before I voiced my concerns to Todd, who I'd stayed in touch with following the cessation of the Purpose program. Part of me was terrified that he'd chastise me, or worse, share my doubts with our mentor, but he didn't, and to my relief, he'd been having the exact same doubts. That's when I found out that Todd had been in the program way, way longer than I had, and when I was in that hole for a few thousand dollars, Todd had handed over tens of thousands of dollars to the foundation in order to just remain part of the program. Every time it seemed like he was about to advance onto the third development tier, he was bumped back down and made to pay even more money. At first, he'd experienced similar things to me. Increased well-being, a better relationship with his spouse, and even credited the foundation for getting the raise he'd been owed for almost a decade. But just like in my case, the longer he stared at it, the more he started to see the cracks of what the foundation was offering, and how their loving, welcoming veneer dropped whenever it sounded like you couldn't pay up. A few days after our talk, we made the mutual decision to leave the foundation. If there's one thing I can thank them for, it's putting me in touch with Todd. He gave me the strength to do what needed to be done. We supported each other in cutting off all contact, and although that was a depressingly hard thing to do, we guided one another through the process with all we could. We learned not to answer any calls from unknown numbers, how to block spam emails from anyone except the most reputable of sources, and even how to mask our social media profiles so they didn't show up in any search results. But it wasn't enough, and one day, I found out just how far the foundation were willing to go. To write the whole thing out, it might take another 1,500 words, so I'll just try to keep things brief. One day, a few months back, I got a visit from two police officers. They didn't have a warrant, so I guess I could have legally refused them entry to my apartment, but I also have nothing to hide, so I let them in. They told me they wanted to take a look around to make sure everything was okay, as they'd had an anonymous call come in from someone saying they were worried about me. I had a creeping feeling that the foundation were somehow responsible, but I had no idea how. Luckily, one of the police officers shed some light on it once they'd finished looking around. Right away, they asked if I'd made any enemies recently, and when I said yes, that I actually had, they told me what their visit was all about. There hadn't been a call from a concerned relative or friend. The cops had received an email from some random email address, claiming I was, and I'm not kidding here, recording myself torturing animals, then uploading it to the internet for money. The email claimed I was doing it at home, and had been for quite some time. So once the cops seemed happy that I wasn't doing anything of the sort, it seemed fairly obvious what was actually going on. That was only the first stage of the harassment though. As crazy as it sounds, I actually got lucky because what they did to Todd was way, way worse. Recalling the phone call I had with him is an emotional experience to say the least, so excuse me if I don't share it in detail. Long story short, someone had organized a series of mass accusations against him, all from anonymous sources. But unlike me, who was mostly victimized using social media, Todd's character assassins targeted his school district with actual phone calls, all of which accused him of being a predatory pedophile. They ruined his life, not overnight. It was a slow poisoning, but they definitely did. The school board's investigation came back clean, but the court of public opinion had already convicted him. He was hounded out of his job, hounded out of the town that he lived in. His wife ended up leaving him, 
taking the kids after she finally succumbed to all the talk of no smoke without fire. Now Todd won't even answer my calls anymore. His phone rang out for a few days, but now it says it's disconnected. I'm terrified that I can barely even bring myself to say this, but I'm scared Todd might have done something to himself. Something terrible. I really hope he's just simply moved on and that he made another attempt to switch his cell phone number, maybe even change his name or leave the country. But in my darkest moments, I tell myself the worst has indeed happened. I think that's what the foundation does. They just break them down piece by piece until they go ahead and burn themselves. Todd was a much better person than I, and if they got to him, then it's only a matter of time before they get to me too. I was driving from Georgia to California to visit a friend. I didn't want to fly because I wanted to see the sights on the way. When I got to San Diego, the hotel that I booked on Expedia screamed run from the get-go, but I was exhausted and I just wanted to rest. I got my room key and checked myself in. This was really out of character for me because I usually take every precaution when I'm traveling alone. The worst stories you've ever heard are single women on the road or across the country letting their guard down for just one minute. I'm the type to avoid those situations entirely and will go out of my way to ensure nothing suspicious is going on. Not this time though, I was just too damn tired. I locked the door and because I'm always on my guard, I locked the bar and the door for that extra safety. This at least put my mind at ease. Around 4 a.m., I woke up to hear someone trying to come inside my room. They'd open up that door but couldn't get past the little bar that was locked. I quickly got up, threw clothes on, and went to the door to see what the hell was going on. I find two men outside my door, with their hand in the slit of the door yelling at me. They kept saying things like, come here pretty girl, oh a pretty face, something like that, with their grimy fingers sliding up and down the length of the frame. I can see the pressure on its hinges and that lock bar from leaning them against the door. I tried to keep an angle to where they couldn't see me. Anytime I found myself a little too far in the wrong direction, I could make eye contact with them, looking me up and down, continuing to say creepy stuff. I couldn't believe the only thing keeping me from being assaulted and murdered was this two ounce piece of steel screwed into the door. I quickly called the front desk to see what the hell was going on and their response? Oh, I didn't know you were still here. Everything went cold when I heard that. The only people that knew I was locked in this fucking room were the creeps just outside the door, trying to push their way in. Even the clerk didn't seem to care that these guys were trying to break in for God knows what reason. I was beyond furious and went to the front desk with all my stuff. I explained to the creeps outside that I was coming out and if anyone touched me, I'd fight, scream, and call the police. I told them I'd pull their eyes out if they tried anything. They got a little more serious and gave me a wide berth as I exited. I carried everything in an armload across my chest. This way I could literally drop it all and run if I needed to, and not worry about getting hung up or pulled back by a loose strap. It was all a nightmare scenario for me. So fortunately, I had a few more moves up my sleeve. By carrying that armload in front of me, it was almost like a suit of armor between myself and those weirdos. If they tried to grab me, They'd have a 50-50 chance of grabbing a fistful of random clothing, and in my right hand was my key ring, and each key protruding from between my knuckles. I wasn't kidding when I said I'd gouge their eyes out before they hurt me. The lady at the desk said I didn't even have a reservation, even though I had a paper saying I checked in, my car decal stickers for parking there, and I had a room key. All the evidence I said was in the right, but this clerk almost seemed convinced that I was running some kind of racket like I scammed my way into the room. She said that the room that I was in was rented out to the gentleman in the hallway for a month and they were only halfway through their stay. Somehow I'd been rented a room that was already occupied, which explained why both me and them had a key that seemed to work on the door. Completely flabbergasted, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. She looked up my information and said, oh, I see you didn't book with us but Expedia. We don't partner with them. 
I'm still confused as to why in the world I was given a room and then paid for it and then had issues with being in it. She refused to call her manager at 5 a.m. at that point. So I waited until they got there at 9 a.m., demanded a refund, got it, and then checked out. No matter how terrified the whole ordeal seemed, it definitely would have ended differently had I not locked the bar on the door. I might just have been a headline in the newspaper that I'd never heard of. I was an exchange student in China around the year 2000 with a fellow buddy of mine. Our hotel was on a very big six lane, brightly lit street with half of the other people being foreigners as well. At around 10 p.m., me and my mate decided to go out and find something to eat. At an intersection, we found this smallest shop, bought a snack and asked around with super limited Chinese and English and ended up finding someone who spoke English, the niece of the shop owner. She was super young but spoke very good English and said she could direct us to a very good and cheap restaurant. So we agreed and she led us down the street into the non-tourist part of the city. It was interesting how the surroundings changed after just few minutes and we were the only foreigners on the street and a lot of people were staring. The buildings became more run down and the place wasn't as brightly lit but still kind of charming. I could tell we were out of place to say the least but we put a lot of faith into a girl who looked like a kid, all for a cheap bite to eat. She continued to talk to us, ask us questions about where we were staying, how long we were staying, what our plans were. She mentioned a few times that she was studying at the university and was 21 years of age. This raised a few alarms with me, but me and my mate didn't want to be rude. We were just hungry. Still, I couldn't help but wonder why any of this was important information. I guess I was just being critical, but it seemed like oversharing and almost overcompensating for something. It made me think she was actually younger than she looked. After about 15 minutes, we arrive at a very small and somewhat charming restaurant. I don't know the proper name for this kind of shop, but at least in China, or at least the city that I visited, there were a lot of these shops in these little prefabricated houses like trailers. Each house had two smallest shops on the street level, and you could see all sorts of businesses in these. Some were bigger ones renting two adjoining ones to form a bigger shop, and you just go on from there. You could assemble any manner of commerce with these kinds of assemblies. The restaurant was in one of these half-size stores. There were just four tables, and one counter to the kitchen in the back, and one video game machine. With the help of our translator, we ordered and then she excused herself. Not gonna lie, we low-key kind of felt abandoned. I think we'd be able to find our way back, but it was clearly local territory. We didn't know what dangers could be out there, what else to look out for, and we barely spoke the language. My anxiety grew as we waited for our meal. To our credit, the food was super good and cheap. We got this massive bowl of ramen, a heaping dish of different dumplings, and several beverages for no more than 25 or 30 bucks. It was a knockout dinner to say the least, so... I felt bad for questioning our guide and doubting her intentions. So far so good, right? But what made the whole situation strange was several other factors. For one, the other guests in the restaurant looked straight out of a crime flick and they were talking about us, quite obviously, pointing and laughing. One of them had this bad knife scar on his cheek, the other broken nose, and a third one, I kid you not, had on an eye patch. He got crazier the longer he looked. They had these jagged scars along their throats too, and one guy was missing more than half of his ear. These were serious crime affiliates, and this was their local choice for dining. While we ate, we continued to see a lot of people just gawking at us, especially notice something like these gangbangers that were staring us down. They were four younger kids with matching leather jackets and short cropped hair. They were patrolling the streets at least four times while we stayed there and always looked straight at us while they passed the shop. Things were seeming to get out of hand, and there wasn't just one, but like five red flags for us to break out and run for our lives. After we ate and paid, all of a sudden out of nowhere, the 21-year-old translator turns up again, inquired if the food was good, and then offered to take us to some very good place for a lot of fun. We declined and thanked her, but said that we would just return as we were both tired. She continues to fast talk us, told us about a party, beautiful women, younger girls. 
But when we saw those same kids again, we waited, and exactly 60 seconds, then bailed out of there. Both of us had been counting how long it took them to make a lap, and then circle back. It wasn't long, and we figured a minute was long enough to get them far away in the opposite direction. She followed us, seemed very frustrated, even panicky that we left so suddenly, and tried her best to convince us to follow her. We got out of there as quickly as we could, though. In high speed mode, we made it back to that big six-lane main road and said our goodbyes to her. The whole situation was scary and just really seemed sketchy. In hindsight, there were probably just very nice people who just never seen foreigners in this part of the city, but those younger kids, the quote-unquote cliche pirate at the end of the table, and the shady way that that girl tried to goad us towards God knows what place, while overly stating that she was 21. All of this together just led me to the conclusion that we got out of there at the right time. Something was definitely amiss that night, and later on we learned that the area that we were in was infamous for sex trafficking, sex work, and all kinds of underworld crime. I swear, some places never see the light of day. Backstory really quickly, we live in apartments and we mostly know everyone. It was Thanksgiving week. I'm usually late for shit all the time and had a long road trip ahead of me to see my partner's family. Somehow, I'm actually early and we're leaving on this trip with really good timing. I load up my car. It's all packed. Pets are in and we're ready to go. Well, some girl I've never seen before comes out of nowhere looking super worried. She walks up to me and my girlfriend and tells us that she needs help. She starts crying and says it's this guy. At this point, some random old dude was walking up behind her, and we legit almost replay that scene from Spongebob where they beat up the old dude. We just kind of share this look like, are we about to do this? But we have some clarity. We really don't know what's going on here. I ask the girl what's wrong and ask her if someone is trying to hurt her. She composes herself a little bit and tells me and my girlfriend that she's worried about her ex. They had a lot of problems and it was super toxic and she cut all communication. Apparently the guy had emailed her that night before coming over and that he can change. The usual weird shit abusive people say. She wanted me to go knock on his door so that she could know that he was alright. It turns out he's my next door neighbor right down the hall. Our apartments are actually touching one another and are only separated by a thin wall. Now the dude that she's talking about is someone that I knew because he always walked his Dalmatian and our dog would play with each other. I was used to seeing this guy, so I thought it really can't be that bad to knock on his door. Still, this is Texas. People have guns, so no way in hell I'm opening any doors. I go and grab a staff member, and he tells us not to worry. It's the holidays, people party and drink and fall asleep. I tell them that this chick is kind of freaking out, and we should at least call the police or something. As we walk to the apartment, we talk to that girl again. Her story seems to be the same and legit, so I said, whatever, let's at least knock on the door. I knock on the door and hear this dog barking. I see the lights on, so someone's definitely home. My job is done here, right? But no, something just doesn't add up. His dog was barking, but not coming to the window. No one responded to the door, so maybe something is going on. The girl had permission to enter since the email said something along the lines of, please come check on me. It sounded pretty sketchy to me, but the property manager said it legally checked out and unlocked the place for her. Once again, this is Texas. No way I'm opening up the door, so I tell her I'll go in with her to check on him, but she has to open up the door just in case they start blasting or something. The manager takes several big healthy steps away from the door and the windows because he's a Texan too. He knows he just opened up a door to a total stranger. She opens up the door but begins freaking out again telling me she can't go in there. She tells me to go look because she can't. Man, I hate helping people. So I take a step in. The lights are on but there's nobody home. All the doors are open and I see the dog in the restroom. The restroom is usually where people you see dead in the tub, so I definitely didn't want to go in there. But the dog had been in a cage for who knows how long. Come to think of it, 
I had been hearing a whining dog all day long. Lots of weird loose ends were starting to come together. I've been next door to a dark, dark secret for a whole weekend at this point. So I'm preparing myself for the worst. I look in the bedroom. Nothing. I open up the door to the restroom because it was already slightly open. And all I see is a dog in a kennel, surrounded by shit because it's been there for almost two days. I see the bathtub has the curtains closed, so I say screw it and quickly pull them open. And lo and behold, it's empty. There's no one here. I have a huge sigh of relief and just say out loud to myself, thank God. Then I go open up the kennel for the dog to get out. But when I turn around, right behind the bathroom door that I just pushed open was the dude hanging there. Holy shit. This is someone I knew that I interacted with at least daily and he's now dead as hell. He wasn't even really hanging, I guess. He was kind of squatting down with his neck tied to the door. His eyes were gruesomely popping out of his skull, looking right at me. The string or whatever he was using around his throat was cutting in so deep that I could see veins bursting just under the skin. This has all fucked me up because I guess I let my guard down, so it was really extra shocking. It went from, ah, everything's okay, to shit completely hitting the fan. At this point, I walk out with the dog. I look at the girl and just shake my head. The girl runs in to see and has another huge breakdown, which is completely understandable. This next part is a blur for me, but I remember telling my girlfriend not to come in. I pull my belt off and use it as a makeshift leash for the dog and just walk the dog around the complex. My first reaction was just to walk the dog. I didn't know what else to do. I felt like a crazy person out there. I go back and the girl in the apartment staff had called 911. The dispatcher told the girl to try and resuscitate the guy, but come on, there's no way. That dude was gone. That poor girl had to cut him down and then try to bring his cold, dead body back to life. Her screams are still nightmare fuel to this day. We told her not to, but in her state of shock, she was just following orders. The guy had been dead for at least a whole day. If you've made it this far, nice. I'm happy to share my crazy Thanksgiving story with you. For a couple of months, any commotion would sort of put me in a panic state. Thankfully, I'm better now. I can look back at this and count it as just a crazy story before we traveled across the country. Something also worth mentioning. Something weird had happened the night before. I was standing in my room and I felt someone shove me forward. I turned around expecting to see my girlfriend, but she was in the kitchen. Legit asked her if she had just pushed me, and she looked at me like I was crazy. I really don't believe in stuff like this, but maybe it's just a weird coincidence. I don't know. Back a few years ago, I planned a big solo excursion in the backcountry of Alaska. It was going to be a long weekend of camping and fishing throughout different areas my family had suggested. My dad had been born and raised in a small town outside of Anchorage and grew up hunting and backpacking across the entire state for most of his youth. Growing up, hearing all the incredible stories, it seemed natural to plan a trip of my own to go back out and see everything that my dad talked about. It was a pretty bare bones trip. I'm an accomplished outdoorsman, but I knew better than to take the Alaskan bush for granted. I didn't take a plane into the isolated deep country or even hike off the grid that far. I chose instead to stick to some known recreational areas for campers and fishermen. I took some back roads to create a little distance between myself and others, but it was still within a mile or two of the next camp. I found a nice inlet along a river that my dad told me was a supreme fishing location. I guess something had changed over the last 30 years because I didn't even get a bite the entire first day. There wasn't anyone around, but I could see some evidence of through traffic, maybe even some local riffraff. There was bottle caps, scraps of plastic, nothing major, but enough to tell me that people had been there. I tracked upstream for a couple of miles, found deep pools that I could actually see fish in. Still, didn't get a single bite. I changed my fly setup, and still nothing. I was starting to think I was doing something wrong when I watched all the fish go totally bananas and then blitz in every direction. 
I thought this was kind of weird because when fish panic, they usually all go in the same direction, at least when they initially break. Shadows or objects that pass over the water will pass in one direction, so the fish will naturally swim away from whatever it is that spooked them. That's not what I watched though. I could see them all free floating against the water, choked up at the back of a pool, just waiting for food to drift downstream to them. The next second they were swimming both up and downstream, some even jumping straight up out of the water. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen a school of fish do, like they had been hit with an electric collar or something. I just chalked it up to bad luck and continued to move upstream. I had some luck before the end of the day and pulled a few out for dinner. As I moved upstream, the woodland around me opened up into this rolling meadow where the water had more room to spread out creating fingers of water that flowed in multiple directions. I spent some time here checking my equipment, fishing the pools, and just generally enjoying the view. The sun poked out over the cloud cover and burned some of the chill off. There's this weird buzzing noise. I heard it when I first entered the clearing, but it went away pretty quickly, so I just figured my ears were buzzing or something. I would hear it periodically throughout the next hour that I was in that clearing, but just for a moment, and then it would cut out again. I looked over the terrain, thought maybe there could be someone with a quad or a dirt bike somewhere further in the valley. It was so quiet that I was certain it had to be at least five or six miles away. Whatever the case was, I ended up losing interest as the day went on. There's only so much daylight to do your thing out there, so after I secured my fish, I took some light hiking for the rest of the afternoon climbed some mild slopes, snagged some gorgeous photos, and slowly made my way back down the river and toward my camp. All day long, I didn't see or hear anybody, short of that buzzing sound. As I made my way back down the river gorge, I thought I spotted someone along the far bank, slinking behind the tree line. I came to a full stop and waited for them to reemerge. I was camping in a place totally foreign to me, so being friendly just made sense. I wanted to touch base about the river and any potential hot spots for fishing, especially since I was going to be here for the next couple of days. No one came out though. I looked back and forth, even took a few steps backward just to get a better view of the thicket. I started to feel a little weird. I was certain of what I just saw. Why would they hide from me? I shouted hello, but got no response. With a whole new resolve, I started bucking back to camp in a quickness. I kept looking over my shoulder for another mile, but didn't see anyone. I started to play out more realistic scenarios inside my head. Maybe I didn't see anyone at all. It was more likely just some shadows or branches, maybe even leaves playing tricks on me. Could have even been a small animal coming to check me out. There was a bend in the river ahead, so I took the time to bury myself in some of the foliage and just scan the trail behind me. Sure enough, I spot that same guy, creeping maybe a quarter mile behind me. He's moving very deliberately, not trying to disrupt the bush or make any discernible sounds. It was almost a trip just to watch him in his element, not knowing that I could see him. After a few more minutes, he looked up, saw me, waved, and then disappeared into the trees. What the hell? The whole thing was weird, but the strangest part was he looked paramilitary, especially from far away, like a tactical vest and a chest rig. Maybe he was a photographer or something, I don't know. Maybe that would explain all the pockets. It would also explain why he's being so quiet. Whatever the case, I kept my pace up and left this guy in the dust. The rest of the afternoon and evening drift by as carefree as the smoke from my campfire. I cleaned the fish, stuffed them full of garlic and butter, and had an exceptional dinner under the stars. I picked my teeth with one of the bones from a bigger fish and soaked in the essence of it all. I matched my father camp nearby, years past, and had a similar evening. It was cool to be going through the same motions in the same area as my father. I got tired early like I normally do, so I secured my campsite and tucked into the tent for the night. I had a nice roaring fire throughout the night and a canvas tent big enough for me to stand in over between a couple of trees. I listened to the crackle of the fire and dozed off as the firelight faded. 
Next thing I know, I'm wide awake, but I don't know why. Something is off, triggering my sense of awareness, even with my eyes closed. That's when it hit me. I can see light coming through my eyelids. My first thought is that guy by the river earlier. He's shining a flashlight through the opening of my tent. My eyes fly open to find nothing of the sort, though. I'm totally alone and my tent is still zipped, and I can even see the fading glow of the coal bed from my fire pit. And by that I can judge it to be about midnight, maybe one in the morning. There's something else. A light. A little bit away from my tent, maybe 15 feet off in the trees. I listen for any sound, but there's nothing. No engine or footsteps. The road actually intersected with my campsite going the opposite direction, though there wasn't even a place for a vehicle to be over there. There was one other factor. The light seemed to be coming down from straight out of the sky. A single solid pillar just shooting vertically about 40 feet or so. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and for a few minutes, I was certain that I was dreaming. What the hell else could this be? Aliens? I doubt it. Then it disappears. All the tracings of light fade to black and that side of my tent is illuminated no longer. I'm pretty seasoned here out in the wilderness so I carry a gun every time I find myself out there. Since I was going to Alaska for the first time, I packed a Smith & Wesson 10mm because of the variety of predators. It's a no joke caliber and I kept it under my sleeping cot. The second I grabbed it, the light from the sky reappeared, this time right about my campsite. It was a solid column of light, maybe 20 feet in diameter, and a rich white from end to end. I froze. Even with that gun, I realized how powerless I was. I didn't know what to think, so I jumped out of my sleeping bag and just started getting dressed. I pulled my boots on, jammed my pistol into my waistband. I slowly unzipped the tent and peeked out with one eye. The light was so blinding that I couldn't see shit even if I looked up but I could still see my truck and campsite plain as day. Whatever it was, was totally silent and as still as a surgeon. The light source never wavered as it free floated above me. Then I heard it again, that same buzzing. It was closer this time, but it was a dead ringer. Before I could do anything with that information, that light quickly went out again. I didn't waste any time. I yanked my jacket on, laced my boots, and made for the tree line in a dead sprint. My camp was in a bit of a clearing, but real woodland was just a stone's throw away. Thicker trees would provide much better cover from whatever it was above me. I crashed into the thicket, but didn't pause to correct myself. The branches messed me up from head to toe. It was much less of a threat than light in the sky. I pushed through the first curtain of branches, and my faces and hand are covered in scratches. I could see a hill to my left, and what looks like a rock outcrop straight in front of me. I didn't have a flashlight and had no interest in breaking my ankle out there, so I elected to stumble up on the hillside. Rocks in the dark was too much of a gamble, especially with how fast I was moving. I got nearly halfway up and found a big oak with thick branches, albeit totally dead amongst the other trees. It just seemed like the easiest one to climb, and I still had to cover from the other tree's shoulder up to it. I reached up and pulled myself into the scraggly gray boughs kept climbing until I was at least 15 feet in the air. As I'm climbing up, that same pillar of light comes to life above my campsite again. From my vantage point, I can see some of my camp and a portion of my truck, as well as the unzipped flap of my tent. The light hovers, and I can see that it's coming out of a single point of origin, but it's so dark I can't see what it is. Then it starts to move, following the way that I ran into the trees. As it cuts over the treetops along the path I made, the light goes off again. Now I'm up in the tree and I can really hear it whining and not just buzzing. At this point, I'm treed. I'm out of options. So I pull out my pistol and just wait. I dump every bullet into that thing if it hit me with that spotlight. It comes on again a few minutes later, down at the base of the hill where I forked off from the main path. It stays there for a long time and the longest of the night. After maybe 10 minutes, it shuts off and then starts doing laps of the forest. I could actually hear it buzz by me a couple of times, just above the oak that I was in. I hope that by getting off the ground and up into a tree, 
maybe whatever this was wouldn't be able to see me. It seemed like I was right. The rest of the night went by as you can imagine, white knuckling my pistol and just listening, watching the light periodically turn on and off. I then heard someone shout, and it was the same hello that I shouted towards the river earlier. It wasn't in my voice, obviously, but just a single call. It was almost like someone was taunting me. I climbed a little higher into the tree and hunkered down the rest of the night. By dawn, I hadn't seen or heard from it in some time, close to an hour maybe. I scampered down the second I saw the sky change color and booked it to my camp, and then dove back into my sleeping roll. I was freezing my ass off from being outdoors all night, and all I wanted to do was sleep. Nothing came to bother me the rest of the trip. I made contact with one of the families camping down the road. They told me they hadn't seen any kind of light like I explained. They did hear the buzzing, however. Said it would come and go sometimes in the afternoon. Very weird, but nothing close to an answer that I was looking for. The end of the trip came. I went back home. I told my father about it, and he was totally perplexed. Really had no idea what to make of it all. He thought it sounded like a military operation, but neither of us could imagine why they would come to bother a solo camper, someone who's probably got a gun or two. The whole thing was beyond weird, and I didn't know who to ask for a lead. Years later, I spoke to a guy who had a similar experience. He was camping in the Four Corners area in a little pocket of forest, when his campsite was lit up the same way mine was. He didn't flee from his camp like I did, though. He just waited it out until it went away. He went to the forest ranger service the next day, told them what he saw, and they explained that there is illegal growing operations in the area, and local law enforcement were using drones to spot the farms at night to dial in the location so they could raid them. They apologized and said the operator must have mistaken my camp as being related to the grow op. We compared notes, and almost everything was the same. The buzzing, the silence, the overwhelming light. The way it floated like a phantom from place to place. I don't know who would have had a drone out there, inside the Alaskan wilderness in the late 90s. But they scared the hell out of me. What I really wish I knew was if it was a civilian or government program. And I wonder if they have any photos of me from that night. In Anchorage, there's a house on the 11th Avenue near downtown that has this big multi-level deck and a hot tub on the top level, so you can have a view while hot tubbing. You can see this hot tub from the street as you drive past. It was kind of a dub there for a while. It has been since removed, at least last I saw. Back in the day, it was a real ritzy spot. All the locals will tell you about it. Lots of people passing through town and would ask about it, because it looked like a celebrity lived there or something. This house used to be where oil corporation bigwigs and politicians would hang out. It was almost like a private club for the seriously rich and influential living here in Anchorage. Your average working class folks, however, never saw the inside. It was a party house, clearly, but many of us didn't know how nefarious it actually was. The rumor started as any other. They gambled up there, drank and did drugs, probably held a card game, probably kept hookers and showgirls and definitely plan the future of our great state. The truth, however, was much worse than that. The house on 11th Avenue started exactly how the community guessed, but it devolved into a sex trafficking blackmail ring that would rival the stories we see on the headlines today. There was a big corporation here called Vico. It was a leader in metal manufacturing. The guys that ran this company got too big for their britches and started living a pretty lavish lifestyle. They got involved with the local cocaine scene and started brushing elbows with politicians and their dealers. Over time, these guys, from what I've been told, just couldn't be satisfied by anything. There was never enough drugs or alcohol, never enough women. The whole North Slope became fueled by cocaine, and the guys that ran this region of resources inadvertently started an underage sex trafficking ring. Between the head honchos at Vico and their slimeball drug dealers, They'd get these young girls highly addicted to coke, then bring them into the house on 11th Avenue, and that's where they lived after that. They were a fixture that people could use and abuse, and no one knew they were in there. 
and these girls, as long as they could get high, had no intentions of leaving. Vico started going bankrupt in the early 2000s and was acquired by a company called CH2M Hill, which I believe was based out of Colorado. Around the same time, girls started coming out against politicians and captains of business in Anchorage area with absolutely wild stories, kidnap, rape, hostage type situations, everything you'd expect from sex trafficking. As time went on, more and more girls came forward and some of them got more serious and wanted to go to the press, put their allegations in print and start building a case. Every single one of these women over the last 20 years has either been intimidated into silence or outright disappeared, was never seen again. Basically, the people that ran the cocaine-fueled North Slope in the 80s ended up starting a child sex trafficking ring for the purpose of serving politicians and other elites of Alaska and the oil industry. They would get these young girls addicted to cocaine, then traffic them for sex. It was all covered up by the police and local politicians, as very little of this ever saw the light of day. Whereas I'm not quite old enough to have memories of this, my uncle was a cocaine kingpin in the 80s throughout the Anchorage area. He didn't serve these people, but was involved with a lot of their dealers, so never really made anything he knew public for fear of being guilty by association. We both think it got covered up so effectively, not just because of all the police, but the people who wrote the checks for their budget were caught up in the house on 11th Avenue, but also because of the business buyout that was going on between Vico and CH2M Hill. Whether it was Vico securing its image to guarantee the sale, or Hill stepping in to eliminate loose ends to ensure their purchase wasn't bunk. Either way, the amount of power a corporation can have over a community is downright terrifying. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we do required us to travel far out into the Alaskan Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds and hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet. When I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half. Polar nights are intense. This particular well site that we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were heading back to camp to finish our hitch and then go home. At the beginning and end of those ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. There's no cell reception or radios only work up to a distance. If you don't check in or out at a set time, they come looking for you to ensure that you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it really mattered in the land of endless night. We were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour when something appeared in the road in our headlights. It was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m. It was maybe negative 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us at our tracks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. Didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed that he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled my window down and asked if he needed any help, asking if he was okay. He didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotion. Some of the other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and is in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming right off of him. He smelled acidic, if that makes any sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made my hair stand on my neck. 
The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later told me that he was just going to try to shake him out of this stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at me and my buddy with this look of pure rage and not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and then launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy, trying to keep him inside. After several moments, and it could have only been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to that guard shack, another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards, reported what we'd seen. The guard was definitely looking at us like we were pulling some kind of prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore, and when he pulled back his sleeve, there was a noticeable bruise in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard, and then were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened. It was a quiet drive the rest of the way, and we flew home the next following day. The next time we saw that guard at his shack, we asked him if he ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrol. He told us that they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12-hour shift, saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank. He'd definitely be getting us back for making him waste an entire shift driving around. It wasn't a prank though. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder today about that dude, if it even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place. And that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. Years ago, a couple of friends and I were out squirrel hunting in a creek bottom. We were on this big wilderness camping expedition and had set up some tents after Saturday morning's hunt. The day wore on into later afternoon. The clouds built up and we could hear some thunder muttering, getting closer and closer. Quickly, we grabbed a big tarp out of the back of my pickup, strung it up between the tents, having to repitch one of the tent to get it undercover. Once a year, we get the boys together for a big outdoor trip that would last about a week. This required us to keep a campsite that could support us for the duration of that time. No washouts, no wood shortage, nothing to cause consistent problems, if it could be avoided. It's hard to describe how the camp looked. We had two tents facing one another. Big old style wall tents with the external poles. The big heavy tarps was strung up, supported by cut saplings partially covered by both tents. We had the tarp pretty well staked down with the white nylon line, what we called trot line staging. The fire pit we dug out at the edge of the tarp, overhung so the smoke would clear it. With the storm coming, there was gonna be no more hunting at least for now. So we got the fire going, got a pot of coffee brewing, and something sweet cooking. I don't remember exactly what, but was bubbling on the side of the fire. We built a fancy multi-layered spit that had four squirrels beginning to roast. One of my buddies was squatting down, turning them. All of us would have a shift rotating the spit until they were finished. The storm had been teasing, but now it finally hit. Lashing rain, thunder and lightning like crazy. We are snug and comfy and all congratulating one another on how cool we are, camped out in the woods in a storm. No one had a pistol, we just had three shotguns. Mine was an 870 pump, and I remember mine was leaning up against one of the many saplings holding up our tarp. We weren't too concerned about camp intruders. The rain was going to keep most of the predators bedded down for the night. It was torrential, 
the kind of rain you can't even see in. Between that and the firelight, no bears or wolves will be messing with us. Even then, we just spray them with our 12 gauges and then call it a night. We brought out lawn chairs for the big camp out. The old style, as was back around 1979. Two of us were sitting in ours, watching the third guy turn squirrels and tend to the coffee. Suddenly, and I mean so fast we didn't even see it happen, a man just stepped under our tarp and stood there, with a rifle held in both arms across his body. He'd walked up one side of my tent and was just stepping under the tarp. Instant shock and pandemonium ensued. I reared back and collapsed my chair, trying to get the hell away from this guy. I'm scrambling for the shotgun. One buddy literally fell into the fire that he was tending to because it shocked him that bad. Burned his hands and his face a bit, but his jacket took the brunt of the heat, thankfully. If he'd gotten severely burned, there's no way we'd be able to get him out of the woods and then into a hospital, not with a storm in the mud. Our other friend just jumped up and ran full tilt into his tent, knocking it all askew. He later told me he thought he brought a pistol and he was rooting around in his duffel bag, but came up empty handed. The guy that stepped underneath the tarp starts yelling something like, Whoa, 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 whoa. I get myself detangled from the chair and jumped up to my feet. I mean, we're dead meat. There's a guy with a gun right here. He's not brandishing it though. He has this bolt pulled back and he's still holding it across his chest. He's attempting to wave his own white flag of some kind. We quit hollering over one another and let the stillness creep over us. Let everyone show no sign of making a move. Even the friend in the tent poked his head out to get a look. It was a true standoff and the only one I've ever been in. If he'd been carrying that rifle in any other way though, I think we would have killed him out of fear. Potential life sentence type of mistake. After things calmed down a bit, it turned out this guy was just totally lost. He was already lost when the storm hit and was now just wandering around in the heavy rain. Smelled smoke from the fire and the squirrel cooking. Followed it right to our camp. His rifle was a bolt action 22 with the magazine. He was just some daytime hiker messing around in the forest when trouble hit. He was harmless, but the whole situation and the guy itself just gave me the creeps. He had this ear to ear grin that seemed almost impossibly wide, almost like special effects or something. I could hardly look this guy in the face because it just weirded me out that much. I don't know if the firelight cast weird shadows on his face or what, but I was the only one who seemed to notice it. It didn't seem like he blinked much either, even with water dripping in his eyes. When the man saw how bad he had just scared all of us, he apologized profusely. We wound up loading up the guy in my truck and taking him out to the pavement and up to the pipeline where his car was parked, only about a half a mile on relatively flat land. It was an easy drive, so I risked it just to get him out of camp. The guy was totally unthreatening, but he should have called out before ducking under the tarp and maybe acted normal once he did. Scared us all half to death. I was in Juneau, Alaska once traveling on business. After work, I decided to drive north out of town. I was almost stopping randomly at different beaches. I stopped at one was having a great time on the beach just by myself, watching the birds fishing and looking at the tidal pools. A truck pulled up in the parking lot above me, and I didn't think much of it the first time. The truck then spun a Brody and then left and then heading north. I spent a lot of time at these remote trailheads, and you see all kinds of riffraff, local kids smoking pot, others hooking up, all kinds of manner of reckless driving, burnouts, Brodies, whatever the parking lot will accommodate. These trailheads are typically local to some rural communities where there really isn't much to do. So that little extra stretch of pavement becomes its own form of recreation. I wandered further down the beach. A few minutes later, that truck comes back. It parked at the overlook for a bit. The beach was probably 50 feet lower in elevation than the parking lot, and there was a bluff. They just sat there. Then they peeled out again, heading off to the south. I was a bit creeped out now. And this time, I start making my way back to the trail to get back to my car. I was wearing dark clothing, so I clung to the tree lines a bit for cover. I tried keeping little foliage between myself and whatever line of sight they might have. 
Right about then, that truck comes back a third time. It parked with its headlights shining right towards me. As it was getting to be dusk, I just sat there. Then, for a third time, it peeled out once more, but this time I could hear that it stopped, right where my car was parked. I heard the engine shut off, and right then, every instinct in me told me to hide. I left the beach and went straight into the woods, somewhat up the hill. Juno has these big trees, and I found one that had been knocked down. I laid down on the far side of it. If they had a flashlight, they'd spot me in a second. Fortunately, my cell phone had really poor connection, and I wasn't armed. I didn't carry any weapons when I traveled by airplane. All the odds felt stacked against me in that moment. I was scared shitless at this point. And then I heard a slam, slam. I knew that there was at least two people. They had waited a while, I guess to maybe see if I was coming back up the trail. Now, they were starting down the trail. One of the men appeared to have this long object in his hand. I think it was a rifle, but in the fading light, it might have been a bat or something else. He was calling out as well. Hello? Where are you? All of a sudden, I felt very much like I stepped into the most dangerous game. I remained hidden, a heart beating wildly. I waited until the men were well down onto the beach, and then began climbing the hill up into the woods where I knew the parking lot to be. I tried not to make noise, but that was impossible. There were dried leaves and deadfall all over. I was making a hell of a lot of racket. Fortunately for me, I don't think they heard me. I got up to my car, and the truck freaked me out. It was fully tinted. There was no way to tell if anyone was inside the vehicle at the time. I started my car and tore out of there. I've hiked alone all my life and been in far more remote places than this, but was never before or since had that same feeling that I was in some kind of grave danger. To this day, I don't feel like I overreacted, and I'm 100% positive that those men had something bad in store. I had, they caught me. It was my second time hunting ever with my dad and two of his buddies. We were in southeast Alaska on an island. We had set up camp in the middle of a medium-sized cove that was shaped in a U. The shore was surrounded by a similar shaped mountain range as you went further inland. We had planned to stay for four days to deer hunt. And on the first and second days, my dad and I climbed up a few hundred feet to several spots with absolutely no luck in finding anything but meandering old growth. In the evening of the second day, our group spotted a wolf emerging from the tree line across from the cove. It laid down on the shore, and after a few moments, another larger wolf came out and accompanied to what assumed to be his mate. They laid next to that first wolf, and then that first wolf moved a few yards away from them. Thus, we inferred that the largest wolf was the pack's alpha male. This was the first we'd seen or heard of them in our area, at least on this trip. On the morning of the third day, it was made obvious why we couldn't find any deer. The wolves were hunting as well. We didn't see any sign of them because they weren't leaving any scent or tracks. They were bringing down all deer in the still off hours, which kept the herds hyper vigilant. One night though, they did start howling aggressively. It kept up throughout the entire rest of the trip. Now, while movies and other media imply the wolves just howl randomly, and or that you can always hear a single loud howl. That's not accurate at all. These wolves were howling with a purpose, to scare the deer around the cove and then to corner them. The pack started howling right at the tip of the cove, their dissonant tones echoing over miles and miles and began moving their way around and toward us. My dad and I went up once again since there was nothing else to do. This time, we were a few hundred feet up. We heard the wolves howling again but there was one howl louder than the rest, and closer than the rest. We stopped below a fallen tree trunk to listen, and we heard the howl get closer and closer. I was carrying a bolt-action rifle. My dad told me to load around. He pulled out a handgun and racked it as well, loudly, to try to scare off that wolf. The howling draws closer up, above us, and a few minutes later, I'm looking up the slope of a mountain, through that old growth, I see an animal moving. 
With its nose sniffing on the ground, the alpha wolf was not but 30 yards from us, following the scent of another animal. It had to have known that we were there by scent, sound, and sight, but for some reason just chose to ignore us. Needless to say, we didn't find any deer on that trip. I was janitor at University of Alaska Fairbanks for over five years while I was going to school. This is a little known fact, but many, many people, both students and faculty, believe that the campus is totally haunted. Everyone has different reasons, from the creepy old legends about the ground it's built on, the rumors about the people that built it, then just the good old fashioned people dying on campus over the years. Whatever the reasoning, it's pretty typical conversation to overhear about lights flickering, weird noises, etc. People just have weird experiences here and just chalk it up to the paranormal. There was one guy who didn't hear any stories, was brand new, simply didn't believe in ghosts or anything of the like. He got put on theater duty one night. This is a long shift, wherein the janitor or janitors are isolated to one building from anywhere to four to six hours, or however long it takes to clean the entire facility, swap the trashes, all that stuff. There's a second building behind the theater that's also part of that same duty. I forget the name of the building, but it's tucked between engineering building and the library. He quit that night on the spot during his shift. I was supervising a team at the time. He called me all frantic and panicked, saying he couldn't finish the building and was quitting immediately, and that I needed to come down and get the keys right now. In the back of my head, I kind of knew what this was all about because I've seen and heard a few things myself while cleaning inside that theater. I heard a few stories after I asked around, but me personally, I just really didn't care. The noises and the locked and unlocked doors and apparitions didn't stop me from having to pay my bills, so I tried to ignore it the best I could and continue to do my job. So anyways, I go to get the keys from him. He's white as a damn ghost himself, beads of sweat dripping down his face, shaking from head to toe talking about seeing some human figure drift across the stage. I didn't really know what to say to him, so I kind of just said, yeah, that that sometimes happens, man. It's, it's just noises, though. Sometimes it's the lights, sometimes it's the doors. You just get used to it all. He took off so fast and didn't stick around and talk to the boss. The boss ended up actually thinking I scared him off. He was a bit of a no-nonsense kind of guy, even though he's the one who initially told me about the ghostly encounters. And it turned out, Someone actually hung themselves there on that stage, and I didn't find out until years later. It was the winter of 97, I believe, and I was living in Alaska, serving in the National Guard as an 11 Bravo infantryman. I loved it. As some of you may know, a joint task force between all branches of the military began working on building a road on an island nearby, Annette Island. The Marines spent the summer building the HQ. It was a series of plywood huts and the framework of a mess hall. When summer ended, the huts were just basically sheds. There was no electricity or running water. Me and five other members of my unit were called to active duty. We were tasked with living on the island for the winter, protecting the camp. Apparently, the local native youth would hop from island to island, vandalizing vacant logging camps and such. This was classified as a training mission for budget purposes. It seemed like it would be a good time. Six months in the winter on a remote island living in a plywood hut. At first, things were somewhat rocky. There was only going to be four to five of us on an island at a time, with a weekend rotation every two or three weeks, for one or two of us. It took a couple of months before we had a real generator or propane to cook with, so we subsisted on MREs, three meals a day, for quite some time. The worst was that there was only one outhouse in the entire camp, which was placed a few hundred yards away from our camp. To make it even worse, the higher-ups, for whatever reason, declared the ground sacred. We are not allowed to relieve ourselves on it. This means if we needed to take a piss or drop the kids off at the pool, we had to march down to the outhouse in the Alaskan winter. For the most part, I was loving it. We bonded together, told jokes, played push-up poker, 
and overall just had a grand time roughing it. To make a longer story longer, the heart of the winter came, and so did the snow. Lots of it. By that time, we had these weird heaters that ran on diesel fuel, so we were kind of cozy in those huts. However, the one facility left unheated was the outhouse. And not only was it freezing, it was now filling up. The bay that the boat used to bring the sewage truck over on had frozen. By the third of the month, our stay in the entire outhouse's contents were dangerously close to rising above the toilet seat. It was disgusting. It was freezing. It became my nightmare to use. Give me a slit trench over an outhouse any day of the week. Even now, thinking of this massive frozen mound makes me cringe. I could still see the steam that would rise from the hole out of the vents of the porta potty after each use. So, anyways, despite the bizarreness of the outhouse, it's not the scary part of the story. One night as the four of us were laying around on our cots, getting ready for bed, a few of us were listening to a book on tape that Doc had brought with him. I think it was called Contact. It was either that for entertainment or Art Bell's Coast to Coast radio show, the only English station that we could get on the radio. If you don't know who he is, check it out. It's all about aliens, Bigfoot, and other paranormal stuff. Well, we heard noises outside. And now, that might not seem scary, but let me tell you, we hadn't heard many noises night or day since we've been there. There isn't a whole lot of action going on during the winter in the middle of nowhere, especially on a frigid island without much to offer for wildlife. We hadn't seen any animal or found any tracks the entire time we were there, and we had to do a fair bit of walking. At first, we thought it might be some native kids come to goof off and tag the place or set it on fire. It seemed logical. Before we came to this island, we'd been given tours of nearby logging camps which we'd been decimated. We were warned that this is what they would do to our camp if we didn't protect it. If it was them, we were ready for them. Well, to be honest, no we weren't. Who am I kidding? We would have wanted to lock and load and go on the offensive if it wasn't for the fact that we were on a quote unquote training exercise. That meant we didn't even have ammunition. We had M16s but nothing to go in them. This had been a non-issue up until this point, because there had been a lack of danger. We were all no longer laying in our cots, instead we're getting dressed and discussing who it is that's going to go investigate with an unloaded rifle. Just then we heard those same sounds come to our door. It was not human. We could hear them breathing, loudly. Our PFC, who was the one who had been picked up to lead the charge, flat out refused. None of us blamed him either. We didn't want this to become some Alaskan version of Southern Comfort meets Predator, if you know what I mean. So we all sat in silence for 10 minutes or so, until the huffing and snorting faded away. A few minutes afterwards, we manned up and opened up the door. We immediately saw in the snow the largest wolf prints I've ever seen. I swear they were the size of a pie plate. Anything attached to those paws must have been the size of a small horse or at least a dining table. We jumped up to the task thinking we might need to ward a pack of wolves away. Started with hanging a series of lanterns along the perimeter, and then kicked on the generator for lights along the actual buildings. After that, we got fires going to burn off some of the cold. Big roaring infernos and big steel drums. We used them during the storms to navigate our way to the outhouse. The wolves started howling as we worked. Some of the other guys said they were trying to flank us. They were using their howls to try to get us to move in that direction they desired. And I gotta admit, it almost worked. That piercing sound comes blaring out of a tree stand not 30 yards from you. Your first instinct is to bolt in the other direction. We all survived the night, but made a request for ammunition that following morning. 